Hi there. You're in the lab with your mate JJ. Uh, today is my favorite part of the show. Today is Old Book Teardown Day. We're going to be looking at this thing. It's called Basic Electronics. Uh, it was put together by a company. Uh, and the name of the company is Van Valkenburg, Nuga, and Neville Incorporated. This is an expanded course, volumes one through six. The uh, unexpanded course, it seems, goes volumes one through five. I haven't been able to find this on the internet, this expanded course, but I found the uh, volumes one through five on archive.org. So I'll try to remember to put that link in the uh, show notes for you. So yeah, we're going to be looking at this. Before we do, I thought I might mention that my, uh, my Make Magazine subscription arrived today. I don't know if you subscribe to Make Magazine, but I do. And there's always something interesting in there. It's a little bit more sort of makery than me. I'm more of an electronics guy, and these guys actually build like physical things and crafty things. So, uh, but I'm I'm always interested to flip through Ma Make Magazine. Between Make Magazine and Silicon Chip, I'm done. Those are the two magazines that I subscribe to. Um, so yeah, I haven't had a had a, haven't had a flip through that one yet, but I will um, soon. But today we're, we're going to be looking at basic electronics. Um, uh, I'll tell you about it when we get over to the bench. Oh, I suppose I should mention that today's silly job title is Buzz Boss. I'm the Buzz Boss. So yeah, let's jump over to the bench and let's have a look at our book. Here we are on the bench. So uh, this book's uh, still got its dust jacket, which is pretty cool. Um, as you can see, basic electronics. Uh, it's interesting they've used lowercase letters there. That's a bit edgy for back in the day um, and uh, this is brags to, to be the uh, most understandable picture book course on electronics including transistors semiconductors and frequency modulation ever written you can learn basic electronics more easily and more rapidly than you ever dreamed possible there you go so these guys talking the big talk as I understand it this book was com commissioned by the United States Navy to train its people so it's uh, it was it was put together by a company with the specific aim of educating uh, the the Navy and they really love talking themselves up don't they another famous training program by Van Valkenburg Nuger and Neverlink basic electricity five volumes available in combined cloth edition uh, one to three, five volume paper bound set or as individual paperbacks. Okay, so this is advertising volumes one to five, but I think we've got a, a sixth uh, expanded uh, uh, volume that's not explained on the back here. But let's hear about volumes one to five, shall we? Uh, volume one, what electricity is? Conductors, insulators, semiconductors, electric charges, magnetism, current flow, what it is? What causes current flow? EMF. How electricity is produced and used? Electro electromagnetism. How a meter works. How current is measured. How voltage is measured. What controls current flow? Resistance. Review. Introducing Ohm's Law. Volume 2. Electric circuits. Ohm's Law. Resistance. DC series circuits. DC parallel circuits. DC series, par series parallel circuits. Electric power. Thevenin's and Norton's theorems. Troubleshooting DC circuits. Review of DC electricity. Introduction to alternating current. Volume 3. DC and AC electric circuits. What alternating current is. AC meters. Resistance in AC circuits. Inductance in DC and AC circuits. Capacitance in DC and AC circuits. Troubleshooting simple AC circuits. Volume 4. AC electric circuits. AC series circuits. R and L series circuits, R and C series circuits, L and C series circuits, I, L and C series circuits, power and power factor, AC parallel circuits, R and L parallel circuits, R and C parallel circuits, L and C parallel circuits, R, L and C parallel circuits, power and power factor, AC complex circuits, transformers, Introduction to AC power distribution, troubleshooting AC circuits, appendix. And then we've got volume five, introduction to generators and motors, introduction to generators, the elementary generator, the DC generator, 
<coughs> the DC motor, DC systems and controls, DC, DC machinery maintenance and troubleshooting, AC generators, alternators, AC motors, AC systems and controls, AC systems troubleshooting, cumulative index. There you go. Now let's see what it says on the inside cover. There's a note here. Uh, uh, something about from J Car by the looks of it. Uh, nope, I can't read that writing. Does anyone want to have a go at that? If you can figure it out, let me know in the comments. Yeah, I don't know what that says. It's written in 1987. 25th of October 1987. Uh, the only word I think I know is that one. It looks like J-Car. J-A-Y-C-A-R. Um, but I'm not sure what the rest of it says. So, let's read about this book, huh? About this book. This book contains the most understandable six-volume course on basic electronics ever offered. Volumes 1 through 5 are the civilian versions of the widely acclaimed illustrated training course on electronics prepared for the U.S. Navy Common Core Training Program by the authors. Since the Navy adopted this program in 1953, this course has made possible the training of more than 100,000 naval technicians in electricity and electronics. The sixth volume expands the five-volume civilian version into the subject areas of semiconductors, transistors, and frequency modulation at the fundamental level. While it is now integrated with the original course in this expanded edition, it was first introduced in 1959 as a companion volume to the popular five-volume course. If you are interested in learning basic electronics inclusive of semiconductors, transistors and frequency modulation, you will find that this expanded course will teach you faster and more easily than you ever dreamed possible. See back flap for subject area contents of this expanded basic, basic electronics course. Alright, let's have a look at the back and see what's there. Oh, there we go. So there's all the bits that we saw earlier and there's an extra bit here, volume 6. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Uh, so I'm a bit confused. Oh, I see. I see. On the back of this book here is an ad for a different book called Basic Electricity. So all of that stuff that I read you earlier, that, that regards an, a completely different book, Basic Electricity, five volumes. Uh, this is not basic electricity. This is basic electronics. Different book. Um, so the volumes 1 through 5 there, they're not relevant. But here, basic electronics, expanded course. That's the book that we're reading now. I'm just going to take a quick break and, and get myself a coffee and I'll be back. Back. So uh, let's read about the basic electronics expanded course, which is uh, this book that we're going to be reading today. Uh, consists of six volumes as follows. Volume 1. Introduction to Electronics. What a power supply is. Half-wave rectifiers. Dry metal type. Half-wave rectifiers. Vacuum tube types. Half-wave rectifiers. Transformer type. Hmm. The full-wave rectifier circuit. Filter circuits. Voltage regulator circuits. Other types of power supply circuits. Characteristics of diode vacuum tubes. Okay, volume two, introduction to amplifiers, the triode, the triode amplifier, the tetrode and the pentode, the single stage amplifier, the two stage RC coupled amplifier, the transformer coupled amplifier, the audio power amplifier, the output transformer, the push pull amplifier, microphones, earphones and loudspeakers. Volume three, video amplifiers, introduction to the RF amplifier, tuned circuits, a single stage RF amplifier, the two stage RF amplifier, introduction to oscillators, the Armstrong and Hartley oscillators, the tuned plate, tuned grid and crystal oscillators, miscellaneous oscillators. Volume 4, what a transmitter is, class C amplifiers, a three stage transmitter, frequency multipliers, transmission lines, antennas, CW transmission, 
Amplitude Modulation Volume 5 Introduction to Receivers Receiver Antennas TRF Receivers RF Amplifier Stage TRF Receivers Audio Amplifier Stage TRF Receivers Generative Regenerative Detector TRF Receivers Plate Detector The Superheterodyne Receiver Troubleshooting the Superheterodyne Receiver Volume 6, Transistors, Semiconductors, Frequency Modulation, Solid State Electronics, Semiconductor Diodes, Transistor Construction, How a Transistor Operates, Commercial Transistors, Transistor Circuits, Transistorized Superheterodyne Receiver, Fundamentals of Frequency Modulation, FM Transmitters, Antennas and Wave Propagation, FM receivers. Uh, this is pretty interesting, isn't it? So the first uh, uh, five volumes uh, regard like old school tubes and such, um, and volume six introduces transistors. So this must have been kind of right on the cusp of uh, of, of semiconductors and digital electronics. So uh, we've got transistors uh, uh, are covered, but so is uh, all the old tube stuff. Interesting. Uh, and it'd be cool to know what this says. Uh, I said, I think this book came from J. Carr, was received. Uh, it has a diagram. Uh, I'm not sure what that says. Basic Electronics, Volume 1. Hayden Book Company, a division of Hayden Publishing Company, Incorporated, Hasbro Heights, New Jersey. Copyright 1955. There we go. Printed in the United States of America. Preface. All right. The texts of the entire Basic Electricity and Basic Electronics courses, as currently taught at Navy specialty schools, have now been released by the Navy for civilian use. This educational program has been an unqualified success. Since April 1953, when it was first installed, over 25,000 Navy trainees have benefited by this instruction and the results have been outstanding. The unique simplification of an ordinarily complex subject, the exceptional clarity of illustrations and text, and the plan of presenting one basic concept at a time without involving complicated mathematics all combine in making this course a better and quicker way to teach and learn basic electricity and electronics. In releasing this material to the general public, the Navy hopes to provide the means for creating a nationwide pool of pre-trained technicians upon whom the armed forces could call in time of national emergency without the need for precious weeks and months of schooling. Perhaps of greater importance is the Navy's hope that through the release of this course, a direct contribution will be made towards increasing the technical knowledge of men and women throughout the country as a step in making and keeping America strong. Van Valkenburg, Nuger and Neverlink, New York, New York, February 1955. <coughs> Pardon me. Table of Contents, Volume 1, Basic Electronics. Introduction to Electronics, Water Power Suppliers. We've already read all of this. Half-wave rectifiers, dry metal type. Half-wave rectifiers, vacuum tube type. Half-wave rectifiers, transformer type. The full wave rectifier circuit, filter circuits, voltage regulator circuits, other types of power supply circuits, characteristics of diode vacuum tubes. It's going to take us the first, first hundred pages to get through that. Introduction to electronics. What you are going to do now. Alright. You now have a good solid foundation 
in the field of electricity. Oh, I think that they're um, uh, they're talking about the uh, the basic electricity course, which I s assume they're just about to tell us was the prereq for this one. Introduction to electronics. Ah, I see. I'm a bit confused. What are we looking at here? This is basic electricity. Okay. So this is the electricity one, and this is the electronics one. I'm going to go and look in my books and see if I have the, uh, the uh, basic electricity book. All right, I'm back. Well, I went looking, uh, and it didn't jump out at me. So if I have it, it might be buried in boxes somewhere. Um, so we're going to uh, proceed with this book, which is Introduction to Electronics, having not done the prereqs, which is basic electricity. Um, and the stack goes like this, Introduction to Electricity, DC circuits, alternating current, AC circuits, and then DC and AC machinery. So that's their basic electricity course, um, which we haven't, we haven't got yet. We might, we might have it in future, we'll see. Um, so this course, Introduction to Electronics, what you are going to do now, you now have a good solid foundation in the field of electricity. You know how electricity is generated, how electron current <coughs> flows through a circuit, the nature and uses of magnetism, the proper use and care of meters, the characteristics of DC and AC, and how various types of electric motors and other electrical devices operate. Now you have all the fundamental knowledge that you need to begin your study of a new and fascinating subject, electronics. There we go. Introduction to electronics. It's uh, loaded with symbolism, isn't it? Look at the white dove with the symbol of peace and then there's a hawk. Fascinating. It's all about radios. It's all about radios. Oh, there's television in there as well, I see. Interesting. Introduction to electronics. The meaning of electronics. <clears throat> You've heard the word electronics many times in the past. Electronics means the science of the electron. Since the study of electricity and electronics both involve the use of the concept of electron flow, you may wonder where electricity ends and electronics begins. For your purposes, it is easy enough to make the distinction that electronics is the science which is concerned with the flow of electrons through vacuum or gas-filled tubes, sometimes called electron tubes. Thus, electronics includes the study of any equipment that contains tubes. You, you are already acquainted with quite a few types of electrical equipment. Radio, talky motion pictures, record players, public address systems, television, electric eye door openers. All of these make use of tubes and are correctly termed electronic equipment. Of course, they also make use of various types of DC and AC circuits, of meters, transformers, capacitors, and all the other components which you have learned about in basic electricity. This is why you need a course in fundamentals before going on with the electronics phase of your study. <sighs> Sorry, it says, that is why you needed a course in fundamentals before going on with the electronics phase of your study. All right. Okay, radio, movies, and television brought to you by electronics. This, pa this book, just reminding you, was published in 1955. 1955. Electronic equipment. All electronic equipment is made up of only a few basic circuits. Just how many basic types of circuit are there? Three. Huh. Are there any other types you will ever have to know? 
there are additional types of special circuits you will have to learn when you begin to study equipment but these special circuits are nothing but variations on the three basic electronic circuits the three basic electronic circuits are rectifier circuits amplifier circuits and oscillator circuits rectifier circuits change AC to DC their most common use is in electronic equipment power supplies which take AC from the power line and transform it to DC which is required to operate electron tubes as a rectifier circuit with a, a tube amplifier circuits take small voltage changes and enlarge or amplify them on <coughs> into large voltage changes amplifier circuits are by far the most commonly used circuits in electronic equipment they take very weak signals that are barely detectable and amplify them into strong signals that can drive a pair of headphones, a loudspeaker or an oscilloscope. And the oscillator circuits. They generate AC voltages at any particular desired frequency. Oscillator circuits are used to generate AC voltages that carry a radio signal from one place to another. They are also used very extensively for testing other electronic circuits. Parts used in electronic equipment. Now that you have found out that there are only three basic types of electronic circuits, rectifiers, amplifiers and oscillators, that you have to be uh, concerned with, you probably would like to know about the parts used in those circuits. Actually, there are only six commonly used types of parts in electronic circuits. Five of these parts you already know. Resistors, capacitors, coils, transformers, and switches. There is one additional type of part that you will learn about very soon. Vacuum tubes. Okay, well they didn't mention the uh, transistor, did they? Or the diode for that matter. Although the vacuum tubes includes diodes. Anyway. You see that by understanding three basic types of electronic circuits and the use of six types of parts in those circuits, you will understand all you need to know about electronics for the present. From such as these are circuits made. Resistor, capacitor, coil or inductance, transformer, switch, vacuum tube. power supplies the importance of power supplies everything that lives or does work must have a source of power or a power supply the sun supplies power that enables plants to manufacture food and food in turn supplies the power that makes you live and move speak run and think in the realm of non-living mechanisms, the motor in the old Model T supplied power to move the car as surely as the huge turbines at Boulder Dam supply power today to drive electric generators. It is obvious that the same kind of power is not used in the same way in these different cases. Each thing, large or small, living or non-living, must take its power from a primary source such as the sun, falling water, or an electric light socket and charge it into change it into the specific kind of power needed in electronics then a power supply is a circuit or device that changes the primary electric power into the kind of kind and amount of ac or dc needed by different types of electronic circuits yeah everything needs its power supply okay Uh, what power supplies do uh, let's get down to cases and find out just what a power supply is supposed to do different types of electronic equipment amplifiers oscillators transmitters and receivers can contain different types of vacuum tube circuits which must have certain ac and dc voltages supplied to them before they can operate while there are exceptions, in general these various vacuum tube circuits require approximately 350 volts DC and 6.3 volts AC. Just why these two voltages are required is something you will learn when you come to study these circuits. 
for the present it is enough for you to know that the usual power supply must put out these voltages fascinating 350 volts and 6.3 volts AC when you plug any piece of electronic equipment into an electric outlet that outlet puts out 117 volts AC that is not what you want the vacuum tube circuits usually must have 350 volts DC and 6.3 volts AC how a power supply changes the available line voltage into the high DC voltage called B plus voltage in all electronics work and how AC voltage is the major subject of this section here's a picture I am a typical power supply and I put out 350 volts DC and 6.3 volts AC well if that was standard back in 1955 things changed quite a lot since then how a power supply works the transformer a typical power supply consists of three major components a transformer a rectifier and a filter you already know about transformers from your work in basic electricity a transformer is a device made up of two or more coils of wire wound on an iron core transformers take an AC voltage and increase or decrease it depending upon the number of turns of wire in the various windings here are a few examples of transformers that you will find in electronic equipment power supplies there we go in a typical power supply the transformer is connected to the 117 volt AC power line through a suitable fuse and switch the transformer puts out three AC voltages a voltage somewhat higher than 350 volts AC 5 volts AC and 6.3 volts AC the 6.3 volt AC output is connected directly to the vacuum tube circuits the other two voltages are connected to the rectifier circuit where the high voltage AC is changed to approximately 350 volts DC more than 350 volts AC are required to get 350 volts DC because of losses that occur in the process of changing AC to DC so you must begin with a higher voltage than you want to take out here we go so they're just showing you how the transformer is wired and uh, the outputs are sent to the rectifier there you go up to now you have learned that the job of a typical power supply is to take 117 volts AC from the power line and to put it across out approximately 350 volts DC and 6.3 volts AC you have learned that the major components of a power supply are a transformer a rectifier and a filter circuit and you have found out about the job of the transformer the job of the rectifier is to change the high voltage AC coming out of the transformer into high voltage DC the 5 volt AC voltage coming out of the transformer is used to heat the rectifier tube when such a type of rectifier is used the 5 volt AC winding is eliminated from the transformer when it is not required for the operation of the rectifier the job of changing high voltage AC into high voltage DC is a difficult one all the rectifier can do is change the AC into pulsing DC like this so there you go so at the top here is half wave rectif rectifier they chop off the bottom and then they just leave pulsed DC and then the full wave rectification uh, inverts the bottom part and sends it through <coughs> there you go notice that the DC output is not a constant voltage but rises and falls in time with the AC voltage input when only the positive half cycle of the input voltage are allowed to pass through the rectifier and the negative half cycles cannot pass through at all the process is called half wave rectification when the positive half cycle of the input voltage is allowed to pass through the rectifier and the negative half cycles are changed to positive half cycles the process is called full wave rectification how power supply works the rectifier continued the rectifiers you will work with in this section will be dry metal or vacuum tube rectifiers either of these rectifiers come in half wave or full wave types vacuum tube rectifiers require that the transformer have a low voltage AC winding which supplies the rectifier tube with heater voltage 
Dry metal rectifiers do not require this winding. They've got the same uh, picture here again as they had earlier. It's exactly the same. I don't know why they've included it again. Anyway, this is rectifiers. So far you have learned that the job of a typical power supply is to take 117 volts AC from the power line and to deliver approximately 350 volts DC and 6.3 volts AC. You have learned that the major components of a power supply are a transformer, a rectifier and a filter circuit. You have learned that the purpose of the transformer and the rectifier, and now you, sorry, you have learned the purpose of the transformer and the rectifier, and now you are ready to learn about the filter. You know that the output of the rectifier is a pulsating DC voltage. What you want is a steady DC voltage of plus 350 volts with as little pulsation as possible. The job of the filter circuit is to smooth out the pulsations in the rectifier output and give you a steady voltage with little or no ripple. Filter circuits come in various forms, but all filter circuits are made up of various combinations of inductances and capacitors or resistances and capacitors. You will learn how these filter circuits work to smooth out pulsations in the rectifier output as soon as you have done some work with various rectifier circuits. Filter circuits top one not smoothing out the ripple quite as well as the bottom one and then various types of circuits down the bottom inductors and capacitors or resistors and capacitors just like they said fascinating voltage regulators a typical power supply is made up of a transformer a rectifier and a filter circuit this is all that is required to give you the high voltage DC and the low voltage AC required to operate various types of electronic circuits. However, when current is drawn out of the high voltage DC terminal of a power supply, the voltage drops. This is due <coughs> to the internal resistance of the power supply. It is not unusual for the 350 volt DC output to drop to 300 volts when the current drawn out increases from 0.05 amp to 0.1 amp. This voltage drop is not serious for many types of electronic circuits and they will go right on working in the proper manner. However, there are some types of electronic circuits that cannot operate properly if the voltage varies more than 2 or 3 volts. These types of circuits require that the power supply have a voltage regulator circuit added to it. <laughs> when a power supply has a voltage regulator circuit, only those circuits that require a constant voltage are connected to the voltage regulator. Other circuits are usually connected directly to the unregulated high voltage DC terminal. The basic part of all voltage regulator circuits is the voltage regulator tube, commonly known as the VR tube. These tubes are made so that they will hold the DC voltage at a particular point in spite of current variations. VR tubes are made so that they will hold the voltage at 59, 75, 90, 108 or 153 volts DC. By using various combinations of these tubes you can get a constant voltage of almost any value that is required. You know that most power supplies are made up of transformers, rectifiers, filter circuits and sometimes voltage regulators. You can get almost any kind of power supply by putting these components together in various ways. Of course, sometimes you will have to use large rectifier tubes <coughs> and large transformers. Sometimes you will have to use sub-miniature parts. But, large or small, all the circuits will contain the same components. Transformers, rectifiers, filters, <coughs> voltage regulators, various combinations. All power supplies, whether large or small, use standard circuits. Hmm. Why, are th why there are different types of power supplies continued? <coughs> now you will want to know why there are different types of power supplies used in various types of equipment. After all, the major job they do is nothing more than changing AC into DC. The reason why different types of power supplies are required is simple. One power supply you may build <coughs> uh, would go up in smoke if you, if you drew 
much more than 150 milliamps of current from the high DC voltage supply. Certain types of transmitters require as much as 5,000 or 10,000 milliamps from their power suppliers. Certain special oscilloscope circuits may require a DC output of 10,000 volts or more. I can't stand more than 150 milliamps. Me too, buddy. <clears throat> Some special radar circuits require power supplies with especially good voltage regulation. This means that the DC voltage put out by the power supply must not change more than 1 or 2 volts when the current is varying. Sometimes power supplies are needed that will put out negative DC voltages rather than positive DC voltages. Sometimes power supplies are needed that will put out several positive and several negative DC voltages. Sometimes a super low ripple is required and so on. From this you can see that there are many jobs for power supplies. Power supplies wanted high voltage, heavy current, super low ripple, special voltage regulation, variable voltage, positive and negative, typical, not sure what that's supposed to say, typical something power supply. Uh, changing AC to DC. Most electric, power is <coughs> most electric power is distributed by AC power lines and most electronic equipment contain power supplies which change the AC power line voltage to those DC and AC voltages required by the equipment. To change the AC power line voltage to other AC voltages is relatively simple. Uh, a transformer is used to either step up or step down the line voltage to obtain the required AC voltages. Power supply transformers step up or step down voltages as required. There's a primary winding and some secondary windings, a secondary uh, to raise the voltage and a secondary to lower the voltage. A step down to lower and step up to raise. To obtain the required DC voltages, the AC voltage line must be changed to DC. This changing of AC to DC is called rectification. Devices which change AC to DC are called rectifiers and circuits used to change AC to DC are called rectifier circuits. Rectifiers are devices which allow current to flow through them in one direction only, acting as a conductor for current flow in one direction and as an insulator for current flow in the other direction. Thus, when a rectifier is placed in an AC circuit, every other half cycle of the AC voltage causes current flow in the circuit in that direction for which the rectifier is a conductor. Since the alternate half cycles are trying to force current through the circuit in a direction for which the rectifier acts as an insulator, no current flows during those alternate half cycles. As a result, the current flow in a simple rectifier circuit is pulsating DC alternate half cycles of AC rather than a steady DC current flow. Okay. We, we already heard that earlier. We know this. A rectifier conducts in one direction, insulates in the other. Dry metal rectifiers. When certain metallic materials are pressed together to form a junction, the combination acts as a rectifier, having a low resistance to current flow in one direction and a very high resistance to current flow in the opposite direction. This action is due to the chemical properties of the combined materials. The combinations usually used as rectifiers are copper and copper oxide or iron and selenium. Dry metal rectifiers are constructed <coughs> of discs ranging in size from less than a half inch to more than six inches in diameter. Copper oxide rectifiers consist of discs of copper coated on one side with a layer of copper oxide while selenium rectifiers are constructed of iron discs coated on one side with selenium. Dry metal rectifiers, copper oxide rectifier and selenium rectifier. Dry metal rectifier elements an element is a single disc, are generally made in the form of washers which are assembled <coughs> on a mounting bolt in any desired series or parallel combination to form a rectifier circuit. 
the symbol shown below is used to represent a dry metal rectifier of any type. Since these rectifiers were made before the electron theory was used to determine the direction of current flow, the arrow points in the direction of conventional current flow, but <clears throat> in the direction opposite to the electron flow. Thus, the arrow points in opposite direction to that of the current flow as used in electronics. Okay. Uh, dry metal rectifiers continued. Each dry metal rectifier element will stand only a few volts across its terminals, but by stacking several elements in series, the voltage rating is increased. Similarly, each element can pass only a limited amount of current. When greater current is desired, several series stacks are connected in parallel to provide the desired amount of current. Series stacking increases the voltage rating of a dry metal rectifier. Uh, parallel connection increases the current rating. Uh. Dry metal rectifiers are very rugged and have an almost unlimited life if not abused. Because of the low voltage rating of individual units, they are normally used for low voltages, 130 volts or less. Since it becomes impractical to connect, to connect too many elements in series, by paralleling stacks or increasing the diameter of the disks, the current rating can be increased to several amps so that they are often used for low voltage high current applications. Small, Very small units are used to measure AC voltage on a DC voltmeter. Uh, large, larger units are used in battery chargers and various types of power supplies for electronic equipment. There we go. I'm just going to start flipping through now. So this is a typical selenium rectifier, rectifier disc, dot marking, terminal marking, radiation plates, used in power supplies, half wave rectifier circuit. Reversing the polarity of output voltage. Review. Okay, let's do the review. Rectification. When a device <coughs> called a rectifier is placed in series with an AC circuit, it permits current to flow only in one direction, changing the ap applied AC voltage to pulsating DC. Rectification is the changing of AC to DC. Dry metal rectifiers. A rectifier consisting of two unlike metallic substances pressed together, which allows current flow in one direction only. Copper oxide and iron selenium combinations are usually used to conduct, construct dry metal rectifiers. Half wave rectifier circuit. A rectifier connected in series between an AC voltage source and the circuit load resistance. The rectifier changes the applied AC to a DC output voltage across the load resistance. Rectifier circuit waveforms. If the applied voltage is an AC sine wave, the output <laughs> waveform consists of half cycles of the applied AC voltage. This output waveform is a pulsating DC voltage. Vacuum tubes. Dry metal rectifiers are used in many power supplies to change AC to DC, but they are limited as to voltage and current rating. They are not normally rated at voltages greater than 130 volts AC. Low voltage units rated at 10 volts or less have a high current capacity greater than 1 amp, while the current capacity of higher voltage units is much less than 1 amp. Because of the voltage and current limitations of dry metal rectifiers, another type of rectifier, the, di the diode vacuum tube, is often used in power supplies. As a rectifier, the diode vacuum tube operates in the same way as a dry metal rectifier, acting as a good conductor of current in one direction and as an insulator in the other direction. The diode vacuum tube also has many other uses in electronics, which you will find out about later. 
vacuum tubes are used as rectifiers. The vacuum tube rectifiers do the same job as dry metal rectifiers. There you go. Look at that. Pictures of the tubes. The discovery of the diode. The principle on which a diode is based was discovered some 70 years ago before anything was known about electrons. Thomas Edison was working on an experiment with his incandescent lamps in which a carbon filament was used. The filaments which he used broke too easily as they were constructed of thin threads or filaments of carbon. When current flows in the filament it becomes white hot and the light <coughs> and the light is radiated from it. In an effort to lengthen the light the life of his light bulbs, Edison constructed constructed a metal support which he connected to the fragile filament by insulated sections. For some unknown reason he connected the metal support to the positive side of a battery and the filament to the negative side. To his surprise he noticed that a current was flowing. Since nothing was known about electrons, <coughs> Edison could not understand or see any importance in his discovery and it took 21 years before Fleming, a British scientist, learned the significance of this flow of electrons. Because he observed that current could flow only in one direction, Fleming called his, his vacuum tube a valve. In fact, vacuum tubes are still called valves by the British. There you go. How a diode tube works. The diode vacuum tube is like a game of baseball in which control is the important thing. An understanding of how a diode vacuum tube controls the flow of current is required to understand how a diode tube works as a rectifier. The parts of a vacuum tube which directly control the flow of current are called elements. A heated element which gives up electrons is called the cathode. The plate is a cylindrical element surrounding the cathode which attracts electrons when it is positively charged. The cathode is heated by a filament of resistance wire called a heater uh, which is not considered to be an element since it does not directly control the amount of current flow from cathode to plate. The vacuum tube of the type illustrated is called a diode because it has only two elements, a cathode and a plate. It's a cathode, a heater and a plate. Okay. In addition to preventing the filament from burning, removing the air from the uh, tube prevents the air molecules from interfering with the flow of electrons from cathode to plate. Sometimes the air is replaced by an inert gas which aids rather than opposes the electron flow. Electron emission. The basic, <coughs> the basic requirement of a diode vacuum tube is that there has to be a source of freely moving electrons which can be used to give us current flow. Of course electrons are found in every atom of every substance but we still need a method of driving them out of the substance to make them free, freely moving. In Edison's setup the intense heat of the filament did the trick and heat is used to do it in practically all the vacuum tubes you will see. Driving electrons out of a substance by heat is known as thermionic emission. In the illustration you will note, notice that the cathode is a cylinder or sleeve which surrounds but does not touch the filament. The filament is heated by the current flowing in, <coughs> in it and the ca cathode is heated because it is so close to the filament. This arrangement of parts is known as a, an indirectly heated cathode. Okay. Some, some tubes, such as the Fleming's valve or the Type 80 rectifier tube, have what is known as directly heated cathodes, which means that there is no sleeve around the filament, and the filament is itself an electron emitter. Directly heated and indirectly heated. Okay. Because they can emit many more electrons than the indirectly heated type, directly heated cathodes are used in vacuum tubes designed for power supplies which supply high currents. 
Indirectly heated cathodes are more frequently found in low current power supplies. Having the heater filament and the electron emitter cathode separate in an indirectly heated tube allows for the separation of the filament and the cathode's electrical circuits. Alright, so I'm just going to flip through this now. Uh, less space, more space. Ah. How current flows in a diode. All right. Twin diode rectifier. Oh, I see. <laughs> wow, look at that. Different types of uh, sockets for tubes. Four prong, five prong, six prong, seven prong, octal, loctal, miniature seven pin, miniature nine pin. Fascinating. Yeah. So this is just about diode technology back in the day. <sighs> Vacuum tube circuit wiring. Gas filled diode. Okay. When the current when the load current goes out up, the output voltage goes down. A power supply using a high vacuum diode has poor regulation. A power supply using a gas filled diode has good regulation. <sighs> right. So these gas filled diodes do a better job of holding the voltage. They call it B plus the output voltage. A review of vacuum tube rectifiers. Diode vacuum tube. A two element vacuum tube consisting of a heated cathode and a metal plate enclosed in a glass envelope or tube from which air has been removed. Electron emission. The action of the cathode in giving up electrons when the cathode is heated. Space charge. The negative charge in the area surrounding the cathode caused by the emission of electrons from the cathode. Rectifier tube. A vacuum tube made especially for use as a rectifier. Filaments. Fine wire heater used to heat the cathode in a vacuum tube. In directly heated cathode tubes, the filament and cathode are the same wire, while indirectly heated cathode tubes, the filament is called a heater and is used only to heat the cathode. Basic vacuum tube rectifier circuit. A diode vacuum tube connected in series with an AC voltage source to change AC to DC. Transformer type power supplies. The two basic rectifier circuits which have been discussed are used to change the 117 volt AC line voltage to DC. These rectifier circuits are often used for inexpensive power supplies when it is not necessary to isolate the rectifier circuit from the AC power line or to obtain DC voltages greater than 120 volts. By adding a transformer to the circuit between the power line and the rectifier, the AC voltage can be increased or decreased, resulting in a corresponding rise or fall of the DC output voltage. Also, the output of the rectifier circuit will be completely isolated from the power line and various filament voltages will be obtained by using additional secondary windings on the transformer. Because of the different voltages required and the need for isolating circuits in electronic equipment, most power supplies are of the transformer type. Several typical power supplies of this type are shown below. Ah, cool. Transformer type power supplies. Alright, well there's the transformer. Hard to say where the transformers are in these things. I don't know. It's all, uh, it's all old stuff. Uh, 
the diode in a transformer type circuit. All rectifiers, including the half wave rectifier, change an AC voltage into a pulsating DC voltage. Each rectifier accomplishes this by allowing current to flow in the circuit only in one direction and only slightly <coughs> and only slightly differences exist only slight differences exist in different rectifier circuits. You are going to see how the half wave rectifier type rectifier circuits make makes the change from AC to pulsating DC. The rectifying action of this circuit depends on the operation of a diode, the rectifier tube. Alright, didn't we already cover that? Uh, the diode allows electrons to pass through only when its plate is positive with respect to its cathode. The diode does not allow electrons to float through when the plate is negative with respect to the cathode. Okay. Uh, the diode and a transformer type circuit continued. Suppose you put the diode into simple half wave <coughs> circuit with a transformer and see how it changes AC to DC. When the transformer voltage makes the rectifier tube plate positive, electrons flow and a voltage appears across the load. Okay. Circuit diagram of a transformer type circuit. Compare the above schematic with the half wave rectifier to the one below. Notice the similarity between the two circuits. You can see that one, only one half of the transformer high voltage winding is used. The half from terminal 5 to 7. The, this supplies the rectifier tube plate voltage. The current path from the transformer to the load will be through the chassis ground. The load will be re represented by the 25k resistor. The two plates of the rectifier tube have been wired together so that the tube acts like a single diode. The tube has a directly heated cathode, therefore the cathode is connected to the transformer filament winding, terminal 1 and terminal 3, as well as the load. Yeah, right. Current flow in a half wave rectifier. Power line filter condenser circuits. Condenser is what they used to call uh, capacitors. <coughs> Review of the half wave rectifier circuit. Transformer type power supply. A power supply which uses a transformer to either raise or lower the AC power line voltage to obtain a desired value of DC output voltage. Half wave rectifier circuit. A rectifier circuit using a single rectifier unit which changes AC to DC by allowing current to flow only in one direction. Alternative half cycles of the AC power wave are utilized to provide a pulsating DC output. The circuit sometimes uses a transformer to increase or decrease the output voltage. Current flow in a half wave rectifier circuit. AC is applied to the rectifier plate and current flows only during those half cycles which are positive on the plate side of the circuit input. High voltage measurement. Always use <coughs> only one hand in measuring voltages or testing circuits where high voltage is present. Use a test prod which is insulated and rated for working with high voltages. <coughs> Full wave rectifiers. You have seen how the half wave rectifier works. Now, in the following sheets, you will see how the full wave rectifier does the same job in a slightly different way. You must know the full wave rectifier because it is used in 9 out of 10 pieces of electronic equipment. It may be surprising any voltage from 100 volts to 5000 volts. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it may be supplying any voltage from 100 volts to 5000 volts on any ship any station anywhere with electronic equipment is used you'll find full wave rectifiers supplying most of the power there you go there's some full wave rectifiers for you how the full wave rectifier works in a full wave rectifier circuit a diode uh, rectifier tube is placed in series with each half of the transformer secondary on and the load. Effectively, you have two half-wave rectifiers working into the same load. 
on the first half cycle the transformer's AC voltage makes the upper diode rectifier plate positive so that it conducts and as a result current flows through the load causing a pulse of voltage across the load. Notice that while the upper diode conducts the lower diode plate is negative with respect to its cathode so that it does not conduct. On the second half cycle the plate out of the upper diode is negative so that it cannot conduct whereas the plate of the lower diode is positive so that current flows through it and through the load. Since both pulses of current through the load are in the same direction, a pulsing, pulsating DC voltage now appears across the load. The full wave rectifier has changed both halves of the AC input into a pulsating DC output. The full wave rectifier tube. The diagram on the previous sheet shows two separate rectifier tubes being used in the full wave rectifier circuit. Sometimes you may find this circuit <coughs> used in power supplies, but more frequently just one tube is used in the full wave rectifier. You will refer back to the diagram on the previous sheet. Uh, you will see that the cathodes of the two tubes are connected together. Since this is so, two separate rectifier tubes can be put together into one envelope so that the two plates share a common filament. The full wave rectifier therefore contains two plates but only one filament. Such a tube is the 80 rectifier tube. When a full wave rectifier is used in a full wave rectifier circuit, the circuit is most commonly drawn like this. Notice that in this tube there is only one filament which supplies electrons to both plates. During one half of the AC input cycle, one plate draws electrons from the filament and during the other half cycle of the cycle, the other plate draws the electrons. As in any diode, the direction of current flow inside this tube is always from the filament and this uh, current flows first to one plate and then to the other. The load, which is in series with the filament, therefore has pulsating DC current flowing through it. Okay, basic full wave rectifier circuit typical complete full wave rectifier circuit the bridge rectifier just like the other rectifiers you have studied changes AC voltage to DC voltage here's how it does it okay Okay, so they're just showing you how, the, how to construct the, the full wave bridge rectifier using uh, four diodes. Fair enough. And they've got their rectifier filter, uh, uh, sending output to the filter. You already know that there are only two types of rectifier circuits in general use, the full wave and the half wave rectifiers and they both perform the same job of changing AC into pulsating DC. There are only three types of filter circuits that are in general use. These filter circuits all have one thing in common. They remove the ripple from the pulsating DC output of the rectifier. In addition, there is only one basic type of voltage regulated tube, which is used with power supplies. As its name implies, this tube maintains the output voltage of a power supply at a required value in spite of the line voltage fluctuations or variations of load current. Know these power supply circuits and you know almost all you will ever have to know about power supplies. This is true because nearly every power supply that exists consists of various combinations of basic rectifier circuits, basic filter circuits and voltage regulated tubes. The three most common types of filter circuits used are shown on the next sheet. Power supply filter circuits. Here are the three filter circuits you will learn now. The condenser input filter, the choke input filter, and the two section filter. These are the filters you will see in your power supply circuits condenser input filter, the choke input filter, and the two section filter. Oh, 
the sticky pages. Oh no, there's. Is there, am I missing a page? No. There's a. Oh, that's weird. Yeah. Okay. Little aberration there. Printing aberration. This page has never been opened before. Wow. Filter circuits. <coughs> characteristics of the rectifier output. You have been told that electronic circuits in general require a source of about 350 volts DC and a source of 6.3 volts AC in order to operate. The power supply transformer supplies the 6.3 volts AC directly to the heaters of the tubes requiring it. The transformer feeds high voltage AC into the rectifier and rectifier puts out pulsating DC that looks like this half wave rectifier output and full wave rectifier output. The electronic circuits which are connected to the power supply output cannot use a pulsating voltage of this sort. What these circuits require is a steady DC voltage with as little pulsation as possible. The purpose of these filter circuits is <coughs> of the filter circuit is to remove the pulsations from the rectifier output and deliver a steady DC voltage. The output of a rectifier tube contains consists of pulses of current which always flow in the same direction through the load resistor. The current uh, rises from zero to a maximum and then falls to zero, repeating this cycle over and over again. At no time does the electron current go through the load resistor, change its direction and flow from the filament to ground. The uh, voltage resulting from this flow of electrons through the load resistor is a voltage that rises from zero to a maximum and then falls back to zero, repeating the cycle over and over again. This voltage takes on the shape of half sine waves. In the case of a half wave rectifier, the average DC voltage is 31.8% of the peak value. In the case of a full wave rectifier, the average DC is 63.6% .6 of the peak value. AC and DC components. If you connect a DC voltmeter across the rectifier output, you will get a reading. If you connect an AC voltmeter across the right rectifier output, you will also get a reading. <coughs> this AC reading is a result of the output voltage variation. Therefore, the output of the rectifier can be considered <coughs> as a DC voltage with an AC voltage superimposed on it. You can look upon the job of a filter circuit as the job of removing the AC portion or AC component of the rectifier output and allowing only the DC component to get to the power supply output terminals. If the filter succeeds in removing all of the AC from the rectifier output, only pure DC will be left. You may now ask the question, how can a pulsating DC voltage have an AC component if the voltage rises from zero to a high positive value and falls back to zero, but never becomes negative? You have always thought of an AC voltage as one which alternates <coughs> above and below a zero voltage, first becoming positive, then zero, then negative. If the voltage never becomes negative, how can there be any AC in it? Any wave that varies in a regular manner has an AC component. Suppose you examine an example in which an AC voltage is combined with a DC voltage and the result is a voltage wave which never becomes negative. Suppose you have a voltage of plus 50 volts DC and you combine it with an AC voltage which varies from plus 20 volts through zero to minus 20 volts. Okay. When the plus 20 volt AC peak is added to the 50 volts DC, the result is 70 volts. When the zero volt point to the AC wave is added to the plus 50 volts DC, the result is plus 50 volts. When the minus 20 volts AC peak is added to the 50 as well as 30 volts, total is blah, 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 okay? Uh, you have seen how a DC voltage and an AC voltage can be added together to give uh, a voltage wave which never becomes negative. Here are a few more examples. 
so there you go just showing how you can combine DC and AC to uh, what do they call it clamping clamping or uh, I forget um, you you can see that as long as a voltage uh, varies in any regular manner it can be broken up into a DC component and an AC component the output of a rectifier contains both a DC component and an AC component it is the job of the filter to remove as much of the AC voltage as is possible and economical before the resulting high voltage DC is fed into the electronic circuits which require it the condenser in the filter circuit if you remove the load resistor from the output of the rectifier and replace the resistor with a large condenser pure DC will appear across the condenser when you when you find out why this takes place you will see how this effect can be used in filter electronics in filter circuits you know that when a condenser is placed across a battery it charges up <coughs> to the battery voltage if it is given enough time the same is true when a condenser is placed across the output of a rectifier the rectifier starts charging up the capacitor <laughs> the condenser every time it conducts if the condenser does not have time to charge up to the peak of the pulsating DC wave on the first half cycle it will do so during the next few half cycles however <coughs> sorry after a few cycles have passed there will be pure DC across the condenser because current can flow in only one direction through the rectifier the condenser will not discharge between the peaks of the pulsating DC voltage what has been the effect of placing the condenser what has been the effect of placing the condenser across the output of the rectifier by charging up the condenser has filtered out the ripple in the pulsating DC leaving pure DC if a power supply did not have to supply current to other circuits pure DC voltage could be obtained simply by connecting a condenser from the rectifier filament to ground however the various electronic circuits attached to the power supply B plus voltage do draw a certain amount of current the current drawn by these electronic circuits is called the load current and the effect of this load current can be duplicated by connecting a load resistor across the rectifier output and ground you know from your study of RC circuits in basic electricity that when a resistor is placed across a charged condenser the condenser will discharge through the resistor the speed of the discharge will depend upon the size of the resistor the lower the resistance the more current will be drawn from the condenser and the faster it will will be the discharge as soon as the resistor is connected across the condenser of the rectifier circuit that condenser will begin to discharge and the voltage will drop the voltage however will not drop to zero because a new voltage peak appears at the rectifier filament 60 times a second for a half wave rectifier and 120 times a second for a full wave rectifier this <coughs> this voltage <coughs> peak will recharge the condenser and then the condenser will produce proceed to discharge through the resistor until the next voltage peak comes along the result will be a pulsating DC output notice that the pulsations are much smaller than you would get with no condenser there you go So it's just showing how load affects the uh, the filter when it's just a condenser, which is of course a capacitor. We call them a capacitor now. They used to be called condensers. The result of placing load on the single filter condenser is that the output of the rectifier is no longer pure DC. It is DC upon which is superimposed an AC component. This AC component is called ripple it is because of this AC component or ripple that a condenser by itself does not constitute a satisfactory filter additional filtering components have to be added to remove the ripple and make the final B plus output as close to pure DC as is possible and economical just why ripple in the B plus output is so undesirable is something you will learn when you come to the study of amplifiers 
The amount of ripple resulting from a load placed across a single filter condenser depends upon the size of the load, the size of the condenser and the type of rectifier. The larger the condenser, the more electrons it can accumulate on its plates and it will discharge a smaller amount when a load is put across it. The larger the load current drawn out of the condenser, the larger will be the voltage drop and the larger will be the ripple. Since half wave rectifiers will char charge the condenser 60 times per second, there will that 60 times per second, by the way, is based on the AC frequency in America. They have 60 hertz on their power line. In Australia, it's 50 hertz on their power line. Since half wave rectifiers will charge the condenser 60 times per second, there will be more time for the condenser to discharge through the load than with a full wave rectifier which charges the condenser 120 times per second. Thus the ripple will be greater for a half wave rectifier than for a full wave rectifier because the voltage will drop a greater amount during pulses. Uh, the larger the load, the greater the ripple. Uh, the smaller the capacity of the condenser, the greater the ripple. Same load, same, load, same filter condenser. Okay, filter condensers, capacitors, used in power supplies are of two types. One, paper dielectric condensers and two, electrolytic condensers. Paper condensers, by the way, I think um, when, when we use um, ceramic, uh, ceramic capacitors, I believe those are paper condensers. I think those ceramic, I think they've got a bit of paper in them. I'm not real sure actually, maybe it's just ceramic in them as well. Paper condensers are constructed of alternate layers of metal foil and waxed paper rolled together. The waxed paper is the dielectric with the metal foil being used as plates. Paper condensers smaller than one micro, milli, microfarad, MFD is so probably one microfarad, could be millifarad, couldn't it? Used throughout most electronic equipment and larger values are sometimes used as filter condensers in power supplies. Paper condensers are not polarized and when, and when operated with their, within their voltage rating they last much longer than electrolytic condensers. However, large sizes of paper condensers are bulky and relatively expensive. They are normally not made larger than 16 millifarad so I'm going to guess MFDs for milli because usually they use U for micro don't they? High voltage power supplies use paper filter condensers which are oil impregnated and will withstand greater peak voltages than those impregnated with wax. Condensers are rated according to direct current working voltages DC, WV and also in peak voltage the DC working voltage is the maximum voltage the condenser is designed to operate at continuously. The peak voltage is the voltage above which the condenser dielectric will break down and act as a conductor. High voltage paper capacitors filters. F paper filter capacitors. Fascinating. Electrolytic condensers are usually used as power supply filter condensers because they can be made in very large sizes at low cost and are much smaller physically than paper condensers of the same capacity. Electrolytic condensers are made in larger sizes than paper condensers with the usual valves being between 2 millifarads and 1000 millifarads. MFD. I still don't really know what MFD is. This has 40 times the capacity of this. All right. So we're just going on with the details of capacitors. Wet electrolytics, how they're constructed. Ah, electrolytic capacitor. Okay. Improving the filter circuit. Improving the operation of the filter. When the 25 volts ripple from the input filter condenser appears across the resistor and output capacitor as shown below, the resistor presents 500 ohms resistance and the condenser presents only 80 ohms reactance. 
to 120 cycle AC ripple. This means that the AC ripple voltage is divided across a total of 580 ohms. About 1 7th of the AC voltage will appear across the condenser and 6 7 of the AC voltage will appear across the resistor. The AC voltage across the condenser will therefore <coughs> and therefore between B plus and ground will be 1 7 of 25 volts, about 3.5 volts AC. You see that the simple addition of a 500 ohm resistor and another filter condenser has succeeded in reducing the ripple voltage down to 3.5 volts which is about 1% of the total DC output. This amount of filtering is satisfactory for most applications in electronics. A heavy load causes a voltage drop. I can't deliver 350 volts under a heavy load. I can, I'm larger, heavier, and I cost a lot. <laughs> Suppose you consider the first fault, the difficulty of getting a high B plus voltage when a large load current is required. Many electronic equipment require that the power supply deliver 100 to 200 milliamps of current at a B plus voltage of 350 volts. All of this current must flow through the 50 ohm filter resistor and will, according to Ohm's law, cause a drop in voltage across that resistor. This means that if 200 milliamps flow through 500 ohms, the voltage drop across the resistor will be E equals IR equals 0.2 amps times 500 ohms equals 100 volts. Instead of getting 350 volts out of the filter, you will get only 250 volts. In order to get 350 volts out of the filter, the transformer will have to be made so that it will feed a much higher voltage into the rectifier to make up for the loss of voltage across the resistor. Increasing the voltage output of the transformer makes it larger, heavier and more expensive three very undesirable qualities. <clears throat> you have seen that one fault of the RC filter is that it causes a large voltage drop across the filter resistor which means that the transformer must put out a higher AC voltage in order to compensate for this loss. The second fault of RC filters is even more serious. A small change in the load current causes the B plus output to vary by many volts. You have read in the introduction to this section that it is important for the B plus voltage output to remain fairly stable in spite of changes in load current. Many types of electronic equipment draw varying amounts of load current from B plus voltage supply, but the voltage change must remain small in spite of this. As an example, suppose that you have a unit of electronic equipment that draws 50 milliamps from the B plus supply under one set of conditions and then the conditions change so that 100 milliamp are drawn from the B plus supply. First you have 50 milliamps flowing through a 500 ohm resistor and then you have 100 milliamps flowing through that same resistor. Suppose that the voltage <coughs> coming out of the filter is 350 volts and, and 50 milliamps are being drawn by the load. The voltage drop across the 500 ohm resistor will be E equals IR equals 0.05 times 500 equals 25 volts. Suddenly an additional 50 milliamps are drawn through the 500 ohm load resistor making a total of 100 milliamps. The result is an increased voltage drop across the 500 ohm resistor. Since the voltage drop has increased 25 volts, the output voltage must decrease by the same amount. The output voltage will decrease increase from 350 volts to 325 volts when the load current increases from 50 to 100 milliamp. Similarly, a change of 100 milliamp in the load current will cause the B plus voltage to drop 50 volts. Such a rise and fall in output voltage is very undesirable in electronic equipment. Voltage regulator circuits might be added to compensate for this voltage change due to the filter resistor, but it would require a larger and ex a large and expensive circuit to compensate for changes such as are indicated here. Mm. 
using a choke instead of a resistor. A resistor can do a fairly good job. Actually, I'm just going to take a quick break. I'll be back in a minute. Got, my, got myself a fresh coffee and I'm back. This, by the way, this is my, uh, <clears throat> like, uh, uh, it's a gauge. I'm not sure if you call it, what sort of a gauge you'd call it. Taper gauge. There we go, a taper gauge. It's metric and imperial. And you put it into things and it'll tell you how, how big the hole is. <laughs> anyway, just knock that off. Lives here. All right. So we're talking about using a choke instead of a resistor for our filter. A good filter butt. Okay, so let's find out. A resistor can do a fairly good job of filtering because <coughs> its resistance to AC is higher than the reactance of a filter condenser to AC. When the ripple voltage is placed across this circuit, the AC voltage divides so that only a small part of this ripple voltage appears across the filter condenser and at B+. The DC voltage divides across this circuit so that most of the DC voltage appears across the filter condenser and at B+. <coughs> what the filter circuit requires is that the resistor have a high resistance for AC and a low resistance to DC. A resistor presents exactly the same resistance to both AC and DC and cannot meet this requirement. When a filter resistor is used, its size must be a compromise between these two opposing requirements. There is, however, a certain type of component that will meet this requirement, the filter choke. From your study of AC circuits in basic electricity, you know that a choke opposes any change of current flowing through it. In other words, the inductance of a choke presents a high reactance to AC. Because a choke is made up of many turns of copper wire around a core, it also presents a low resistance to DC. A choke has the very qualities that are required to replace the resistor in a filter circuit. Inductors or chokes, as used in electronic power supplies, are called filtered chokes because they are used to choke out the AC. A 10 Henry choke is fairly small in size and will present a reactance up of about 7,500 ohms to 120 cycle ripple and will have a DC resistance of about 200 ohms. Such a choke has 15 times more reactance to AC than a 500 ohm resistor and also has less than half its DC resistance. Because of these excellent qualities, you will find that chokes are used in the filter circuits of most electronic power supplies. Before you learn about the various combinations of chokes and condensers that are used in filter circuits, suppose you fi find out about the construction of these components. A 10 Henry filter choke is 15 times better than a 100 ohm resistor for filtering AC and has less than half the DC resistance. Great. The purpose of a filter choke is to furnish a high impedance to AC ripple voltage and a low resistance to DC current. A choke consists of many turns of copper wire wound around a laminated iron core. The total impedance of the choke depends upon the number of turns of wire and the size, shape and material of the core. The DC resistance of the choke depends upon the total length of wire used and the diameter of the wire. By increasing the number of turns of wire and increasing the size of the core, you can raise the impedance. But this also increases the size and the weight of the choke. In addition, the increased length of the wire through which the current must flow causes the DC resistance to increase. The only way to decrease DC resistance is either to decrease the number of turns, which lowers the impedance, or increase the diameter of the wire, which increases the weight. Every type of choke manufactured is a compromise of size, weight, AC impedance and DC resistance requirements. Because requirements differ according to the equipment, many different sizes of choke are made. Chokes are rated by the amount of inductance, the DC resistance and the maximum amount of current flow. Typical filter chokes. 7 Henry's, 200 ohms, 150 milliamp, 2 pounds. That's heavy. For amplifiers and small transmitters. 7 Henry's, 550 ohms, 50 milliamps, half a pound. For small radio receivers. And uh, uh, 6 Henry's, 75 ohms, 500 milliamps, 24 pounds. For high voltage, high load power supplies. 
Cool. Uh, <clears throat> the single section choke and condenser input filters. The single section choke input filter consists of a filter choke in series with the power supply load and a filter condenser across the load. The DC component of the rectifier output appears across the load. Most of the AC component appears across the high inductive reactants of the choke. Only a small amount of AC appears across the filter the output filter condenser because of its low reactance. Since the load is in parallel with the output filter condenser, very little ripple appears across the load. So a uh, single section choke input filter circuit. So we've got uh, high reactance. This is a, a, a choke. High reactance, large AC voltage drop. Okay, load resistor. B plus, low reactance, small AC voltage drop. A single section condenser input filter consists of a filter condenser connected across the input terminals of a single section choke input filter. Because of the shape of the circuit diagram, filter circuits of this type are sometimes called Pi type filters. I don't really follow that. Large values of inductance and capacitance are used in condenser input filters so that they are often called brute force filters. Inductance values from 10 to 30 Henry's are, and capacitance values from 2 to 16 microfarads are commonly used single section condenser input filter circuit also known as a pi type filter hmm. you will see that the single section choke input filter does just a little better a little better job of filtering than the condenser alone the voltage output of the choke input filter is lower than the voltage output of the condenser alone. This is because the choke builds up a back EMF which cancels a part of The voltage coming out of the rectifier. An important feature of the choke input filter is that it limits the peak current flowing through the rectifier through the rectifier tube and as a result there is less strain on the tube. The choke input <coughs> filter also has the characteristic of holding the output voltage quite constant despite load variations. Because of these last two characteristics choke input filters are used most commonly in power supplies which are subjected to heavy or varying loads. The results of using this type of filter for such loads are a more stable output voltage from the power supply and longer life of the rectifier tube. Alright, what are we looking at here? Steady output voltage, lower peak current. By comparing these waveforms and voltages with those of the preceding filter circuits, you can see that the condenser input filter does a better job of filtering than any of the others. The voltage output of this filter is larger than it was for the choke input filter because of the charging and discharging action of the input condenser. However, unlike the choke and input filter, this circuit draws large peaks of current from the rectifier tube. The voltage regulation is not as good as as it is for a choke input filter. The condenser input filter, very often called a brute force filter, is the most widely used filter circuit for applications where the required amount of DC power is small. A two section choke input filter <coughs> circuit consists of two single section choke input filters connected in series. Adding another condenser across the filter input terminals changes the choke input circuit to a two section condenser input filter. Both types of two section input, uh, so two section filters reduce the output voltage ripple to a negligible value. Resonant filter circuits may be used in power supplies, although they are usually used in other types of electronic circuits. A series resonant filter consists of a choke and a condenser connected in series across the output terminals of the rectifier circuit. You learn in basic electricity, series resonant circuits, that when a choke and condenser in series 
uh, resonant, their inductive and capacitive re uh, reactants cancel each other out and their total impedance is zero. Therefore, if the components used are resonant at the ripple frequency of the power supply, they will act as a short circuit across the load for that particular frequency. A parallel resonant combination of LC can be used in series with one output terminal of the power supply to provide additional filtering at the ripple frequency. The parallel resonant circuit offers high impedance to the ripple frequency. When a condenser input filter is used, the instantaneous peak current of the rectifier may be much higher than the maximum current delivered to the load. The input condenser across the load circuit acts like a short circuit when a voltage is first applied to it. The initial charging current may exceed the rectifier rating. Series resistors are sometimes used with selenium rectifiers in order to limit the initial charging current of the input condenser. The input filter condenser. <sighs> Because of the time lapse between pulses of direct current, the output of half wave rectifier requires more filtering than that of full wave rectifier and the filtered output voltage will be lower. Filter condensers used in half wave power supplies are usually from two to four times as large as those used in full wave power supplies. Increasing the size of the filter condenser provides additional filtering. Half and full wave rectifier output. The higher the frequency of the AC input voltage to a power supply, the lower the value of the output contents is required. The time between pulses is shorter at high frequencies and the inductive action of the choke is greater at higher frequencies. Leader resistors. If the load is entirely removed from a power supply, the voltage rises to a value much higher than normal. With no load current, there is no DC voltage drop in the circuit and no discharge path for the filter condensers, resulting in a buildup in voltage across the filter condensers to a value approximately equal to the peak AC voltage applied to the rectified tube. To prevent soaring of the voltage at no load, resistors are often connected across the output terminals of power supplies. These resistors, called bleeder resistors, provide a discharge path for the filter condensers and also serve as a fixed load to bleed off a constant value of current. The bleeder resistor usually draws about 10% of the total rated current output of the power supply. Since a bleeder resistor prevents sharp increases in voltage output under slight or no load conditions, it improves the power supply voltage regulation and tends to maintain the output voltage at a constant value regardless of load. This method of voltage regulation is sufficient for most power supply applications, but in many cases, better voltage regulation is required. Bleeder resistors dissipate a relatively large amount of power as heat and should be mounted in a well-ventilated position. The resistance value and power rating of the bleeder resistor depend on the maximum voltage and current ratings of the power supply. For example, if a power supply is rated at 300 volts and can supply 100 milliamps, the bleeder current should be about 10 milliamps and the voltage <coughs> across the bleeder 300 volts. The bleeder resistance 30 kilo ohms is found by dividing the voltage 300 volts by the bleeder circuit current 0.01 amps. The power dissipated is equal to the voltage multiplied by the bleeder current 300 times 0 0.01 equals 3 watts. The wattage rating of a resistor should be higher than the power dissipated so that a 30k 10 watt resistor is used as a bleeder. 10 watt resistor, holy cow. Bleeder resistor, improved voltage regulation. Bleeder resistor provides a discharge path for the filter condenser. Bleeder resistors provide a continuous load for the power supply. Bleeder resistors are sometimes tapped to provide one or more voltages lower than the maximum voltage of the, power, of the power supply. The bleeder may consist of several resistors connected in series across a, so, uh, a source of voltage with various voltages available at the resistor junctions. When a bleeder is connected directly across the power supply <coughs> output, the voltage at various points along the bleeder is exactly proportional to the resistance at that point provided no current is drawn from any of the taps. 
For example, if a 3 kilo ohm resistor tapped at 7.5 kilo ohms, 15 kilo ohms, and 22.5 kilo ohms is connected across the output of a 300 volt power supply, the voltage divides proportionately. At the 15 k ohm, the 15 kilo ohm tap, the voltage is one half of the total, or 150 volts. At the 7.5 kilo ohm tap, it is one fourth of the total, or 75 volts. And the 22.5 ohm tap, sorry, 22.5 kilo ohm tap, it is three fourths of the total, or 225 volts. The bleeder current through the resistor is 10 milliamps. Voltage drops across a tapped bleeder resistor. There you go. But it did say provided that uh, there's no current, no appreciable current being drawn. The voltages available at the voltage divider taps depend on the current drawn from each tap and are affected by changes in current supplied by any of the voltage taps. When a load is connected to any of the taps, its resistance is in parallel with a portion of the voltage divider. This forms a series parallel circuit and reduces the total resistance across the circuit resulting in an increase in current drawn from the power supply. The voltage drop in the series part of the voltage divider circuit increases due to the increased current and the voltage drop and bleeder current for the parallel part of the voltage divider are decreased. A tap bleeder with resistor with a load connected uh, increased current results in larger voltage drop than caused by bleeder current alone. Load resistor decreases total resistance across the power supply output. A typical voltage divider for a 300 volt 10 milliamp power supply might provide for a bleeder current of 10 milliamps a tap at 200 volts to supply 40 milliamps and a tap at 150 volts to supply 50 milliamps. To find the resistance values for each part of such a voltage divider circuit, the voltage drop and the current through each resistor must be found. In the illustration, points A, B, C and D provide the desired voltage taps and the resistance values of R1, R2 and R3 are found as follows. R1, the voltage drop across R1 between points C and D is 150 volts. The current flow through R1 is only the bleeder current or 10 milliamps. Then R1 equals 150 divided by 0 0.01 equals 15 kilo ohms. Uh, R2, so R1, uh, points C and D, oh, here we go. Okay, R2, the voltage drop across R2 between points B and C is 50 volts, 150 minus, oh, 150 to 200 volts. The current flow through R2 is bleeder current 10 milliamps, plus the load current 50 milliamps. Okay. So R2 is 50 divided by 0 0.06 equals 833 ohms. And R3, the voltage drop across R3 between points A and B is 100 volts, 200 volts to 300 volts. The current flow through R3 is the sum of the bleeder current and the current through each load. So... 10 plus 60, uh, 10 plus 50, 10 plus 50 plus 40, 100 milliamps. So R3 is 1 kilo ohm. The wattage dissipation of each resistor is found by multiplying the current through the resistor by the voltage drop across it. So we've got, uh, for R1, we've got uh, 150 volts times what's it, 0 point, uh, times the current. Oh, so it's just voltage times current, of course. 1.5 watts. And then this is uh, 
60 milliamps, 50 volts, 3 watts, and this is uh, 100 volts, 0.1 amp, 10 watts. It's a pretty big resistor. Review of filter circuits. Filter capacitors. Capacitors used in power supplies to change the pulsating DC output of rectifiers into DC having a relatively slight variation in value. The condenser charges through the rectifier circuit and discharges through the load circuit to help maintain voltage applied to the load <coughs> at a steady, st steady value. <coughs> Paper filter condensers <coughs> Uh, paper filter capacitors. Paper filter condensers are bulky and their value is usually limited to less than 10 millifarads. They are not polarized and can be made to withstand very high voltages. There is no appreciable leakage across a paper filter condenser. Oil impregnated paper condensers are used in high voltage filter circuits. Electrolytic filter capacitors Electrolytics have a high value of capacitance as compared to a paper condenser of the same physical size. They are polarized and are normally constructed to operate at less than 600 volts. There is appreciable leakage across the electrolytic condenser, but this effect is usually offset by their large values of capacitance. Electrolytics range in value from 1 to 1000 MFD. Wet electrolytic capacitors. A condenser consisting of a metal electrode immersed in an electrolytic solution. The electrode and solution are the two condenser plates while an oxide film formed on the electrode is the dielectric. The dielectric film is formed by current flow <coughs> from the electrolyte to the electrode. Dry electrolytic condensers. In a dry electrolytic condenser, the electrolyte is a paste. Cloth which is impregnated with the paste is rolled between layers of metal foil which act as the condenser terminals. One metal foil is the positive plate and a film formed on its surface is the dielectric. The electrolyte paste is the negative condenser plate and its terminal connection is made through a layer of metal foil negative aluminium electrode, gauze saturated with electrolyte, positive aluminium electrode, aluminium oxide film. Hmm. Filter choke. An iron core inductance placed in series with the rectifier output. It opposes any change in current flow and reduces the amount of change in the pulsating DC output of the rectifier circuit. Chokeless power supply filter. A low current power supply filter circuit in which resistors are used in place of filter chokes. Resistors are used to save weight, space and cost. Single selection choke input filter. Single section choke input filter. A filter circuit consisting of a filter choke connected in series with the filter output and a filter condenser connected across the output terminals. The output voltage ripple is between 3 and 10% of the DC output voltage. Single section condenser input filter. A filter circuit consisting of a filter choke connected in series with the rectifier output and two filter condensers, one connected across the filter input and the other across the filter output terminals. The output voltage ripple is less than that of a single section choke input filter and the voltage output is higher than that of the choke input filter. Two section choke input filter. A filter circuit consisting of two single section choke input filters connected in series. The output ripple is a negligible value for most power supply applications. Two section condenser input filter. A two section choke input filter with an additional filter com condenser connected across the filter input terminals. The voltage output is increased as compared to a choke input filter and the ripple is reduced. Voltage regulation. By this time you understand the theory of operation of rectifier circuits and filter circuits. You appreciate the importance of maintaining a power supply in good working order so that the complete electronic equipment may be able to do its job. 
Now you are going to study voltage regulated power supply circuits which are required to do specialized jobs that the ordinary general purpose power supply cannot do. Like other circuits you will use, voltage regulated circuits range from very simple circuits using only one or two parts to very complex circuits requiring many components. However, all of these circuits operate in the same way as the basic regulator circuits. Your DC output remains constant. There you go. You already know that the two most important factors which affect the B plus voltage output in a conventional power supply. When the AC line voltage goes up, the B plus output voltage goes up. And when the AC line voltage goes down, the B plus output voltage goes down. Also, when there is a small current drain out of the B plus terminal, the B plus voltage is higher than when there is a large current drain. What you want to know now is how the voltage regulator circuit overcomes both these problems. If you connect a potentiometer across B plus and ground in any conventional power supply, you have a perfect hand operated voltage regulator. Assume that you have a one kilo ohm potentiometer and a power supply with a B plus of 100 volts. Assume that you want a steady output voltage of 50 volts. You first adjust your potentiometer so that the center tap is right at the middle of the potentiometer resistance. If the B plus voltage rises momentarily due to an increase in AC line voltage or a decrease in B plus current drain, all you do is move the tap closer to the ground, decreasing the resistance between the tap and ground until you get 50 volts again. If the B plus voltage falls due to a decrease in the AC line voltage or an increase in B plus current drain, all you do is move the tap away from the ground and increase the resistance between the tap and ground until you get 50 volts again. You can see that the hand operated voltage regulator works very well. You increase or decrease the resistance between ground and the output voltage tap to increase or decrease the output voltage back to the desired value whenever the B plus supply voltage falls or rise for any reason. The main fault with this method is that it is too slow. First the output voltage must change, then you must notice that it has changed, then you must increase or decrease the resistance between the voltage tap and the ground to get back the desired voltage output. When you consider that there are many electronic circuits in a radar system which must have a steady voltage, you can see that many men would be needed to keep them all regulated. The voltage regulator circuit solves all your problems. The voltage regulator tube automatically increases or decreases its internal resistance as the B plus supply voltage falls and rises so as to maintain a constant voltage across itself the voltage regulator tube. The voltage regulator tube consists of a plate and a cathode placed in an envelope containing a gas at low pressure. There is no filament and therefore the tube is known as a cold cathode type tube. The radio symbol for the tube is as illustrated. The dot inside the envelope indicates the presence of a gas. There you go. Cold cathode gas field. When a large enough potential is applied between the cathode and the plate, the gas in the tube conducts and electrons flow from the cathode to the plate. Conduction is characterized by a bluish glow inside the tube. The heavier the conduction, the brighter the glow. The numbering system used for voltage regulated tubes has been changed in recent years. The VR150-30 and the VR90-30 and the VR75-30 are old numbers no longer used. The term VR meant voltage regulator. <sighs> the first number 150 etc stood for the operating voltage of the tube, the voltage at which it regulated. The last number uh, represented the maximum rated current that could pass through the tube without damaging it. In all regulated tubes there is also a minimum operating current of about 5 milliamps. The tube will stop conducting if the current through it drops below this value. A wide range of regulated voltages can be had by using any of the voltage regulated tubes slight, singly or in series combinations. The new numbering system for the VR tubes is as follows. Tube type DC operating voltage current range. OA2 operating 151 volts current range 5 to 30 milliamps 
Okay. Uh, wow. Well, under this new system, there there are available a larger variety of DC operating voltages and current ranges. The VR tube is a diode which consists of a thin vertical rod held in position inside of a thin metal cylinder. The air is removed from the tube envelope and is replaced by a small quantity of neon or helium gas mixed with a small quantity of argon gas. As long as the current flow through the tube is kept within the listed limits, the plate voltage of the tube will change very little. If operating voltages higher than those listed above are required, two or more VR tubes may be connected in series. In this case, the operating voltages will become the sum of all the operating voltages of the tubes connected in series. Parallel operation is used when a larger current is required. Here is an example of how a VR tube is used in a typical circuit. Suppose that you have a power supply with an output voltage of 340 volts DC. You need to supply voltage to a special circuit that needs 150 volts DC with a current variation from 10 to 30 milliamps. This circuit requires that the 150 volts DC be kept constant in spite of the current change. Since you want a constant voltage of 150 volts DC with a maximum current drain of 30 milliamps, an OD3 VR150 will meet your requirements. OD3. 153 volts operating voltage, 5 to 40 milliamp draw. <clears throat> Here are the operating characteristics of the OD3 VR150 as listed by the manufacturer. Note that they meet your requirements. DC power supply voltage, 185 volts min. DC starting volts, 160. DC operating voltage, 153. DC operating current, 5 to 40 milliamp. For a, for a current variation from 5 to 30 milliamp, the voltage will change 2 volts. For a current variation from 5 to 40, the voltage will change 4 volts. Power supply, tube, OD3, VR150. Notice that there is a jumper connection between pins 3 and 7. inside the tube. If pins 3 and 7 are wired in series with the circuit, this jumper will act as a switch. When the VR tube is pulled out, the circuit requiring the 150 volts will be disconnected from the power supply. If this jumper were not connected as a switch and the VR tube were pulled out, the 150 volt circuit would receive more than 150 volts, resu resulting in damage to its components or in improper operation. I think it's funny this book's never been open to this page ever. <laughs> That's been sitting there for like 60 years. I don't want to damage it. Am I going to pull that apart? I'm not going to I'm not going to pull that apart. Uh, a simple VR tube circuit. In order to illustrate the circuit described on the previous sheet, VR tube is connected to the power supply like this. Alright, so this is just going to go on about um, voltage regulated tubes, like the VR150. It's all well and good. So, uh, some uh, simple equations there for calculating bits and pieces. Voltage, oh here we go, the review, we're up to the review for voltage regulators. Good. So, voltage regulation. Voltage regulation is a term used to express how well a power supply maintains a constant voltage output in spite of changes in line voltage and load current. There are certain types of electronic circuit that will not operate properly if the supplied voltage varies more than a few volts. The voltage supply to these circuits requires the addition of a voltage regulator circuit which will maintain an essentially constant voltage regardless of line voltage and load current changes. Voltage regulator tube. The voltage regulator VR tube contains a plate and a cathode with no filament, both enclosed in a glass envelope containing a gas at low pressure. 
when a large enough voltage is applied across the tube, a current is conducted through the tube. As long as the current flowing through the tube remains within the limits listed by the manufacturer, the voltage at the plate will remain essentially constant. VR tube circuit. The simplest and very widely used voltage regulator circuit consists of a voltage dropping resistor and a VR tube placed in series across the power supply output and ground. The regulated voltage is taken from the plate of the VR tube. The load current and the VR tube current both flow through the dropping resistor and the VR tube current changes along with the load current so as to keep the dropping resistor current constant. VR tube jumper. The purpose of the jumper in a VR tube is to prevent unregulated voltage from reaching a special electronic circuit of the VR if the VR tube is pulled out. Without the jumper, unregulated voltage would reach the circuit, causing improper operation and possible damage. Pulling out the VR tube removes the jumper and disconnects the voltage from the special circuit. Why, why the need for other types of power supplies? Nearly every power supply you will find in electronic equipment will consist of a half or full wave rectifier with a choke or a condenser input filter. Full wave rectifier, half wave rectifier, choke input filter, condenser input filter. However, there are certain other types of power supplies that will occasionally be found in special types of electronic equipment. These special types of power supplies will be found in equipment upon which are placed size and weight limitations or limitations as to the type of voltage available from the power line if a power line is available at all. Size or weight limitations may require that no transformers or chokes be used in the power supply. In certain cases it may be necessary to eliminate the bulky rectifier tube. There will be cases where AC voltage is not available requiring the use of a 110 DC line. At some time or another you may even find that 110 DC voltage is not available and only a low voltage DC line or low voltage batteries are available. Too big, too heavy, wrong source. The purpose of this portion of the power supply section is to show you how high voltage DC may be supplied to vacuum tubes under these various restrictions. Even though these power supplies are not common, you should know how they work because you are sure to come across at least several of them in the near future. Learn them now and save yourself future headaches. General types. The special types of power supplies you will learn about in the remainder of this topic are divided into two main groups. One, power supplies which are included in equipment upon which there are size and weight limitations. In this group are included A. Transformerless power supplies B. Transformerless and chokeless power supplies Size and weight limitations Transformerless power supplies and uh, transformerless and chokeless power supplies and two power supplies which are designed for equipment which will have only DC voltage available either from a DC line or from battery sources a vibrator power supplies and b motor generators dynamotors and rotary converters only DC voltage available motor generators dy dynamotors and rotary converters Vibrator power supplies. Transformerless power supplies. Transformerless power supplies are sometimes used in some electronic equipment to save the weight and space of the power transformer. In commercial radios, transformerless power supplies are very often used to save the cost of the transformer as well as to save the space and weight. Nearly any portable radio that you may look into will have a transformless power supply and many console model radios are made that way too. <clears throat> there are three types of transformless power supplies in general use. The AC DC half wave rectifier, the voltage doubler and the dry metal rectifier power supplies. The AC DC half wave rectifier power supply. The AC DC half wave rectifier power supply is useful only in circuits where the tubes will operate at about 100 volts. B plus and with tubes that have high voltage filaments. This circuit will supply about 
100 volts B plus and will operate either AC or DC. The circuit itself is a simple half wave rectifier circuit usually followed by a condenser input filter. You are acquainted with the operation of both of these circuits. Notice that the filaments of the rectifier tube and the other tubes in the circuit are all connected in series across the power line. As long as all the tubes have the same filament current requirement and as long as the filament voltage add up to approximately the line voltage, the circuit will operate properly. A typical 5 tube portable radio would use a 35Z5 rectifier tube, a 12SA7 first detector, a 12SK7 IF amplifier, a 12SQ7 second detector and a 50L6 audio amplifier. The filament voltages required by these tubes add up to 121 volts, which is close enough to the line voltage. There we go. The AC-DC half-wave rectifier power supply continued. One special thing about this power supply is that it will operate on either AC or DC. If a transformer were included in the circuit, the transformer would burn out or a protecting fuse would blow in the event that it was connected to a DC line. In the AC-DC half-wave power supply there is no transformer. When the plate of the rectifier tube is connected to the positive side of a DC line and when the cathode is connected to the negative side of a DC line through the load, the circuit will supply B plus voltage. The rectifier plate will always be positive with respect to the cathode and a steady stream of electrons will be attracted to the plate. A B plus voltage with very little ripple will appear at the cathode. So I think they said, uh, notice that for DC line operation the plate must always be connected to the positive side of the line and the cathode must always be connected through the load to the negative side of the line. If these connections should be reversed accidentally because of the use of a non-polarized line plug, the plate of the rectifier would be negative and would attract no electrons from the cathode. The circuit will not work. Whenever a power supply of this type does not operate on a DC line, one of your first checks should be to pull out the line plug, it, line plug and turn it so as to reverse the rectifier tube connections to the line. The use of a polarized line and line plug prevents this trouble. If an AC line is used, this power supply will operate no matter how the line plug is connected to the line. However, one side of the AC line is usually grounded and one side is hot. If the rectifier is plugged in so that the cathode is connected to the hot side of the line through the load, there will be more AC hum in the circuit attached to the power supply. Whenever you notice excessive hum in equipment using a power supply of this type, try reversing the line plug. The use of a polarized line and line plug will prevent this trouble. The voltage doubler power supply. A transformerless type of power supply which is sometimes used in electronic equipment is the voltage doubler. The disadvantage of the AC-DC half-wave power supply is that it will furnish only about 100 volts B+, which places great restrictions upon the type of circuits which may use this power supply. Voltage doublers do away with this problem by supplying approximately 300 volts B+, when connected to a 110 volt AC line. The voltage doubler DC output is twice the peak AC input. <clears throat> the uh, operation of a voltage doubler circuit is very simple and is shown in the illustration. <coughs> the circuit uses a rectifier containing two plates and two cathodes, giving you half-wave rectifier circuits. Each of the two half-wave rectifier operates off the same AC input. When the right-hand AC input terminal is positive, the upper rectifier in the diagram conducts electron current and the upper condenser charges up to the peak line voltage. When the left hand AC <coughs> when the left hand AC input terminal is positive, the lower rectifier in the diagram conducts electron current and the lower condenser charges up to peak line voltage. Each condenser is now charged and both are in series with respect to the DC output terminals. The sum of these two peak voltages is now available as a DC output, which is equal to twice the peak voltage of the AC input. 
in circuits of this type, the heaters of the rectifier tube and the other tubes in the circuit are all connected in series in the same way as with the AC-DC half wave rectifier. The voltage doubler will operate only when connected to an AC line since the doubling effect is due to the reversal in line voltage. The voltage doubler circuit sometimes has a transformer between the line and the AC input terminals of the doubler circuit. The transformer is used either to isolate the circuit from the ground of the AC line or to put a higher AC voltage into the circuit so as to get a very high voltage DC output. Dry metal rectifier power supplies. So we learned about dry, dry metal uh, earlier. <clears throat> Talking about uh, transformerless and chokeless power supplies. Yeah. I'm going to read this. I'm interested. Okay, well, I'm not sure. Might as well just keep going. Dry metal rectifier power supplies. Earlier you learned how dry metal rectifier circuits work. Dry metal rectifiers allow you to eliminate the transformer and electronic power supply. Dry metal rectifiers have the advantage of being rugged, long-lived, small in size and capable of large current output. They are quite adaptable to being hooked up in half-wave, full-wave and voltage doubler circuits. They also can be hooked up to give either a positive or negative voltage output. Dry metal rectifiers are used to some extent in radar, sonar and communications equipment. In addition, they are also used as the rectifier in AC voltmeters. A few common circuits that contain dry metal rectifiers are shown below. Since you are already acquainted with both dry metal rectifier and the circuits themselves, you should be able to understand how these circuits work without further explanation. <clears throat> when power is first applied, a high current will flow to charge the input condenser. You will notice that a resistor R is inserted in, in series with each half wave rectifier element. This resistor is put in as a current limiting device to prevent too much current from flowing through, from flowing through the rectifier. Half wave dry metal rectifier circuit. Voltage doubler circuit. Bridge rectifier. Transformerless and chokeless power supplies. Eliminating the choke as well as the transformer from the power supply results in the savings of weight, space and cost. The choke may be eliminated from the filter circuit by replacing it with a resistor. The result is a resistor capacitor filter, RC filter, as shown in the illustration. Okay, so there's your LC filter and your RC filter. <clears throat> RC filters are economical and work very well whenever the load current drawn from the filter circuit is small. RC filters are used extensively in oscilloscopes, vacuum tube voltmeters and other equipment that require very little B plus current drain. The advantage of the RC filter is its savings in weight, space and cost. The disadvantage is that the filtering action is effective only with small B plus current drain. As you recall, a, cloak, a choke presents a high impedance to the AC ripple coming out of the rectifier and the condenser pre presents a low impedance. As a result, most of the ripple will appear across the choke and very little will appear across the condenser and the load. The DC voltage, however, <coughs> is not presented with any impedance by the choke other than the resistance of the winding, which is very low. The RC filter offers the same resistance to both the AC ripple and the DC current. As a result, there is a drop in DC voltage caused by the DC current flow through the re filter resistor. 
If the value of the resistor is made low to decrease the DC voltage drop, ripple voltage will get through the filter. If the value of the resistance is increased to stop the AC ripple, the drop in DC voltage will be too great. The only way to make this type of filter operate efficiently is to use a large value of resistance to draw very little DC current from B+. Very little DC current flowing through the high value of the resistance means that there will be very small DC voltage drop across the resistor and the filter will operate efficiently. Now that you know something <coughs> Pardon me. Now that you know something about power supplies that are specially designed to save weight and space and cost in commercial applications, you are ready to find out something about power supplies that are designed to operate electronic equipment when only DC voltage is available. I love it how, I love it how they say it's to say that the military they want to save weight and they want to save space but they only care about cost in commercial applications, not military applications. They don't to hell with the cost. It's weight and space, baby. <laughs> I'll start again. Now that you know something about power supplies that are specially designed to save weight and space and cost in commercial applications, you are ready to find out something about power supplies that are designed to operate electronic equipment when only DC voltage is available. In order to operate electronic equipment properly, a fairly high DC voltage is required for the various vacuum tubes in the equipment. When an AC line is available, it is a simple matter to set up the available AC voltage by means of a transformer and rectify the resulting high voltage AC into <coughs> uh, high voltage DC. You have seen that when space and weight restrictions are important, power supplies may eliminate the transformer and put out a DC voltage of approximately 100 volts B+. You have also seen low voltage doubler circuits can give you a B plus voltage twice the peak value of the AC line without the use of a transformer. You are now ready to find out how high voltage DC can be supplied to electronic circuits when the only source of voltage is a DC at 110 volts or lower uh, voltage sources such as batteries. The general solution to this problem is to change the DC to AC which can be stepped up in voltage in voltage and then rectified into high voltage DC. This is done by means of vibrators, motor generators, dynamotors and rotary converters. When DC voltage at approximately 110 volts is available and if a B plus voltage about uh, 100 volts is satisfactory, the AC DC half wave rectifier power supply already described may be used. Vibrator power supply, motor generator, dynamotor, rotary converter. Vibrators. The vibrator type power supply. <clears throat> the vibrator type power supply changes how voltage DC from batteries or DC line into high voltage DC by means of three operations. One, the low voltage DC is changed into AC of the same voltage. Two, the low voltage AC is put into a transformer and comes out as high voltage AC. The high voltage AC is rectified and filtered into high voltage DC. The vibrator is the means by which the first operation is accomplished. That being, the low voltage DC is changed into AC of the same voltage. The vibrator, okay, operation two is accomplished by means of a transformer. Operation three is done by means of either the vibrator or one of the conventional vacuum tube rectifier and filter circuits with which you are already familiar. The construction of a simple vibrator is shown below. A heavy strip of metal serves as a frame to hold a small electromagnet, a spring, spring metal reed, and two electrical contacts in place. A soft iron tip is mounted on the free end of the reed near the electromagnet. The electromagnet is mounted slightly off center so that it can move the reed whenever current flows in the coil of the electromagnet. This vibrator mechanism is inserted in a metal cover which is often lined with a vibration absorbing material such as soft rubber what goes on inside the vibrator. 
Okay, so there's an electromagnet coil, a vibrating reed, and contacts, and a cover with rubber lining. The vibrator you saw on the last sheet is connected to the primary winding of a transformer as shown in the illustrations on this sheet. For the moment, ignore the transformer secondary circuit and just consider what takes place in the primary circuit. Before the DC source, here shown as a battery, is connected into the circuit, the reed remains <coughs> between the two contacts. When the battery is put into the circuit, the following things happen. A small DC current flows from the battery through the electromagnet through the lower half of the transformer primary and back into the battery. The electromagnet builds up a magnetic field and attracts the reed towards the lower contact. The reed strikes the lower contact and a large DC electron current flows from the battery through the reed through the lower contact through the lower half of the transformer primary and back into the battery. When the vibrator reed hits the low, lower contact, it puts a direct short across the electromagnet coil. This causes the magnetic field to collapse. Since the electromagnet can no longer hold the reed against the lower contact, the reed springs back past the center position and strikes the upper contact. When the reed strikes the upper contact, the following things happen. A uh, large DC electron current flows from the battery through the reed, through the upper contact, through the upper half of the transformer primary and back into the battery. Since the electromagnet is no longer shorted by the reed, it builds up a magnetic field and pulls the reed back towards the lower contact. The entire cycle is repeated again and again. Vibration take place at approximately 100 times per second. The net result is an AC current that flows through the primary of the transformer, first in one direction and then in the opposite direction. This reversal of current induces high voltage in the transformer secondary. This high voltage is rectified by a vacuum tube rectifier circuit and becomes high voltage DC. The fact that this high voltage DC has square topped peaks instead of the usual sine wave shape does not matter. The filter <coughs> circuit the filter circuit circuit changes it into a smooth B plus voltage. The type of vibrator used in this circuit is known as a non-synchronous vibrator. Radio interference eliminator. Buffer condenser. Radio interference eliminator. Voltage across transformer primary, voltage across transformer secondary, voltage from B plus to ground. That's great. Because of the very sharp voltage surges uh, occurring in the vibrator power supply circuit, various difficulties are experienced with this type of circuit. One annoying trouble is sparking at the vibrator contacts due to the very high voltage induced in the secondary at the instant the reed separates from the contacts. This sparking shortens the life of the vibrator, but it may be eliminated to a large extent by inserting a buffer condenser across the secondary to short out the sharp voltage pulses. This condenser has a fairly critical value, usually in the range from 0.0005 to 0.05 microfarads. The buffer condenser reduces sparking so that the life of the vibrator contacts will not be shortened. However, any remaining sparking may cause radio interference. This radio interference is eliminated by adding the RF chokes and condensers in the transformer primary center tap and in the rectifier output. Another type of vibrator circuit is one that makes use of the vibrating reed to rectify the high voltage AC from the transformer secondary into pulsating DC without the use of a separate rectifier. This circuit is known as the synchronous vibrator circuit. The portion of the circuit in the transformer primary works exactly the same as the non-synchronous vibrator circuit. The transformer secondary is connected back to the vibrator reed by means of an extra pair of contacts as shown in the diagram. Okay. The synchronous vibrator seems to have two of them. The two vibrating reeds shown connected together by the dotted line 
in the diagram are actually one reed placed between two pairs of contacts. The action of the reed between the transformer secondary contacts produces the same result as a full wave rectifier. RF chokes and buffer condensers are used in this vibrator circuit in the same manner as the non-synchronous vibrator to eliminate contact sparking and radio interference. Motor generators, dyna motors and rotary converters are sometimes used to operate AC electronic equipment when only DC so source of voltage is available. A motor generator consists of a motor and a generator mechanically connected together. For the application being considered, DC motor would be used to drive an AC generator which would be designed to give a 60 cycle output at line voltage. Equipment designed to operate from 60 cycle AC at line voltage could then be operated from a DC source by means of this type of motor generator. This type of motor generator could be used as an emergency unit by having the equipment operate off the AC line under normal conditions and the equipment could operate from a battery source by means of the motor generator in the event of an AC line failure. A dynamotor is a rotating DC machine that operates from a low voltage DC source and puts out one or several high voltage DC outputs. It is basically a DC motor with a DC generator built onto one armature and having two or more windings and two or more uh, com commutators. Dynamotors are usually operated from 6, 12, 24 or 32 volt storage batteries and deliver from 250 to over 1000 volts DC at various current ratings. Dynamotor principle. Uh, motor winding, generator winding, 6 volt DC input, 250 volt DC output. Rotary converters are commonly used to change AC to DC but they may be used to operate off source batteries and give an output of 60 cycles AC at line voltage. When used to operate from DC sources, they give AC outputs. They are known as inverters. The construction of a rotary converter is similar to a DC generator, except that two slip rings are used, which are connected to commutator segments 180 degrees apart. Typical inverter unit. When the peak AC voltage output desired is no higher than the average DC voltage input, one winding may be used on the armature. If a greater voltage is desired, two windings are used on the same armature. The use of one armature on <coughs> and one field for both the AC and DC sections results in instability of operation. In order to increase st stability and AC and DC sections, the AC and DC sections are often wound on two armatures using separate fields. The two armatures are coupled together and the whole unit functions as a motor and a generator built into one unit. Review of transformerless power supplies. AC DC half wave rectifier power supply. This circuit will supply about 100 volts B plus and will operate from either <coughs> in AC. I'm just going to take a break. I'll be back in a minute. I'm back. I'm onto my third coffee for this book. And we're almost at the end of the first, <coughs> the first volume. So this is a review of transformerless power supplies. AC DC half wave rectifier power supply. This circuit will supply about 100 volts B plus and will operate from either <coughs> AC or DC power line. The circuit is a simple half wave rectifier circuit usually followed by a condenser input filter. The filaments of the rectifier tube and the other tubes in the circuit are all connected in series across the power line. Voltage doubler power supply. This circuit will operate, <coughs> sorry, this circuit will supply up to 320 volts B plus from this 117 volt AC power line without the use of a transformer. The circuit consists of two half wave rectifiers and two capacitors. The capacitors are connected in series and each is charged up 
to peak line voltage resulting in the voltage doubling effect. The filaments of the rectifier tube and the other tubes in the circuit are all connected in series across the power line. Dry metal rectifier power supply. Dry metal rectifiers may be used instead of vacuum tube rectifiers. Dry metal rectifiers are rugged, long-lived, small in size and capa capable of large current output. They can be hooked up in half-wave, full-wave and voltage doubler circuits. Chokeless power supplies. Any of the transformerless rectifier circuits listed on the previous sheet may be used with standard choke and capacitor filter circuits. However, an additional savings may be made in space, weight and cost if the filter choke is replaced with a resistor. This type of RC filter is effective only when a very small B plus current drain is required and a fairly large resistor can be used. Review of power supplies for DC voltage sources. Vibrators. A vibrator is a me mechanical device which changes DC into AC. A simple vibrator is essentially a single pole double throw switch with a vibrating switch arm. When the vibrator is connected to a transformer with the <coughs> with a center tap primary as shown, the action of the vibrating switch arm causes current to flow first in one direction and then in the other direction through the transformer primary. The transformer puts out an alternating high voltage which can be rectified and filtered into a high voltage DC. Synchronous vibrators. The non-synchronous vibrator changes DC into high voltage AC which must then be rectified by means of a vacuum tube rectifier. A synchronous vibrator does away with the need for a separate rectifier. The portion of the vibrator in the transformer primary works exactly as in the non-synchronous vibrator circuit. The transformer secondary is connected back into the vibrator rings by means of an extra pair of contacts as shown. The action of vibrating read between the transformer secondary contacts produces produces results the same as if it were a full wave rectifier were placed there. Cool. Motor generator. A motor and a generator mechanically coupled together. Equipment designed to operate from an AC power support source may be made to operate from the DC line if a motor generator is used. The DC motor is connected to the DC line and the DC motor spins the rotor of the AC generator which puts out 117 volts AC. Dynamotor, a rotating uh, DC machine that operates from a low voltage DC source and puts out one or more high DC voltages. A dynamotor is basically a DC motor and a DC generator built into one armature and having two or more commutators. Rotary converter. Rotary converters are commonly used to change AC to DC but they may be used to operate from storage batteries to give an output of 117 volts AC and are then known as inverters. The construction of a rotary converter is similar to a DC generator except that two slip rings are used which are connected to commutator segments 180 degrees apart. The jobs of a vacuum tube. This, by the way, is the, the, um, the rotary converter schematic or, or diagram. Slip rings. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how that works. The jobs of a vacuum tube. Up to this time you have been working with vacuum tubes used as rectifiers in power supply circuits. Your knowledge of diode tubes has been sufficient for an understanding of power supplies. However, from now on you are going to do a great deal of work with vacuum tubes in many types of circuits and now is the time to begin finding out about vacuum tubes. The subject of vacuum tubes is really a simple one because, and you will be glad to know this, vacuum tubes do only two types of jobs. A vacuum tube can <coughs> change an AC voltage into a pulsating DC voltage. This is called rectification. This job is accomplished by the diode. A vacuum tube can change a small AC voltage into a large AC voltage. This is called amplification. This job is done by the triode, the tetrode or the pentode. <coughs> You have been concerned with the vacuum tubes that take care of rectification. Later, in the amplifier section, you will learn about the other types of vacuum tubes. 
factors common to all vacuum tubes. The diode is one of the four basic types of vacuum tubes. There are many things which are common to all vacuum tubes and you won't have to learn all about these common characteristics each time you study another type of tube. You will learn about these things in your study of the diode. As previously stated, all vacuum tubes need a source of free electrons and you will find that each type of tube obtains them in the same way as the diode by thermionic emission. Furthermore, the cathode and filament structure does not differ very much from one type of tube to the next. You will study the effects of the filament on cathode emission only during your diode experiment. Remember, it's the same for the other tubes you will study. All right. Review of diode characteristics, current flow, no flow. We know how a diode works. Quick look at the graph. Okay, what are we looking at? Plate voltage, plate current. Here we go. Okay, I, I thought I'm just going to read it. I'm interested. <clears throat> Diodes are used as rectifiers in power supplies and as detectors, noise limiters, and automatically volume control tubes in radio receivers. Whatever their application is, however, diodes are used because they allow current to flow in only one direction. From the time the plate becomes just slightly positive with respect to the cathode until the time saturation is reached, the current in the diode is proportional to the plate voltage. Between these limits, then, the tube acts the same as an ordinary resistor. Of course, when the plate voltage rises above the saturation point, the current does not respond to voltage changes and therefore, in this region, the tube loses its resemblance to the resistor. <clears throat> when the plate becomes the least bit negative with respect to the cathode, no electrons will flow from the cathode to the plate. The tubes act as if it were a resistor in series with a switch and the switch were opened up. A simple way to show how a diode will respond to changes of voltage is with a graph. A graph picturing how a typical diode's current is affected by its plate to cathode voltage at two different values of filament voltage is shown below. From a quick look at the graph, you can tell that 1. At normal filament voltage of 6.3 volts, the plate current increases steadily as the plate voltage is increased from 0 to 20 volts. At the lower value of filament voltage, simulating the effect of an old tube, the plate current increases as the plate voltage is raised to about 8 volts, <coughs> and any further increases of plate voltage does not bring about an increased plate current. This shows us that at 8 volts, the plate is drawing all the electrons the cathode can emit. This undesirable restriction on the plate current, which is due to limited cathode emission, is called saturation. Even in a fairly new tube working at rated filament voltage of 6.3 volts, saturation would occur, but at a higher value of plate voltage. This would appear on the curve of 6.3 filament volts if higher values of plate voltage had been used. Review of power supplies. Before you leave the study of power supplies and go on to learn about amplifiers, suppose you review some of the important things you found out about power supplies and their components. Rectification. A diode vacuum tube allows electron current to flow in only one direction from the cathode to the plate. This effect permits AC voltage to be rectified into a pulsating DC voltage. Saturation. Plate current increases regularly as plate voltage is increased. When all of the electrons that can be emitted by the cathode are attracted to the plate, a further increase in plate voltage cannot attract any more electrons that are flowing already. When an increase of plate voltage fails to cause a rise in plate's current, the tube is said to be saturated. Saturation and filament voltage. Increasing the filament voltage increases the filament temperature resulting in a hotter cathode. The more heat the cathode, the, the more heat the cathode gets, 
the more electrons will be emitted from its surface. When the cathode emits more electrons, the saturation point will not occur until the plate voltage reaches a much higher value. Half-wave rectification. Changing the positive half cycles of an AC voltage to a pulsing DC by allowing current to flow through a circuit in one direction only. Full wave rectification. Changing both half cycles of AC to pulsating DC. Dry metal half wave rectifier. A circuit which produces half wave rectification by using a device <coughs> uh, consisting of two metallic plates which conduct current flow in only one direction. Rectifier tube, a vacuum tube diode consisting of plate and cathode which allow electron flow only from cathode to plate and thus acts as a rectifier. Vacuum tube rectifier circuit. A diode vacuum tube connected in series with AC voltage source change AC to DC. Transformer half transformer type half wave rectifier. A circuit which uses a transformer to supply high voltage AC to a vacuum tube rectifier which then rectifies it to pulsating high voltage DC. Full wave rectifier circuit. A circuit which uses a transformer and a full wave rectifier diode to produce full wave rectified pulsating DC from an AC input. <coughs> Review of power supplies continued. Filter circuits. Circuits consisting of inductors and capacitors used to change pulsating DC output of a rectifier to pure DC. Complete power supply. The complete circuit consisting of full wave rectifier and filter circuits used to supply high DC voltage to other circuits. Voltage regulator circuit. A circuit which uses a gas filled diode to maintain constant output voltage. The voltage across the tube terminals remains constant over a large range of source voltages or load current changes. Other power supplies. Transformerless and chokeless power supplies, vibrators, motor generators, dynamotors and rotary converters are other types of power supplies used to fill special requirements as to size, weight, power source available and load requirements. Index to volume one. That's pretty cool. All right, now we're up to volume two. Should we just keep going? Why not? This might be another long video. Dave Jones will probably tease me again. All right, volume two. Preface. The texts of the entire basic electricity and basic electronics courses as currently taught at naval specialist schools have now been released by the Navy for civilian use. This educational program has been an unqualified success. We've heard this before. We've heard... We, we heard this before. So they have used the same preface for all volumes. This is volume two. Amplifiers, introduction to amplifiers, the triode, the triode amplifier, tetrode and pentode, single stage amplifier, two stage RC coupled amplifier, the transformer coupled amplifier, the audio power amplifier, the output transformer, the push pull amplifier, microphones, earphones, and loudspeakers. Awesome. Look at that, we've got a record there. It's a bit of a throwback, isn't it? Got some uh, television. And that looks like a oscilloscope of some sort. <laughs> Examples of amplification. There are many things you can amplify. Examples of amplification. Uh, sight. Oh, I see. <laughs> you can amplify facts. <laughs> you can amplify sight. You can amplify sound. Yeah, right. Would you like to hear a whisper through a concrete wall or hear a fish pump water through its gills? Amplification makes all these things possible. There are, however, more important uses for amplifiers. 
of the three basic types of electronic circuits rectifiers, amplifiers and oscillators amplifiers are by far the most widely used the purpose of an amplifier is to take a very small voltage change one that is so small that it cannot be used and amplify it many times so that it can run a pair of earphones drive a loudspeaker be seen on a scope operate a motor and so on what a vacuum tube can do make a radio play show you your favorite television program operate a radar system which seeks out enemy planes what a vacuum tube tube can do continued when you first begin your study of vacuum tubes you learn that there are only two main jobs for vacuum tubes to do the first job is to change an AC voltage into a pulsating DC voltage this is called rectification the second job is to change a small AC voltage to large AC voltage this is called amplification because of your work <coughs> with rectifier and power supply circuits you now know all you need to know about rectification and the diode tubes that are used to do this job now you are ready to learn about the second main job a vacuum tube can do amplification in this section you will learn about the vacuum tubes that do the job of amplifying small AC voltages into large AC voltages a recent survey of vacuum tubes manufactured in the United States showed that there are over 1,200 different types of vacuum tubes available. These tubes come in a wide variety of shapes and sizes, enclosed in glass and metal shells. Most of these 1,200 tubes can be broken down into four main types. Once you understand these four main types, you will know them all. Whenever you run across a new tube, you'll always be able to understand what it does and how it works simply by comparing it to the four main types you know. The diode, triode, tetrode and pentode. Vacuum tubes come in various shapes and sizes. Their names describe them by telling how many parts, cathode, grid, plate, there are in the tube. A diode, where di equals 2, has two parts, a cathode and a plate. A triode, tri equals three, has three parts, a cathode, a plate, and a grid. A tetrode, tetra equals four, has four parts, a cathode, a plate, and two grids. A pentode, penta equals five, has five parts, a cathode, a plate, and three grids. <coughs> How vacuum tubes were development. Development of vacuum tubes. Fleming's valve, modern diode, triode, tetrode, pentode. Tubes have developed in a logical sequence. From Fleming's valve, which consists of two elements, the filament and the plate, to the modern diode, which the filament is replaced by a combination of a filament and a cathode, for reasons which will be discussed later, but which is still considered to be a two-element tube. The triode, a three-element tube which contains one grid, to the tetrode, a four element tube with two grids, and a pentode, five element tube with three grids. The reason you are being taught vacuum tubes is not so that you will learn to be able to repair one which has gone bad, you will only replace such a tube with a new one. You are being taught about these vacuum tubes in order to understand the circuits which use them, thereby to make you a more valuable troubleshooter of electronic equipment. You will remember from your work with power supplies that thermionic emission, the emitting of electrons by a hot cathode, allow you to change AC into DC. Notice the triodes, tetrodes and pentodes also contain a cathode which emits electrons and a plate which collects electrons. As you study these tubes you will see how the grids control electron flow to change small AC voltages into large AC voltages. The construction of each of these four types varies greatly. All diodes, for example, are not built the same, do not look alike, and do different jobs. In addition, combinations of diode, triode, and pentode may be put to one, uh, uh, put in one tube envelope. All these combinations add up to the 1,200 vacuum tubes manufactured today. 
the four main types, various combinations and shapes. Fair enough. Every electronic circuit has its particular needs and there is a vacuum tube for every job. Some have to handle small amounts of power, other large amounts. Sometimes they must work with low frequency currents, sometimes high frequencies and sometimes ultra high frequencies. Sometimes they must be made small enough so that they can fit in a hearing aid or to the fuse container of a high explosive shell. They must be heated by 1 volt, by 2 volts, or sometimes by 6 volts, etc. Sometimes, because of limited space available, a diode and a triode must share the same shell. Sometimes two diodes and a triode, or a diode, a triode and a pentode must share, this, must share the same shell. Say that 10 times fast. Amplifiers are designed to amplify only those frequency their type of equipment requires and can be divided into three general types according to the frequency range of the signals they amplify. Audio amplifiers. These amplify a band of frequencies from 15 cycles per second to 15,000 cycles per second. Of course, these days we'd call that a hertz. <clears throat> this is the range of frequencies which the ear can hear, therefore the name audio these amplifiers produce a great deal of the amplification in radio receivers, in intercom equipment, in sonar, and in many other types of equipment. Video amplifiers. These are similar to audio amplifiers in that they cover a wide range or band of frequencies and are also similar in design and operation. The frequency band, however, is very much expanded, covering frequencies from 30 CPS to 6 million CPS. That's uh, 6 megahertz and higher. Video amplifiers are used primarily to amplify signals for scope presentations in radar and fire control equipment and in television. And then the third type of amplifiers, radio frequency amplifiers. Unlike the other types, RF amplifiers amplify a narrow band of frequencies, but this narrow band may be anywhere within the wide range of frequencies from 30 kilohertz to several billions of cycles per second. That's several gigahertz. They are used in radar, fire control, sonar, radio, radio receivers and transmitters. When you tune a piece of equipment such as a home receiver, you are changing the narrow band of frequencies which the set will amplify. Audio amplifiers in radio receivers, intercom equipment, sonar. Video amplifiers in television, radar, sonar, fire control and RF amplifiers in radar, sonar, fire control, radio receivers, transmitters. Even though they may look different from one another, amplifiers all work in much the same way. In the following work, work you will learn the operation of audio amplifiers. They come first because <coughs> they are the simplest of the three and they will help you understand how the others work. One of the most important applications of vacuum tubes is their use to change small voltage into a large voltage voltage output. This process of increasing voltage is called amplification. For example, in an ordinary radio set, the tubes take a si signal of a few millionths of a volt from the antenna aerial and change it into a powerful signal that is capable of driving a loudspeaker. This requires a great deal of amplification. Low AC input, high AC output. You will find that vacuum tubes are used to produce amplification in receivers, in transmitters, in sonar, in radar, and in low RAN. Low RAN. <laughs> oh, that must be low range, something or other. And it is a foregone conclusion that when new types of electronic equipment come into use, some of the tubes there too will be used for amplification. One of the tubes which can produce amplification is the triode. For purposes of explanation, let's compare the triode to the water system shown below. In the water system, you're interested in controlling the flow of water. One way you can do this is by varying the pressure in the system or, in other words, changing the height of the water tank. Alright, so I'm going to tell you about how 
uh, how the tubes work. Control grid, saturation again. I'm just going to flip through here until we get. Uh, you have found this is how amplifiers work. You have found out a little bit about how important amplifier circuits are in equipment. Now you are ready to find out how they work. It's all very simple. A vacuum tube does the entire job of amplifying if you provide it with the proper operating voltages and connections. If you supply the proper voltages to the various tube elements, a small change in voltage applied to the grid causes a large change in voltage on the plate. The production of a large voltage change from a small voltage change is called amplification. You learn that a good way for you to, to picture the operation of a grid in a vacuum tube was to think of the grid as a valve in a water pipe. The British are so fond of this explanation that, to this day, they call a vacuum tube a valve. When the grid of the tube is very negative, the valve is closed and there is little or no flow of electrons from the cathode to the plate. When the grid voltage is changed so that it becomes only slightly negative, the valve is nearly wide open and there is large flow of electrons from the cathode to the plate. Now, a small flow of electrons from the cathode to the plate means that only a small number of electrons flow from the plate to the B-plus lead of the power supply, and a large flow of electrons from cathode to plate means a large current flow from the plate to the B-plus lead of the power supply. <sighs> I'm going into detail about the various tubes. Ah. Review of triode characteristics. Curve one. This is uh, plate voltage. Hmm. You can see that cutoff for this particular tube is about minus 14 volts. With 200 volts on the plate. As the grid voltage is made less negative, the current increases along EGIP curve. A portion of the curve is straight or linear. On this linear portion, the plate current variations are uniformly proportional to the grid voltage variations. In this linear region, a change of 2 volts on the grid produces a change of about 4 milliamps in the plate current. The graph shown here is called the EGIP curve. EG is the grid voltage and IP is the plate current. There you go. Curve 2. With the grid voltage set at minus 8 volts, it is seen that changes of plate voltage affect the plate current, but a 10 volt change on the plate causes only a very small change in the plate current. By comparing the results in curve 1 and curve 2, you can see that the grid exerts a greater control on the plate current than does the plate. Curve 3. While the tube is cut off from grid voltages and beyond, no current flows and there is no voltage drop across the plate load resistor. The plate voltage is equal to B plus while the tube is cut off. When the grid voltage becomes less negative, plate current flows and voltage drop is developed across the load resistor, causing the plate voltage to drop. Along the linear portion of the curve, a 2 volt change on the grid produces a change of about 30 volts on the plate. This is again amplification of 15. All right. Let's get up to the... Um, to the part where they summarize. Talking about DC bias. Talking about too much or too little bias. Oh, here we go. <clears throat> Classes of amplifier. The class of an amplifier is determined by its point of operation on the EGIP curve. There are three major classes of amplifiers, class A, B, and C. Class A amplifiers are biased to operate in the center of the linear portion of the EGIP curve. The amplifier described in the previous sheets is a class A amplifier. 
The class B amplifiers are biased to operate near cutoff, and class C amplifiers operate at a point where the bias voltage is equal to twice the cutoff voltage of the tube. The figure below shows the bias voltage for the three, three different classes of amplifiers. For this particular tube, the bias would be minus 2 volts for class A operation. Since class B operates at cutoff, the bias voltage must be minus 4 volts. For class C operation, the bias must be minus 8 because a class C amplifier operates at a bias equal to twice the cutoff value. The figure shown on the previous sheet is a comparison of the operating characteristics of class A, B and C amplifiers. This is what you should see from the illustration. Class A. The signal is small. It is never large enough to drive the grid either positive or beyond cutoff. Plate current flows during the complete cycle of signal input. The plate current variation is an exact duplicate of the grid signal. Class B. The signal is larger than for class A. The grid may be driven positive. The signal drives the grid beyond cutoff for approximately half the input cycle. Only the positive half of the input appears in the plate circuit. The total plate current change is much greater than the change produced by class A operation. Plate current flows for approximately half the complete cycle. Plate current is zero when no signal is put into the grid. Class C. The applied signal is the largest of the three classes. The grid is driven beyond cutoff and into the positive grid region. The plate current variation is the largest of the three classes. The peak of the current wave has a dip because the control grid is drawing current, thereby reducing the amount of current available to the plate. Plate current flows for less than half a cycle of input voltage. Without a signal on the grid, no plate current flows. A large signal voltage is necessary to drive the grid positive during each cycle. This class is used only in RF frequency power amplifiers. The class A amplifier is used primarily as a voltage amplifier. Class B and class C amplifiers are used as power amplifiers and are designed to deliver high currents. There <coughs> There are combinations of class A and class B amplifiers and these are called class AB1 and AB2. Class AB1 amplifiers are biased to a point slightly more negative than class A amplifiers. Class AB2 amplifiers are biased... I've got a dodgy... Oh, that's a bit dodgy. Yeah, it's dodgy. Turn it off. Class AB2 amplifiers are biased to a point slightly less negative than that of Class B. These classes of operation are actually compromises being between Class A and Class B. Battery bias. Okay. Power supply bias. Power supply bias. Generator type. Negative bias and positive plate voltage from the same power supply. Cathode bias. Cathode resistor. So there's an equation there, Ohm's law again. Uh, determining the size of the cathode resistor for a pentode or tetrode. A little bit of mathematics involved there. Uh, triode amplifier with a cathode bypass capacitor. Triode amplifier without a cathode bypass capacitor. Uh, a couple of ch charts there. The effect of cathode voltage variation. Okay, here we go, up to the review. So the review of the triode amplifier operation. Grid bias. The amount of grid bias voltage determines whether an amplifier is operating in class A, class B, or class C. In class A, the bias is less than the cutoff. In class B, bias is at or near cutoff. In class C, bias is much more than cutoff. B plus power supply bias. A single power supply can be used to supply a positive voltage for B plus and a negative voltage for grid bias. Cathode bias. A cathode bias resistor in parallel with a cathode bypass capacitor in the cathode circuit provide, provide the most widely used system of biasing. Triad amplification operation. The variation in voltage output, plate voltage, of a triode used 
as an amplifier may be 10 or more times larger than the variation in the grid voltage, the AC signal. Why the tetrode was developed. Alright, let's find out why the tetrode was developed. A capacitor, as you know, is nothing more than two pieces of metal separated by a dielectric insulator. In a vacuum tube, each pair of elements acts as if it were a small capacitor. In a triode, there are three such capacitors, one consisting of the grid and plate, one of the grid and cathode, and the third of the plate and the cathode. These are called the interelectrode capacitances, and each one has a capacitance of only a few micro microfarads. <sighs> grid to cathode capacitance. Plate to cathode capacitance. Grid to plate capacitance. The grid to plate capacitance is the one which causes most of the trouble. At high frequencies, it produces undesirable effects which may prevent the tube from amplifying properly. This will be explained later. The tetrode was developed to reduce the interelectrode capacitance between the control grid and the plate. The screen grid. In the, tetrode, te in the tetrode, a second grid is placed between the control grid and the plate. Now there are two small capacitors in series between the plate and the grid, and, of course, the total grid to plate capacitance is reduced. This second grid, called the screen grid, has the effect of shielding the plate from the first grid and allows the tetrode to be used at higher frequencies than the triode could be used. Normally, the screen grid has a high positive voltage and attracts electrons from the space charge just as the plate did in the triode. However, because the screen grid is a spirally wound thin wire, most of the electrons pass right through it and end up at the plate. The screen draws only a little current. Cathode, control grid, screen grid, plate. two capacitors in series, total capacity less than either one. The plate is usually kept at a higher voltage than the screen and the plate circuit does not differ much from that which is used with triodes. In the tetrode, however, the plate voltage has less effect on the tube current than it did in the triode. Secondary emission in tetrode in any tube, diode, triode, or tetrode, when one electron strikes the plate, it knocks several electrons out, known as secondary emission. This happens because the electrons are hitting the plate at high speed, which becomes ever greater as the plate voltage is raised. In the triode, secondary emission is not important since the plate is the most positive element in the tube and therefore attracts all the electrons that have been knocked out of it. In the tetrode, however, some of these <coughs> Secondary electrons, those which have been freed from the plate as a result of secondary emission, are attracted to the screen. Any flow of secondary electrons from the plate to the screen adds to the screen current and subtracts from the plate current. The number of secondary electrons which do not return to the plate depends upon the difference between the plate and the screen voltages. If the plate voltage is much higher than the screens, all the secondary electrons will return to the plate and there will be no decrease in place current. If the plate voltage is much lower than the screens, fewer secondary electrons will be emitted and all of these will be attracted to the screen. Okay, static characteristics of the tetrode. Alright, normal operation of the tetrode. Eliminating the effects of secondary emission. You have seen that the main disadvantage of the tetrode is the need for a high plate voltage to prevent distortion in its output due to the effect of secondary emission. The pentode is designed to overcome this undesirable feature of the tetrode by eliminating the flow of secondary electrons between the plate and the screen grid. This is accomplished by the inclusion of the third grid, the suppressor grid, between the plate and the screen grid. So this is the pentode with even another grid, the suppressor grid. Sounds a bit suppressing. How the pentode works. Alright, construction of a typical pentode tube. Anode or plate, suppressor grid, screen grid, control grid, cathode, heater. Ah, the beam power tube. 
You have learned from your study of the pentode that the suppressor grid reduces the effects of secondary emission. Instead of using the suppressor grid to control secondary emission from the plate, the same effect can be obtained by arranging the tube elements in such a way as to produce a negative charge near the plate. The action of this space charge is to repel any secondary emitted electrons back to the plate just as the suppressor does in the pentode. Typical beam power tube, plate anode or plate, beam forming plates, screen grid, control grid, cathode. Some uh, vital statistics of the various. Oh, there we go, up to our review. Yeah, that's very good. Review of tetrodes and pentodes. The tetrode, a tube having a screen grid to reduce plate to control grid capacitance. It is rarely used today, but was a step in the development to, of the pentode. The pentode, a tube which uses a suppressor grid between the screen grid and the plate to reduce the effect of secondary emission. It has greater amplification than the triode. The beam power tube. Tube using beam forming plates instead of the suppressor to reduce the effects of secondary emission. Its power output is greater for a given amount of cathode emission than that of a pentode. Pentode circuit. A circuit providing proper operating voltages for control grid, screen grid and suppressor grid. Typical amplifier stage. You are already familiar with the purposes of most of the components that will be used in this amplifier circuit. The 1 meg resistor in the grid circuit is there to prevent any negative charge from accumulating on the grid. The 12k resistor and the 25 millifarad capacitor in the cathode circuit are the basic components. The 270k resistor in the plate circuit is the load resistor. The 0.01 MFD capacitor and the 1 meg resistor will be the RC coupling to the next stage of amplification. Okay, the circuit. <coughs> The circuit shown below has two additional components. Uh, yep, here a resistor and a capacitor. You will notice that the plate load resistor is connected to B plus. That must be the plate load through the 25k resistor. This resistor and the 8 microfarad capacitor make up a special filter circuit called a decoupling filter. If some form of undesired coupling exists between the various circuits of a multi-stage amplifier, we say that we have feedback. This feedback causes the amplifier to generate a low frequency audio signal which sounds like a motorboat when heard from the loudspeaker. It is the job of the decoupling filter to eliminate the feedback and the resultant motorboating. The decoupling filter. Feedback in a three stage amplifier. Decoupling filter. So it's this resistor and capacitor, they're decoupling filters. Coupling may exist between circuits operating at the same frequency and have common impedance. If an amplifier contains several stages of amplification, all those stages will be supplied with plate voltage from a single source of DC power. The plate currents of all the amplifier tubes must flow through this power supply. Therefore, the internal resistance of the power supply, produced by the choke wire, internal tube resistance and so on, will act as a common impedance for all the amplifier circuits. When a signal is applied to the amplifier, the plate currents of all the tubes will vary in accordance with the signal. In addition to the DC flowing through the common power supply, we now have the AC components 
of all the plate currents flowing through the common impedance. Some of these currents will be in phase with each other and some will be 180 degrees out of phase. It is the currents which are in phase that cause the most trouble. The in phase currents add to one another and produce voltage variations across the common impedance which feeds back the variations from one stage to another. The overall effect of this is a sound in the loudspeaker which resembles the purring of an outboard motor. That is why this trouble in an amplifier is called motorboating. On the next sheet you will see how the decoupling filter eliminates feedback and motorboating. Feedback in a three stage amplifier. The decoupling filter continued. If the AC components of plate current could be kept from flowing through the common impedance of the power supply, then the feedback that originates there would be eliminated. The decoupling filter's job is to provide a path of low reactance around the power supply and a path of high resistance to AC current flow through the power supply. Because of this very little AC current will flow through the power supply and its common impedance thereby eliminating feedback. The value of the decoupling capacitor must be high enough so that its so that its resistance or no, so that its reactance is much less than the total resistance of the decoupling resistor and the common impedance of the power supply. In an amplifier of the type shown, the value of the decoupling resistor is generally about one-fifth the value of the plate load resistance RL. The value of the decoupling capacitor varies from about 0.25 to 8 MFD. The action of the decoupling filter is to isolate each stage from the power supply common impedance. The way the filter does this is shown below. If you need a voltage gain of 200 or less in an amplifier, one tube would be enough. However, very often a gain of 10,000 or 100,000 or even higher is required. And there is no way to make a single vacuum tube give you that much amplification. In order to increase the amplification, several tubes are needed. These tubes are connected so that the voltage change from, one, from the plate of one amplifier tube is fed into the grid of the second tube. The voltage change from the plate of the second tube is fed into the grid of the third tube and so forth. If the amplification of each tube is 50, the signal input to <coughs> the signal input to the second tube will be 50 times greater than the single fed into, so signal fed into the first. There you go. So Okay, using a transistor a transformer coupling. Okay. I'm going to read all of this, why not? <clears throat> if the voltage change applied to the input of this amplifier is one ten thousandth of a volt, the voltage change in the plate of the third tube will be 12 and a half volts. Since nearly all amplifiers require more amplification than can be achieved with only one tube, multi-stage amplifiers of this type are very common in all types of electronic equipment. Coupling of amplifier stages. When several tubes are used at, in an amplifier, each tube together with its circuit is called a stage of amplification. There are several methods of connecting the output of one stage to the input of the next stage. You remember that the output of an amplifier tube is taken from the plate and the input is placed on the grid. Since the DC operating voltage of a plate and of a grid are so very different. A simple wire leading from one plate to <coughs> the next grid cannot be used. The connection, or coupling as it's more commonly called, between two stages must, in some way, prevent the DC plate <coughs> voltage from getting to the next grid. At the same time, the coupling must permit the plate voltage variations AC to become the input of the next stage. There are two very common and very simple ways of doing this. One way is by using a transformer 
the other by using a capacitor and a resistor. Transformer coupling is accomplished by connecting the primary winding between the plate and the first tube and B plus and the secondary winding between the, the grid of the second tube and ground. By so doing, the B plus voltage is isolated in the plate circuit while only the AC is transferred to the grid. The use of the capacitor in controlling circuits is very widespread. The most common circuit being the RC or resistance capacitor circuit. In your study of vacuum tubes, you learn that current variations in the load resistor cause the voltage at the plate to vary above and below a steady value. The coupling capacitor will charge <coughs> to that steady voltage and as the plate voltage rises above and falls below that value, the capacitor will charge and discharge slightly, causing an AC current to flow in the grid resistor. The voltage across the grid resistor, therefore, is AC and is the input to the next stage. So this is an RC coupling. <coughs> Plate load resistor, grid resistor. Cool. The two-stage amplifier can be compared to two step-up transformers with the secondary of one connected to the primary of the other. For example, if two transformers were, which have a step-up ratio of 1 to 3 are connected in this manner, an AC voltage applied to the primary of the first transformer will be amplified nine times by the combination. This example is illustrated below. Okay. You may conclude from this that it would be a good idea to forget all about using vacuum tubes as amplifiers and use transformers instead. This is not possible because transformers with very high step-up ratios would have to be used if they were to deliver a high amplification. Transformers of this type are impractical and even if they were used would not amplify all the audio frequencies the same amount. The higher audio frequencies, around 10 kHz, and the lower audio frequencies, around 100 Hz, would not be amplified as much as the middle frequencies. This would result in a signal, signal output that is not a true representation of the original signal applied to the transformers. Amplifiers using vacuum tubes can deliver much higher amounts of amplification, are lighter in weight, less costly, and take up less space. On the sheet, next sheet, you will see how a multi-stage vacuum tube amplifier compares to the transformer combination explained here. Characteristics of the two-stage amplifier. Okay, so we're going to talk about the two-stage amplifier. There's a volume control with a potentiometer in between the first and second stage. Frequency response, talking about <sighs> frequency response is a term applied to describe the effect in which some frequencies are amplified more than others. In actual practice, all amplifiers have a range over which they are designed to operate. Above and below this range, the signal output drops off rapidly. If an audio amplifier cannot amplify all the frequencies of the human voice by an equal amount, there is a loss of voice quality. It is possible for this frequency distortion to be so great that the voice message cannot be understood. For this reason, you should learn to measure the frequency response of your amplifier and see how good it actually is. A modern com commercial amplifier designed for music amplification will have an ideal gain from 30 to 15,000 cycles. A range as wide as this is hardly necessary for good amplification of voice signals. Even, <coughs> even though the RC coupled amplifier is well suited for the job of amplifying a wide range of frequencies, there are still causes for a dropping gain at high and low frequencies. Let's take a quick look at these causes. At low frequency, the coupling capacitor and the grid resistor make up a voltage divider across the signal 
voltage input. As a result, only part of the signal gets to the grid of the amplifier tube. Just how much of the signal gets to the grid depends upon the reactance of the coupling capacitor as compared to the resistance of the grid resistor. Due to the fact that capacitive reactance grows larger as frequency decreases, the amount of signal voltage lost across the capacitor increases at low frequencies. You can see <coughs> Um, that by the way we've got XC which is the reactance of the capacitor is 1 over 2 pi FC where I, I guess F is the frequency and C is the capacitance okay so if the frequency goes high <coughs> then the uh, then the reactance goes lower the amount of signal voltage lost across the capacitor increases at low frequency. You can see that the signal voltage across the grid resistor becomes less and less as the frequency decreases. To reduce this loss of signal, the reactance of the coupling capacitor should be small with respect to the grid resistor at the lowest frequency to be amplified. This means that either the grid resistor or the coupling capacitor should be as large as possible. If C increases, XC decreases. However, if the coupling capacitor is made too large, there will be increased leakage through it from B+. This leakage will place a positive voltage on the grid and thereby disturb the amplifier operation. Luckily, we never need coupling capacitors that are so large that leakage becomes a problem. In fact, because of the size and weight considerations, it is common to use a smaller coupling capacitor than is needed. Thus, low frequency response is sacrificed slightly so as not to bring about more serious problems. At high frequencies, the coupling capacitor is no longer a cause of trouble since its reactance is low compared to the grid leak resistor. Low frequency, medium frequency. At high frequencies too, there is an effect that causes a loss of amplification. This loss is due to total stray capacitance that exists between the grid and ground. This total capacitance consists of the plate to cathode interelectrode capacitance of the tube from which the signal is taken, the grid to cathode capacitance of the tube to which the signal is brought, and the stray capacitances between the signal carrying wires and the chassis. Total stray wire capacitance, grid to plate capacitance, grid to cathode capacitance, plate to cathode capacitance, Gee, it gets messy, doesn't it? The effect of this total capacitance is to shunt the grid leak resistor. At low and medium frequencies, the reactance of this small capacitance is high and <coughs> therefore it does not disturb the operation of the circuit. At high frequencies, the reactance drops and effectively decreases the impedance between grid and ground. The signal appearing between grid and ground decreases as the impedance between the grid and ground decreases. Thus, the gain at high frequencies is less than at medium frequencies because of the shunting effects and of the total stray and interconnected capacitances. It is important to note that at low gain, that a low gain in itself is not bad. If the same gain existed for all frequencies, there would be no problem. Difficulties with frequency response are encountered only when there are unequal gains at different frequencies. The solution to the problem of loss of gain at high frequencies is to use special, fire amplifi special amplifier tubes with very low values of input and output capacitances to use special wiring techniques to reduce the stray capacitance between the wire and ground and to use lower values of resistors in the RC coupling. These methods increase the frequency at which the shunting effect becomes noticeable. Frequency response curve. The usual way that the frequency response of an amplifier is shown is with the frequency response curve. In this curve, a plot is made of the gain at each frequency. The highest gain is 100% or sometimes 1 and any gain below that is figured as a certain percent of maximum such as 75%, 25% and so on. 
So we've got uh, relative gain and frequency from uh, 100 hertz to 15 kilohertz. The general shape of the curve shows a flat region, plateau, between the ends of the curve. This means that the gain does not vary <coughs> by very much as the frequency changes from, low, from the low end to the high end of this portion. This represents the usable frequency range of the amplifier. On either side of this flat portion, there is rapid falling off of the curve. This means that the gains at these frequencies, both low and high, are not as high as the gain at the middle frequencies. In a speaker, the ear can detect these lowered gains if they are about 70% of maximum or below. Therefore, it is the 70% points on each end of the curve that determine the usable range. As you remember from the previous discussion on frequency response, the reason for the decreased gain at the low end of the band was the fact that the coupling capacitor and the grid leak resistor form a voltage divider. The reactance of the coupling capacitor increases at the low frequencies and the voltage across the resistor decreases. At the high end, the loss of gain is due to the shunting effect of the stray capacitances between grid and ground. At the middle frequencies, ne neither effect is noticeable and the gain does not vary by any appreciable amount. And we're up to the review of the two-stage amplifier. So we learn about RC coupling. When two or more stages are used in an amplifier, the AC plate voltage of each stage is fed through to the grid of the next stage through the coupling capacitor and resistor. Voltage gain. The total amplification of a two-stage or multi-stage amplifier is the product of the amplifications of each stage. The ratio of the output voltage of final stage to input voltage of first stage is called the gain of the amplifier. Amplification losses. At low frequencies, the high reactance of the coupling capacitor reduces voltage gain. At high frequencies, stray capacitance cause loss of voltage gain. Frequency response. A measure of the ability of an amplifier to amplify AC signals of various frequencies by the same amount. Transformer coupling. A transformer coupled amplifier is an amplifier that makes use of transformer coupling instead of RC coupling between the stages. This method is most often used to couple an amplifier to its load, but it may also be used for interstage coupling. One advantage of using a transformer is that the secondary winding may have more turns than the primary winding, resulting in a voltage step up. In addition, there is no sizable drop in voltage at the plate of the amplifier tube as in the case of using a plate load resistor and no coupling condenser is required. The transformer coupling, in transformer coupling, the maximum gain is mu times n where n is the ratio between the number of turns in the primary and secondary, secondary windings and mu is the amplification factor of the tube. In resistance coupling, the maximum possible gain is only the mu of the tube into stage transformer. The reasons why transformer coupling is not widely used are first, that a transformer usually has a poorer frequency response than an RC network. Modern high gain tubes cancel any advantages that the transformer has in voltage amplification. In spite of improvements in the design of interstage transformers, the trend is towards using high gain vacuum tubes with RC rather than transformer coupling between the stages of the amplifier. There are many applications in which transformer stages have a particular advantage. Some of these applications include high output for limited power supply voltage, impedance matching between low and high impedance lines and push-pull applications. In push-pull amplifiers, a transformer is more readily adaptable than resistance coupling and unlike an RC coupling, it places a low DC resistance in the grid circuit of the following amplifier under conditions where a low DC resistance is essential. 
the main disadvantage of transformer coupling is that the impedance of the primary and secondary windings is not constant but changes if the frequency of the signal is changed. If the frequency increases the impedance increases and when the frequency decreases the impedance decreases. Look at the transformer in the schematic on the previous sheet. Here, the interstage transformer. Suppose the primary winding has an inductance of 10 henrys. At the low frequency of 100 cycles, it will have an inductive reactance of XL equals 2 pi FL equals 6.28 times 100 times 10 equals 6.2 kilo ohms. At the mid frequency of 1 kilohertz, the inductive reactance will be XL equals 2 pi FL equals 6.28 times 1000 times 10. Ah, so the uh, the reactance is changing as a function of frequency um, in uh, in the interstage transformer because of the inductance on the coil. Ah, since the inductive reactance of the primary is used as the plate load impedance of the triode amplifier, the inequality of reactance to AC signals of different frequencies will produce non-uniform amplification over the audio frequency range. A graph of the amplification of a transformer coupled amplifier is shown below. Compare the graph of the transformer coupled amplifier with that of the RC coupled amplifier. Notice how much more uniform the amplification is of RC coupled amplifier. Okay. Wow. The amplification of an RC coupled amplifier and the transformer coupled amplifier at audio frequencies. Alright, so this is between say 10 and 10 kil 10 hertz and 10 kilohertz and uh, the transformer couplings all over the place and the RC couplings not so bad <laughs> characteristics characteristics of the transformer coupled amplifier the transformer coupled amplifier shown below is typical of most amplifiers of this type. The amplifier has two stages, stages coupled by an interstage audio transformer that has a 1 to 3 step up ratio. The input stage uses a 6C5 triode V1. The amplified output voltage of this tube is stepped up three times by the transformer and then fed to the grid of another 6C5 triode V2. The second triode amplifies the signal still further and its amplified output appears across the 100k plate load resistor. The 0.01 MFD coupling capacitor blocks the DC but presents a low reactance to the AC component at the plate of V2. Therefore, only the AC component of the plate voltage at V2 appears across the 470k resistor. Normally, the 470k resistor would be the grid resistor of the next stage so that the signal across the resistor could be amplified further. Transformer coupled amplifier. Fascinating. On the next sheet, a signal will be traced through the transformer coupled amplifier and you will see how amplification occurs in this circuit. Okay. Characteristics of the transformer coupled amplifier. Continued. The amplification that can be expected from a transformer coupled amplifier stage is approximately equal to the amplification factor. Is that m mu? mu? Of the tube times the turns ratio of the transformer N. Amplification equals mu n. In this case, a 6C5 tube is used which has mu of 20. The transformer has a, a step up. Just give me a second, I'm just going to pause for a minute. I'm back. Let's continue. So we're talking about the amplification. Mu is 20. The transformer has a step up turns ratio of 1 to 3 therefore we can expect an amplification or gain of mu times n which is 20 times 3 equals 60 
So the amplifier amplifies and the, uh, the transformer amplifies as well. Suppose a 0 .1, 0 0.01 volt AC signal is applied to the grid V1. From the illustration, you can see that the output voltage of uh, 6C5, 6C5, they're not labeled here. One of these tubes is 6C5. Oh, they're both C65s. So there's just V1 and V2. Valve 1 and Valve 2. So, so uh, there's a 0 0.01 volt AC signal applied to the grid of V1. From the illustration, you can see that the output voltage of the uh, valve appears across the primary winding of the transformer, which is here, and is amplified mu times the transformer steps up the primary voltage three more times, so the secondary voltage is 3 times 0 0.2 is 0 0.6. So we've got 0 0.1 volts in and 0 0.6 volts out. It was stated that the gain of this stage is equal to mu n or 60. Let us see if this checks. Well, yeah, it does. The grid signal is 0, 0.0 volts. If we multiply this grid voltage by the gain, we should get the voltage at the secondary of the transformer or 0 0.06 volts. 60 times 0 0.01 is 0 0.6 volts, and you can see that this relationship holds. Voltage amplification in a transformer coupled amplifier. The voltage across the secondary of the transformer is now applied to the grid of V2. If we assume that the gain of V2 is equal to mu, then V2 will amplify this signal 20 times. Therefore, the output voltage at the plate of V2 will be 20 times 0 0.6 is 12 volts. The total gain is determined by multiplying the individual stage gains together. The, the gain of V1 and the transformer is 60, and the gain of V2 is 20. The overall gain is 1200. Checking this result, the input to V1 times the overall gain should give us the output voltage of V2, which is 1200 times 0 0.01 equals 12 volts, which is correct. Characteristics of audio amplifiers. Up to this time, you have been learning about audio amplifiers that are primarily designed to amplify the signal voltage up to many times the original input voltage. Now you will learn about power amplifiers. In a voltage amplifier, the varying signal current and the plate circuit is used only in the production of a voltage to be applied to the grid of a following stage. The plate current is usually relatively small. On the other hand, a power amplifier must supply a heavy signal current into the load impedance, which usually lies in the range of 2,000 to 20,000 ohms. Power amplifiers are used to drive power consuming circuits or devices such as loudspeakers, certain portions of transmitters and large amplifier stages whose grids require power from the preceding stage. One use of audio power amplifiers is, of course, to produce a powerful audio signal. The radio man will find it used as the output stage of his receivers and also in equipment which injects voice signals into transmitters. The sound man will find this circuit in almost every piece of sound equipment. The sonar man will find audio power amplifiers used to produce the signal to drive not only a loudspeaker but also the underwater sound equipment called a transducer. Audio power amplifiers are also used in equipments which rotate radar antennas, sonar transducers, transducers and ship's guns. Power amplifiers are used in many types of equipment. You have learned in the preceding topics that the main purpose of voltage amplifier circuits is to produce a large increase in signal voltage. The amplified output of the voltage amplifier will now be applied to the grid of a power amplifier stage. 
in the voltage amplifier circuits the output of one voltage amplifier is connected to the grid of the next stage no current flows in this grid circuit therefore no power will be consumed if current did flow in the grid circuit the power loss in this circuit would have to be supplied by the preceding stage in the case of an amplifier that feeds a loudspeaker the speaker requires large amounts of AC signal current for proper operation when current flows in a circuit power is always consumed the power amplifier stage must supply the power that is consumed in the loudspeaker circuit the tubes used in voltage amplifier circuits are generally operated as class A while the tubes used in power amplifier circuits may be operated either as class A, class B or class AB. Triodes, pentodes and beam power tubes can be used as power amplifiers. These tubes may be operated slightly in parallel or in push-pull. The type of operation depends upon the amount of power required of the amplifier. Voltage amplifiers are usually operated with a high value of plate and load resistance or impedance to obtain the maximum voltage output. Power amplifier tubes are operated with lower values of load impedance to obtain a large current variation and a large power output. In a power amplifier, the amount of voltage output is not important for it is the power output which is the main factor. If large amounts of power are to be supplied by the power amplifier, it must be capable of carrying high current, much more current than a voltage amplifier. Yeah, right. <clears throat> the current that flows through the plate circuit of the power amplifier tube is made up of two parts a steady or DC component and a varying AC component. The useful part of the plate current is the varying component as only variations in plate current produce sounds in a loudspeaker. The AC component of plate current flows through the primary of the output transformer along with the DC component. The DC component just produces a steady magnetic field about the primary winding and does not induce any voltage into the secondary. The AC component makes use of transformer action and induces a voltage into the secondary which is applied to the voice coil in the loudspeaker. This voltage is converted into sound by the loudspeaker. You can see that the steady plate current does not contribute directly towards the sound output of the power amplifier circuit. This portion of the plate current does produce a power loss in the plate circuit which produces heating of the power amplifier tube and the output transformer. The output transformer's job is to couple the amplified audio power from the plate of the power amplifier tube to the voice coil of the loudspeaker. In these next few sheets you will learn about the characteristics of output transformers so that you will be able to understand the importance of impedance matching. Impedance matching is necessary because the power amplifier must have a relatively high impedance plate load while the voice coil impedance is low. The output transformer matches the low impedance voice coil to the high impedance plate circuit. Power amplifier tubes must operate into a specified value of plate load impedance for maximum power output and minimum distortion. The correct value of load impedance for a particular tube can be obtained from the tube manufacturer's references. In a power amplifier circuit, the primary winding of the output transformer is used as the plate load impedance and it is this impedance which with which we are concerned. The primary impedance is determined by the size of the load on the secondary and the turns ratio between primary and secondary. The turns ratio and the size of the secondary load impedance must be so chosen that the resultant primary impedance is the correct value for the required load impedance, impedance of the power amplifier tube. The output transformer in the amplifier circuit the output transformer couples the voice coil to the plate circuit. Primary load impedance. Voice coil is the secondary load impedance. In a transformer there are two currents. The primary and secondary currents. The current flow in the primary depends on the amount of current flow in the secondary. If the secondary current increases 
then the primary current will also increase. This can be explained by referring to Lenz's law, which states that the magnetic field produced by an induced current is always in opposition to the magnetic field that produced the induced current. In other words, the magnetic field produced by current flow in the secondary of the transformer is in opposition to and cancels some of the magnetic field produced by the primary winding. You now can see that if the secondary load imp impedance is decreased, the secondary current and magnetic field will increase and cancel a greater portion of the primary field. If some of the primary field is cancelled, then the inductive reactance and therefore the impedance of the primary will decrease. By choosing the proper value of secondary impedance, we can obtain the desired primary load impedance for the power amplifier tube. If the secondary load impedance cannot be changed, for example the voice coil in a loudspeaker, the turns ratio of primary turns over secondary turns can be varied to obtain the proper primary impedance. This is done by using an output transformer with a tapped secondary. Cancellation of primary field by secondary field. Impedance matching. Let us look back at some of the things you have learned up to this point. You know that a power amplifier tube must operate into a specified value of load impedance to obtain maximum power output and minimum distortion. You also know that this load impedance is actually the output transformer primary impedance which is determined by the load on the secondary. The secondary load is usually a loudspeaker and it is to the speaker that we wish to supply the amplified audio power. You may be thinking that it would be simpler to connect the speaker directly to the plate of the power amplifier tube, but this is not possible. You recall that the plate load for the power amplifier cannot be anything but the specified value. This load is usually in the order of several thousand ohms, while loudspeaker voice coil impedances are in the order of 1 to 15 ohms. If the voice coil impedance was used as the plate load, the amount of power obtainable from the amplifier would be very small to say nothing of the distortion that would result. Therefore, we must use an impedance matching device. The output transformer, which will allow us to operate the tube into the high impedance primary and still supply audio power to the low impedance loudspeaker voice coil. <sighs> All right. Uh, voice coil. Low power output, high distortion. Uh, output transformer. Oh, look at that. So that's how you do impedance matching with an output transformer. Loudspeaker impedances and plate load impedances. For different tubes vary widely. Since the primary impedance is set by the type of tube being used, and the secondary load is set by the voice coil impedance, there must be some means of adjusting the relationship between primary and secondary impedance to obtain proper matching. The means of matching the two impedances by varying the turns ratio of the transformer. The output transformer that is shown below has a multi-tapped secondary so that you can select different numbers of secondary turns. Since the primary turns are fixed, 
if the secondary turns are varied then the turns ratio of the transformer is also varied the primary impedance ZP is related to the secondary load impedance ZS by the following formula the primary impedance equals N squared times the secondary impedance where N is the turns ratio of the transformer N1 on N2 N1 is the primary turns and N2 is the number of secondary turns you can see that if the value of uh, the impedance of the secondary is fixed by the voice coil impedance any value of ZP can be obtained by varying the turns ratio the output transformer in this topic you will see <coughs> Oh, this is a new topic. This is how the push-pull amplifier works. In this topic, you will see that a very good type of power amplifier can be made by using a push-pull system. A power amplifier can be made using only one tube, but when you want to double the power, it is often more convenient to use two power tubes rather than use one very large power tube. The obvious way to use two tubes would be to connect the two grids together and the two plates together, parallel connection, and thereby double the power output. However, there is a way that is better. That is, is to connect the tubes in push-pull. In a push-pull amplifier, the input voltages connect the tubes in push-pull. In a push-pull amplifier, the input voltages to the grids of the two tubes are 180 degrees out of phase. This, this phase to the grids of the two tubes, sorry, this phase difference is often achieved by putting the signal into the primary of a transformer with a center tap secondary. The two grids are connected to the opposite ends of the secondary and the center tap is grounded or connected to a source of grid bias voltage. These grid voltages are 180 degrees out of phase. A typical push-pull circuit. <clears throat> the plates are connected to opposite ends of the primary winding of an output transformer and the center tap is connected to B+. The final output voltage appears across the output transformer secondary which is connected to the load. How the push-pull amplifier works continued. In a typical push-pull amplifier the grids receive AC voltages from opposite terminals of a transformer secondary winding. The transformer secondary is center tap and the center tap is connected to ground. The AC grid voltages are 180 degrees out of phase. When one gr grid becomes less negative the other grid becomes more negative by the same amount. The sum of the tube currents does not vary but remains pure DC since when the and when one current is increasing the other is decreasing by the same amount because the sum of the two currents is pure DC in many cases no bypass capacity is needed across the cathode bias resistor in the output transformer it is the difference between the two currents that is the output signal the greater the signal input the greater this difference and the greater the output below you see a set of typical waveforms taken from a push-pull amplifier which is working normally normal waveforms using a from a push-pull amplifier grid to cathode voltage grid to cathode voltage plate current plate current effective current input yeah there you go Up to now, the only advantage of the push-pull circuit that has been mentioned has been the fact that no bypass capacitor is needed since the voltage variations produced across the cathode resistor by the out-of-phase plate current will cancel each other. If this were the only advantage of the push-pull circuit over the use of two tubes connected in parallel, the parallel combination would be more common than it is. Actually, there are some very important advantages which make the use of the push-pull circuit preferable. Consider what happens if the two tubes in parallel are driven into cut-off by a large signal input. Both tubes go into cut-off together and distortion appears in the output. If the tubes are connected in a push-pull arrangement, one tube will be driven into cutoff 
<coughs> on one half cycle and the other tube on the next half cycle in the output the distortion is minimized as you can see from the, the waveforms below distorted waveforms due to cutoff ah. the reason that it is such a big advantage that the push-pull circuit reduces distortion is this the tubes can be intentionally overdriven to produce a larger output and the output still will be practically undistorted phase inverters the transformer transformers are objectionable in some push-pull circuits because of their size weight and cost it is sometimes desirable to obtain two signal signal voltages 180 degrees out of phase with each other without the use of a transformer a circuit that accomplishes this is a phase inverter you will recall that the two tubes of a push-pull system should be supplied with two signal voltages of equal amplitude but 180 degrees out of phase in the circuit diagram below the signal for the grid of the upper tube v2 of the push-pull system comes from the triode v1 while the other triode v3 is the phase inverter which drives the other push-pull tube v4 the incoming signal is impressed on the control grid of v1 through capacitor c1 the output voltage from v1 appears across the plate load resistor r3 and is coupled through capacitor c2 to the grid of the up, upper push-pull power amplifier v2 across r4 and r5 in series Resistors R4 and R5 form a voltage divider that supplies the signal to the grid of the phase inverter tube V3. The values of R4 and R5 are so chosen that the amount of signal fed into V3 is exactly the same as the input signal to V1. The important thing to remember at this time is that there is always a 180 degree phase shift between the signal at the plate of an amplifier tube and the signal at the grid. Therefore, the signal taken from the grid of V2 at the junction of R4 and R5 will be shifted 180 degrees when it is amplified by V3. The output of V3 is fed through capacitor C3 to the grid of the lower push-pull amplifier V tube V4. Since the signals on the grids of the triodes of V1 and V3 are equal in amplitude and 180 degrees out of phase, their outputs will be equal in amplitude and 180 degrees out of phase you should see that these output signals are fed to the grids of the push-pull amplifier so that the requirements for push-pull operation have been met okay suppose we apply a signal to the phase inverter and trace it through the complete push-pull amplifier. If a 1 volt signal is applied to the grid of V1, that's here, we assume the gain of V1 to be 20, so it's 20 volts out up here. There'll be 20 volt signal at the plate. This signal will appear between the grid and ground of V2. This is the grid and ground of v V2. Where's the ground of V2? I guess that's the grid of V2 and that's the ground of V2. <sighs> Across R4 and R5, R4 and R5 in series. Since R4 is 19 times as large as R5, 19 volts will appear across R4. And there will be 1 volt across R5. The 1 volt signal across R5 is applied to the grid of V3.
at the junction of R4 and R5. Since the gain of V3 is the same as that of V1, 20, the output voltage of V3 will be 20 volts in amplitude and shifted in phase 180 degrees. This output voltage is applied between grid and ground of V4. You can see that we have provided a push-pull amplifier we have provided the push-pull amplifier tubes with two signals equal in amplitude and 180 degrees out of phase so that proper push-pull operation will take place. Another type of phase inverter. The phase inverter you will use The phase inverter you will use has half of the load resistance in the cathode circuit, R1, and half the in the plate circuit, R2. The same current flows in each of these resistors, and since they have the same value, the same voltage appears across each of them. These voltages are 180 degrees out of phase. No signal appears across R3, since it is bypassed with a large condenser. The input voltage is applied between grid and ground and only part of this signal appears between grid and cathode. The tube current responds to the grid to cathode voltage and this current flows through R1 and R2 causing signal voltages to appear across the resistors. The voltage across R1 and also across R2 is always less than the input voltage. This is so since the grid to cathode voltage is equal to the difference between the input voltage and the voltage across R1. Therefore, the gain of this type of phase inverter or phase splitter is less than 1. The two outputs are connected to the control grids of the following push-pull stage. These outputs are 180 degrees out of phase with each other since one is taken from the plate and the other is from the cathode. Thus, when the plate current is increasing, the top of R2 is becoming less positive and the top of R1 is becoming more positive. The phase inverter is taken, has taken an AC signal input and produced two output signals of equal magnitude and of opposite phase. Compare this circuit to the transformer circuit shown below. This is a single tube phase inverter. Wow. That's cool. Complete diagram of a push-pull power amplifier. All right, let's have a look at this puppy. All right, so we've got our input. Uh, how, how does this all... Oh, that's our output, that's our input. That's power, I think. Okay, so this is uh, this is the uh, the wall power. This is B plus. Goes in here and here. So this is the power. It's a voltage regulator. And this is our audio input, our signal input. Now, if this is push-pull, then this must be the bit that's doing the uh, the phase inversion. 
and this is probably just a, 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 a like a preamp I guess yeah that's my guess I'm not an expert but I think this is preamplification this is the part that uh, inverts does the phase inversion and then half of the signal goes here for push and half of it goes here for pull or vice versa and this is basically just uh, taking the AC in uh, voltage regulating it and converting it to uh, this is converting it to DC and here's uh, here's a little bit of a, of a winding descent 6.3 volts to pins 2 and 7 the various eight, uh, heaters for the vacuum tubes cool the advantages of a push-pull amplifier one uh, the core of the output transformer is not saturated by DC current flow in the transformer primary winding since the two halves of the primary winding are magnetized in opposite directions. This causes a cancellation of the magnetic lines of flux. 2. More than twice the amount of undistorted power output is produced by using a push-pull system than could be furnished by one tube. 3. Any hum voltages from the power plate supply will be cancelled out. For no signal is fed from the plates of the power tube to the rest of the amplifier through the B plus lead because the plate signals cancel out at B plus. This also means that no bypass condenser is required across the common cathode resistor since the two signal voltages develop cancel each other out. The output of a push-pull amplifier must be matched to the load with which it is going to be used so that there will be a maximum power transfer. Output transformers are rated for both the primary and secondary impedances and the impedance of the primary will be its rated value only when the secondary is terminated with its own rated impedance. Only under a much condition is their maximum power, trans power output. Some output transformers have specific impedances to which both the primary and secondary must be matched. If the secondary has a load connected to it which is lower in impedance than the rated value, the reflected impedance on the primary would be lower than its rated value, resulting in loss of power output. If the secondary has a load connected to it which is higher in impedance than the rated value, the reflected impedance on the primary would be higher than its rated value, also resulting in loss of power output. Other output transformers are of the universal type. This type has a secondary winding with a number of taps. By selecting the proper taps on the secondary, you may properly match a variety of load impedances to the transformer. <coughs> Pardon me. And consequently get a maximum transfer of power from the amplifier to the load. Review of the push-pull amplifier. Push-pull circuit uses two vacuum tubes and a transformer to double the power output of the circuit. The tube grid voltages are 180 degrees out of phase. Distorted waveforms due to the overdriving the tubes do not noticeably affect the current waveform in the output transformer of a push-pull amplifier. Uh, phase inverter produces two signal voltages 180 degrees out of phase without using a transformer. A phase inverter may use one or two vacuum tubes. Push-pull power amplifier consists of a voltage amplifier, a phase splitter, inverter, two power amplifier tubes and an output transformer. Principles of sound. When it is desired to send an electric current from one point to another, wires are used to carry this circuit. When sound is set directly from one point to another, it is the particles of air that carry the sound. In other words, in the transmission of electricity or sound, a medium must exist between the points of transmission. With electricity, wires are used. With sound, air is used. Sound is actually the motion of pressure waves of air. Therefore, any device that produces sound, such as the human vocal cords, is a device for varying the pressure of the surrounding air. All musical instruments make use of this principle by having some part, such as a taut string, a reed or stretch membrane, which when set into vibration produces varying pressures, pressure waves of air. In the piano, when a key is struck, a taut string is set into vibration. The string vibrates on both sides of its resting point and compresses and expands the surrounding air. When the string 
see figure below, moves from its resting point to the right. The air to the right of the string is compressed. When the string moves to the left, the resting point, blah, blah, blah. If, the sound, <coughs> if a sound detecting device such as the human ear is located in the vicinity of the vibrating string, the varying pressure waves will strike the eardrum and produce the sensation of sound. The number of complete vibrations of the string occurring per second determines the frequency or pitch of the resulting sound wave. The intensity or amplitude of the sound wave is determined by the amount of displacement of the string from its resting point. The sound produced by the human voice may vary in intensity in the ratio of 10,000 to 1 and cover a range of about 60 to 10,000 cycles. In music, the intensity varies may be as great as 100,000 to 1 and the frequency range from 40 to 15,000 cycles. <clears throat> Sound waves produced by a vibrating string create uh, pressure and diagram of variation of pressure of, of pressure to right of string. Yeah characteristics of microphones. The sound waves that you produce when you talk or sing can be converted into corresponding electrical impulses by the mechanism of a microphone. A diaphragm inside the microphone is actually is actuated by the air pressure variations of the sound waves and in turn causes the microphone to produce an AC voltage of the same frequency as the original sound. The amplitude of this AC voltage will be proportional to the intensity of the sound. The ratio of electrical output voltage to, this, to the intensity of sound input is the sensitivity of a microphone. Sensitivity varies widely among different types of microphones. The electrical output of a microphone depends on the, types of, the type of microphone and the distance between the microphone and the sound source. The output decreases as the, instance, as the distance is increased. The frequency response of a microphone is a measure of its ability to convert different sound frequencies to alternating current. With a fixed sound intensity at the microphone, the electrical output may vary widely as the frequency of sound sources vary. For clear understanding of speech, however, only a limited frequency range is necessary from 200 to 4000 cycles. If the output of a microphone shows only small variations, in amplitude between its upper and lower frequency limits, it is said to have a flat frequency response. Changing sound waves into electrical impulses. You will study various types of microphone on the next few sheets. The carbon microphone. The most common type of microphone, the carbon microphone, is restricted to a large extent to communication systems for the transmission of speech. This microphone is the most rugged of all the different types and supplies the largest output from a given sound input. The figure below shows the principal parts of a single button carbon microphone. This microphone operates by using the varying pressure waves of sound to vary the resistance between carbon granules. These carbon granules are sealed in a brass or carbon cup with an electrode that is mechanically connected to a thin diaphragm. The electrode acts as a plunger in compressing the carbon granules in, in the cup, which is often called a carbon button. The carbon button is connected in series with the source of DC voltage and the primary of a microphone transformer. When no sound waves strike the diaphragm, the carbon granules are at rest. In this condition, the resistance of the carbon button between the cup and the electrode is constant, and so is the circuit current. This is illustrated in the region from 1 to 2 in the illustration. Oh, I see 1 to 2. That's there. Uh, when the pressure waves of sound strike the diaphragm, the diaphragm and the attached electrode move in and out, varying the pressure on the carbon granules, an increase in air pressure moves the diaphragm in, compressing the carbon granules and lowering their resistance. This causes the current to increase, which is shown in the region from 2 to 3 on the graph. So over here, a decrease 
in air pressure causes the diaphragm to move out, with, which reduces the pressure on the granules, re raising their resistance and increasing the circuit current. This is shown in the region three to four on the graph in this manner, sound waves, blah, blah, blah. So then we've got a uh, crystal microphone. Uh, one of the uh, disadvantages of carbon microphone is that it requires an external source of DC voltage for operation. In certain applications, a DC source for the microphone is not easy to obtain. In addition, the carbon granules may pack together due to DC current arcing between them. This will eventually reduce the sensitivity of the microphone. Because the granules move around and cause tiny arcs when the microphone is handled, objectionable noise may appear in the output. The crystal microphone eliminates all the difficulties encountered with the carbon microphone because it operates on a different principle and requires no external source of voltage. Okay, and then the dynamic microphone, also known as a condenser microphone, isn't it? The dynamic microphone. In the dynamic or moving coil type of microphone, a coil of wire which is rigidly attached to a diaphragm is suspended. Oh, okay. The ribbon microphone. Okay. Looks like maybe the condenser microphone wasn't invented yet. I don't know. Anyway, we don't need to know about old microphone technology, do we? The earphone. Okay, dynamic loudspeaker. Review of microphone, earphone, and loudspeaker. Sound waves are variations in air pressure produced by a vibrating solid body. The speed of vibration determines the pitch of the sound. The amplitude of vibration determines the loudness of the sound. Microphones change sound waves into electrical impulses. Mics may be carbon, crystal, dynamic, or ribbon type. The electrical impulses are fed into the grid of an amplifier, either directly or through a step-up transformer. I'm just going to go and do some quick research about uh, condenser microphones, just see what those are about. I'll be back. Yes, so I just uh, went to find out about condenser microphones, and it seems to me that they weren't invented yet. <laughs> so uh, that's why they're not mentioned here. And of course, condenser microphone is in fact in reference to a capacitor. Uh, so the condenser is a capacitor. It's just the old word for capacitor. So uh, there you go. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, mics may be carbon, crystal, dynamic, or ribbon, or condenser. Uh, the electrical impulses are fed into the grid of an amplifier, either directly or through a step-up transformer. And then earphones operate like microphones in reverse and produce sound waves in response to electrical impulses. Both the crystal and magnetic earphones are widely used, the magnetic type being most common. Loudspeakers are used where high quality sound reproduction is required. The dynamic loudspeaker operates like a dynamic microphone in reverse and may be of the permanent or electromagnet type. Review of audio amplifiers. Amplification, the process of changing a low AC input into a high AC output. A device which performs amplification is called an amplifier. The triode, a vacuum tube similar to a diode but containing a grid which controls plate current between cathode and plate. Triode characteristics, a plot of the variations in plate current as grid voltage changes a measure of a triode's ability to amplify. Grid bias, the amount of grid bias voltage determines the class of amplifier operation. In class A, the bias is less than cutoff. In class B, the bias is at or near cutoff. In class C, bias is much more than cutoff. Triode amplifier, a simple circuit using a single triode with biasing components. This circuit is not used alone in actual equipment. The pentode, a tube which uses a suppressor grid and a screen grid between control grid and plate. It has greater amplification than the triode. Uh, single stage amplifier, a circuit consisting of a vacuum tube, amplifier, biasing component, a load resistor, a cup decoupling network and a resistor and capacitor to provide coupling to another stage. Two stage RC coupled amplifier. 
a circuit consisting of two amplifier stages. The input to the grid of the second amplifier tube is the output from the first stage of amplification. Transformer coupled amplifier, a two-stage amplifier identical uh, to the two-stage RC coupled amplifier except that a transformer is used to couple the first and second stages. Voltage gain, total amplification of a two-stage or multi-stage amplifier is the product of the amplifications of each stage. The ratio of the final output of the final stage to the input of the first stage is called the gain of the amplifier. Audio power amplifier, an amplifier designed to supply power to a load. Its input <coughs> is the output of a voltage amplifier stage. Its output feeds a load through an output transformer. Phase inverter, a circuit which uses one or two vacuum tubes to produce two signal voltages 180 degrees out of phase. It is also called a phase splitter and replaces the transformer in a push-pull circuit. Push-pull power amplifier, a circuit consisting of a voltage amplifier, a phase splitter and two power amplifier tubes and an output transformer. The output transformer, a transformer used to couple the power amplifier output to the load. It matches the low load impedance to the high impedance required by the amplifier. Microphones, earphones and loudspeakers. Carbon, crystal, crystal dynamic and ribbon microphones are used to change sound waves into electrical impulses. Earphones and loudspeakers change electrical impulses to sound waves. And then there's an index to volume 2. And we've done the second volume. So we're one third of the way through. This is going to be another very long video. Basic Electronics, Volume 3. And it's the, the same preface again as it was for the other volumes. Table of Contents, Volume 3, Basic Electronics. Video Amplifiers. Introduction to the RF Amplifier. Tuned Circuits. A Single Stage RF Amplifier. The Two Stage RF Amplifier. Introduction to oscillators. The Armstrong and Hartley oscillators includes culprits, uh, the tuned plate, tuned grid crystal oscillators, the electron coupled oscillator, miscellaneous oscillators. Introduction to video amplifiers. Video amplifiers are very similar to the RC coupled audio amplifiers you have already seen. One very important difference between them is this. Video amplifiers are designed to amplify odd looking waveforms which an ordinary audio amplifier would distort. Some of the waveforms that video amplifiers are required to handle are called pulses or square waves. A French mathematician Fourier <laughs> showed that such waveforms can be considered to be the sum of many sine waves of different frequencies. Some of the sine waves that the, that the mathematicians say can be found in a square wave are 10 times higher in frequency than the square wave itself. Therefore, the amplifier that is needed to amplify the square wave without distortion must have a frequency range covering the frequency of the square wave fundamental and the frequencies, harmonics, of all the other sine waves which make up the square wave. However, all this about harmonic frequencies does not mean that you will need an advanced course in mathematics in order to understand video amplifiers. The mathematician can go right on defining a video amplifier as a wideband amplifier capable of amplifying sine wave signals in the frequency range from 30 cycles all the way up to several million cycles, megacycles per second. You can look at it in a much simpler and just as accurate way. A video amplifier must be able to amplify signals such as square waves without adding distortion. Simple. If you put a square wave into a video amplifier, you should get a square wave output. If not, something is wrong with the amplifier. You will find video amplifiers used wherever square waves or pulses are to be amplified without distortion. To many of you, the word video is synonymous with television, and it should, therefore, come as no surprise to you to learn that video amplifiers are used in television receivers. The picture is sent out by the station as a series of electrical pulses, which represent dark and light portions of 
the picture. These pulses are received in the home by the TV antenna, amplified by the video amplifier and applied to the picture tube so as to duplicate the picture sent out by the station. In television, the characteristics of the picture depend in part on the quality of the video amplifier. If the amplifier distorted the pulses, the picture would lack the sharpness and the detail it would otherwise have. Another important application of video amplifiers is the oscilloscope. In a scope, the vertical amplifier must amplify the input signal without adding any distortion. If the input signal is a distorted sine wave or a square wave, <coughs> that is how it is supposed to appear on the scope screen if the scope is to do its job. Therefore, a video amplifier is used as the vertical amplifier in a scope because video amplifiers are capable of amplifying almost any waveform without distortion. One of the very important applications of video amplifiers is in radar equipment. Every radar, whether it is used for search or for fire control, contains a video amplifier. Radar echoes are sharp pulses and the amplifier must preserve the shape of these echoes so that the radar operator can obtain accurate information about the target that is sending back the echo. Only video amplifiers can be used where pulses or square waves are to be amplified without distortion. No other amplifier comes close to meeting the requirements for the video amplifiers in oscilloscopes, television, sonar, radar, teletype, low ran, and photo facsimile equipment. Distortion of square waves. One reason that a square wave would be distorted in an audio amplifier is the amplifier's poor low frequency response. This shows up in the output as an unfaithful reproduction of the flat portion of the square wave. Square wave input, ideal output. Distorted output due to poor low frequency response. Distorted output due to poorer low frequency response. There you go. This is what happens in the amplifier. <clears throat> During the flat portion of the square wave between time A and time B, the grid voltage, the plate current and the plate voltage remain constant. At time B, the grid voltage drops suddenly to a new value and the plate voltage rises just as suddenly to its new value. When this happens, current will fl flow through R2 in the direction shown, causing the output voltage to appear across the resistor. The amount of current that flows in R2 depends, of course, on the value of the plate voltage on the current across the coupling condenser on the value of R2. This current will be small if R2 is large, but however small the current is, it will still charge up C1 and thereby change the voltage across the condenser. As the voltage across C1 increases, the current through R2 decreases, resulting in the distorted output shown above. If C1 has a small value, the same amount of current will flow the same amount of current flow will cause its voltage to change by a greater amount and the output will be more distorted. Further distortion will take place if R2 is decreased. This will result in greater current flow through the coupling condenser and a greater change in voltage across it. To improve the low frequency response of an RC coupled amplifier and thereby reduce the distortion that occurs in the flat portion of the square wave, R2 and C1 should be as large as possible. Even with good low frequency response, there might be cause for distortion. <clears throat> this cause, as you may have guessed, would be poor high frequency response. This distortion appears in the output as an unfaithful reproduction of the steep portions of the square wave. Square wave input, ideal output, distorted output due to poor high frequency response, distorted output due to bad high frequency response. The stray capacitance C2 is the cause of this distortion. It cannot change its voltage instantaneously and since C2 is directly across the output 
the output voltage cannot change instantaneously either. The stray capacitor in C2 can charge and discharge through R1 and R2 which are in parallel. If the parallel combination of R1 and R2 allows C2 to charge and discharge quickly, the output will show little or no distortion. If R1 and R2 are large resistances, C2 will require a relatively long time to charge and discharge, and the steep sides of the square wave will not be perfectly vertical. The larger these resistances become, the worse the distortion becomes. When this becomes very severe, C2 will never be able to charge and discharge enough to reach the flat portion of the square wave, and the output will resemble the triangular shaped wave shown above. If you recall the discussion about improving the high frequency response of audio amplifiers, you will remember that there are two different ways of doing this. The first is to reduce the stray capacitance C2 by using special amplifier tubes with very low values of input and output capacitance and by using special wiring techniques to reduce the stray capacitance between the wires and ground. The second way is to reduce the time it takes to C2 to charge and discharge. This is done by using lower values of R1 and R2. As you know, reducing R2 would harm the low frequency response. Therefore, this is not done. Reducing R1 reduces the gain of the, of the stage, but this disadvantage is overcome in video amplifiers by adding more stages, each with low gain but good frequency response. Special tubes are used such as the 6AC7, 6SH7 and the 6A G7. These tubes are designed for high gains and low input and output capacitances are therefore ideally suited for video amplifiers. One common way of improving wave shapes in video amplifiers is to decrease the effect of the things which cause distortion. This includes adjusting the types of R and C in the coupling network so as to reduce distortion. You have already seen how this works. Another way is, is to introduce just the opposite distortion into the circuit by adding compensating networks which counteract the distortion that is already there. To improve the steepness of the steep portion of the square wave an inductance L is placed in series with the plate load resistor R1. The back EMF set, set up in this instance every time the plate current changes will be in such a direction as to cause a peak a pe to appear in the plate voltage. At A the grid voltage is swinging positive and the plate current increases. The plate voltage decreases at the same instant. A back EMF is set up across L. This back EMF tends to oppose the increase of current and has the direction shown in the diagram. This back EMF, this negative back EMF, lowers the plate voltage below its normally low value, thus causing a peak to appear on the sine wave, on the square wave. Uh, when the grid voltage swings negative, as at B, the plate current decreases and the back EMF across L is in the opposite direction. This then adds to the plate voltage, normally high anyway, causing another peak to appear at B. Because of the effect of this inductance, it is always referred to as a peaking coil. Now consider the effect of these peaks on the charging and discharging of C2, the stray capacitance. C2 will now tend to charge to higher values of voltage, higher because of the peaks, and to discharge to lower values of voltage. This will cause C2 to charge and discharge faster than it would if no peaking coil were used. If the proper value of L is used, the final output can be made an almost perfect square wave. The most, <coughs> oh, this is the next section, uh, compensating networks, low frequency compensation. The most common compensating circuit used for correcting low frequency distortion is one that resembles a decoupling network. 
Like the peaking coil, this circuit introduces a distortion that is opposite and so counterbalances the distortion due to other causes. The distortion this circuit compensates for is the distortion of the flat region of the square wave caused by the voltage changes across the coupling condenser. This is how this circuit accomplishes its purpose. Ideal output, distorted output, voltage at point 3, distorted output due to C3 alone, output due to C1 and C2. At A, the plate current increases, the voltage drop across the R1 increases, and the voltage drop across R3 in the compensating network tends to increase. The voltage at point 1 in the circuit tends to decrease as a result. The condenser C3 will charge and the voltage at point 1 will decrease as the condenser discharges. Thus the plate voltage will continue to decrease between time A and time B. Now the voltage across the coupling condenser can change during this time and the voltage across the grid resistor R2 will remain constant. At B, the current suddenly decreases and the voltage at point 1 rises as the condenser C3 charges up. Thus between time B and time C the plate voltage is increasing. Let's see what happens to the flat portion of the square wave in the output. Without the compensating network, the voltage across the coupling condenser changed and this, and this change subtracted from the steady plate voltage leaves a distorted voltage across R2. With the compensating network, the voltage across the coupling condenser will still changes, but these changes subtract not from a steady plate voltage, but from a plate voltage that is itself changing in an opposite direction. In a properly designed circuit, the voltage across R2 will be an almost perfect square wave. Improving frequency response, degeneration. If there were no compensating circuits used, distortion would appear in the output. Let's say that a perfect square wave, waveform 1, is connected to the grid of an amplifier and that the output is distorted as shown in waveform 2. Now let's take a small part of the output waveform, as in waveform 3, and bring it back into the input. The resulting input would be the sum of the original input and this voltage which is fed back from the output. The new input will look like waveform 4. The new voltage at the plate of the amplifier will be waveform 5, which you will notice has just the opposite distortion than existed when the input was a perfect square wave. Whatever was causing distortion before is still causing it now, with the result that the output is still distorted, but not nearly so much as it was previously. Compare waveform 6, the new output, with the waveform 2, the old output. You will notice that the new wave input waveform, number 4, is smaller than waveform 1, the old input. This is so because the voltage that was fed back is out of phase with, and so subtract, subtracts from, the original signal input. Thus the output is smaller than it would ordinarily be, and the gain of the stage is apparently lessened. More important than the loss of gain is the decrease in the amount of distortion. This method of decreasing distortion is known as degeneration or as negative feedback. Improving frequency response, degeneration continued. There are several ways of obtaining negative feedback. One of the simplest and most widely used methods is to have the cathode bias resistor, R4, 
unbypassed. In this way, the cathode voltage will not be pure DC, but will vary as the current varies. When the grid d goes positive or less negative, the cathode current increases and the cathode voltage goes positive. This cathode voltage decreases the grid to cathode signal and so lowers the gain of the stage. Furthermore, the cathode current will not be of the same wave shape as the grid voltage if distortion is present in the circuit. The cathode voltage will contain this distortion and the difference between the grid and the cathode voltages will contain just the opposite distortion. This reduces the distortion in the output. Cool. So uh, this is just more about degeneration, which is negative feedback, and we're up to a review of audio amplifiers. So oh, there's a little bit of gunk in there, ancient gunk. All right, video amplifier amplifies pulses, triangular or square waves without distortion, whereas an audio amplifier distorts these waveforms due to poor high and low frequency response. Low frequency response can be improved by increasing capacity of the coupling capacitor and by adding a low frequency compensating network. Low frequency compensating network develops a varying voltage which when added to the square wave input voltage counteracts the distortion of flat portion of square wave due to the coupling capacitor. High frequency response can be improved by reducing the value of the plate load resistor and by adding a peaking coil in the plate lead. Peaking coil counteracts the effect of straight capacitance which leads to round off which tends to round off the leading edge of the square wave. Degeneration or negative feedback is a method of overcoming any type of square wave distortion by returning part of the output as a grid signal. Resultant output contains very little distortion. Unbypassed cathode resistor provides degeneration by forcing the cathode voltage to vary as the current varies, introducing distortion opposite to and thus reducing that present. Voltage divider feedback introduces part of the output voltage across the grid but 180 degrees out of phase so that distortion is introduced in reverse and thus reduced. Audio amplifier circuit may contain all or several of the distortion reducing components. That was, that's a video amplifier circuit may contain all or several of the distortion reducing, reducing components degeneration, peaking coil, low frequency compensating network. Cool. And that brings us to the end of, uh, oh no, 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 it's not the end of the volume. We're up to RF amplifiers now. All right. Introduction to the RF amplifier. Amplifiers and amplification. In order to understand what an RF amplifier is, you ought to review amplifiers and amplification. An amplifier is an electronic device which uses vacuum tubes to build up an AC voltage. Suppose you need 10 volts to drive a pair of headphones or a loudspeaker and the signal voltage is only 0.1 volts, which is too small to be used. The signal is fed into the grid of an amplifier tube which builds up to one volt then you feed the one volt into another amplifier and gives it 10 volts output you have the alternative of using one amplifier tube with a gain of 100 and building up the voltage to 10 volts in one step when two tubes are used to do the job it is called a two-stage amplifier when one is used it is a single stage amplifier some amplifiers use as many as five stages to build up a voltage large enough to drive a piece of equipment two stage amplifier and a single stage amplifier when an amplifier builds up the voltage ten times it has a voltage gain of ten the voltage gain is the number of times a stage or group of stages amplifies the signal i'm going to have a quick break I'm back, on we go. What an RF amplifier does. Now you're ready to examine what makes an RF amplifier different from other types of amplifiers. You remember that one, audio amplifiers amplify all frequencies from about 15 to 15,000 cycles per second. Two, video amplifiers amplify all frequencies from about 30 to 60 
megahertz <sighs> frequency ranges of amplifiers audio, video and then RF there we go RF amplifiers amplify signals from about 30 kilohertz to oh man that's a lot 30 gigahertz the outstanding feature of an RF amplifier is that it does not amplify this entire frequency range at once it selects one, one small portion the portion occupied by the radio signal sent out by one transmitter and amplifies that for instance WCBS broadcasts at a frequency of 880 kilocycles and is allotted a band whose limits are 5 kilocycles either side of 880 most standard broadcast stations are allotted a band 5 <coughs> kilocycles either side of the center frequency when you tune a broadcast receiver to WCBS you are adjusting the RF amplifier to select the band of frequencies extending from 875 to 885 kilocycles. The same principle applies to shortwave and television stations. For example, a station at 10 megacycles might have a bandwidth from 9.8 to 10.2 megacycles. A perfect RF amplifier would select that range of frequencies and reject all others. Television channel 2 occupies the band from 54 to 60 megacycles. When you tune a television set to channel 2, you're adjusting the RF amplifier to select that band and reject all the others. The RF amplifier amplifies one signal at a time. You already know that a signal sent out by a radio transmitter travels through the air to reach your radio, sometimes for thousands of miles. The transmitter may be putting out thousands of watts of power, but when the signal reaches your receiver, it may be very weak. The signal coming into your receiver is usually in the order of a few millionths of a volt and must be amplified many times before it will drive a loudspeaker or earphones. Weak RF signal into the antenna, into an RF amplifier, uh, and output to the next stage. It is possible to amplify a radio signal in several different ways. You may amplify it at radio frequencies as it comes from the antenna, where you may convert it to lower radio frequencies or even audio frequency and then amplify it. These various methods will be discussed later in volume 5 under radio receivers. The important point is that amplification is not the only function of an RF amplifier. The most important thing an RF amplifier does is to separate the stations whose signals reach the radio receiver. This process is called tuning. When you tune a receiver or a transmitter or a radar unit, you are changing the frequency to which the RF amplifier is set. Before you learn more about RF amplifiers, you will have a brief overview of resonance. In addition to what you learned about coils and capacitors in basic electricity, you will be shown how the resonant effect is used to tune an RF amplifier stage. The selectivity of tuned circuits and Q will be explained and you will be shown the construction of antenna and RF coils actually in use. After the section on resonant circuits, you will see why pentodes are nearly always used as RF amplifiers. Then you will be shown actual RF amplifier circuits illustrating how you may connect the tuned circuits to the amplifier tube and how the correct voltages are applied to the tube. 
you will go through an analysis of every part used in a typical RF amplifier stage in a broadcast receiver and find out how using more than one RF amplifier stage affects selectivity. This is what you will learn. Alright, so we've got an antenna into a transformer, tuning capacitor, another capacitor, this is the trimmer, T equals trimmer, okay that's a trimming capacitor. Uh, a gang, okay, uh, oh I see, they're ganged tuning capacitors. Okay. What a tuned circuit is. From the introduction to RF amplifiers, you learn that all RF amplifiers perform two important functions. They amplify the signal at radio frequencies. They select one narrow band of frequencies and reject all the others. Amplification of the signal is accomplished by a vacuum tube, just as in audio and video amplifiers. You have already learned just about all you need to know about amplification. The job of selecting one narrow band of frequencies to be amplified is performed by the RF amplifier's tuned circuit. The tuned circuit consists of coils and capacitors connected to form a resonant LC circuit, which is tuned to the desired frequency. On the following sheets, you will see how tuned circuits work in RF amplifiers. What is it that makes me amplify one signal at a time? We select the desired signal. Coil, capacitor, coil and a capacitor used for tuning. Review of series LC circuits. In a radio receiver, there are many signals of different in a radio receiver there are many signals of different frequencies coming into the antenna. The listener tunes the radio by adjusting the capacitor. This makes the antenna coil and capacitor resonate at the frequency of the desired station. Because of the resonant effect, the coil and capacitor select only that signal tuned to their resonant frequency. In order to understand exactly what the resonant effect is, let's review series LC circuits and then parallel LC circuits. You remember that a coil <coughs> offers less opposition to low frequencies than to high ones. A capacitor offers less opposition to high frequencies than low ones. This opposition is called reactance. Re the reactance curves of a coil and a capacitor. In the series LC circuit shown below, assume that the signal generator is delivering a very low frequency. The coil will offer little opposition to this low frequency, but the capacitor will offer very high opposition. Therefore, very little current will flow because the total reactance of the circuit is high. On the other hand, if the signal generator receives a very high frequency, the coil will offer very high opposition and the current will still be low. At some intermediate frequency, the reactance of the coil will equal the reactance of the capacitor. At this frequency, the resonant frequency, the impedance of the circuit will be minimum and the current will be maximum. Below resonant frequency, low reactance. Above resonant frequency, high reactance. At resonant frequency, current goes high. Review of parallel LC circuits. Most radio receivers employ parallel resonant rather than series resonant circuits for tuning to different frequencies. The reactance of coils and capacitors varies with the frequency applied to them, as you saw on the previous sheet. In addition to this, coils and capacitors have another property which is important in resonant circuits. 
A circuit causes the current to lag behind the applied voltage by 90 degrees. A capacitor causes the current to lead the applied voltage by 90 degrees. Voltage and current wave forms across a coil. Voltage and current wave forms across a capacitor. If you connect a coil in parallel with a capacitor, the current in the coil is 90 degrees behind the applied voltage plus 90 degrees behind the current in the capacitor or a total of 180 degrees out of phase with the capacitor current. You remember from basic electricity that currents which are 180 degrees out of phase cancel one another. If the capacitor alone draws 3 amps and the coil alone draws 2 amps, then the combination of the two draw 2 minus, 3 minus 2 or 1 amp. Capacitor and coil in parallel. Since the coil and capacitor are in parallel, the voltage across them is the same. If you, chose, if you choose a frequency at which the reactance of the coil equals the reactance of the capacitor and feed this frequency into them, the current in the coil will be equal and opposite to the current in the capacitor. Then no current will flow through the combination of the two. The frequency at which this occurs is called the resonant frequency and it is at this frequency that the tuned circuit's impedance is greatest. At resonant frequency, the external current is zero. If you saw an electrical device which had a voltage across it, but conducted no current, you would call it an open circuit. <coughs> you would say it had infinite impedance. In theory, the parallel resonant circuit has infinite impedance. In practice, this is never quite true. There was always a little current flowing in the external circuit, even at the resonant point. This is because all real, co real coils have some resistance. As a result, the current in the coil is not quite 180 degrees out of phase with the current in the capacitor, and they don't cancel each other out completely. In practice, at resonant frequency, the external current is minimum. All yeah, right. How the resonant circuit selects stations. So far, you know that a parallel tuned circuit has a very high impedance at the resonant frequency and a low impedance at all other frequencies. If you understand this, it will be easy to see how a parallel LC circuit selects stations. Parallel tuned circuit, high impedance only at resonant frequency. In the circuit shown below, signals of different frequencies strike the antenna. Each of them starts a current flowing in the primary of the antenna coil. Each of these circuits in the primary induces a voltage in the secondary. A variable capacitor is in parallel with the secondary of the antenna coil. The parallel LC circuit has a low impedance to all frequencies except its resonant frequency. Therefore, it short circuit signals at all frequencies other than its resonant frequency. It has a high impedance at its resonant frequency, therefore it does not short circuit the signal at this frequency, but allows it to build up. <coughs> Changing the capacitor setting changes the circuit's resonant frequency. One particular coil and one particular capacitor will resonate to one frequency only. Varying either the inductance or the capacitance of the tuned circuit will change the resonant frequency. In the process of tuning, you can change the capacitance of the tuned circuit by using a variable capacitor. When the resonant frequency of the LC circuit coincides with frequency of some signal, you have tuned the RF amplifier to that signal. Naturally, no tuning system is perfect. Signals whose frequencies are very close to each other will all get to the loudspeaker then the one to which the receiver tunes will be only a little louder than the others. Signals of exactly the same frequency will certainly get to the loudspeaker together. Then the strongest signal will be heard the loudest.
Q and selectivity. In audio and video amplifiers, it is desirable to have amplification stage pass a wide range of frequencies. On the other hand, in RF amplifiers, we would like the amplification stage to select a narrow band of frequencies and reject the rest. Only then can it separate stations which are close together on the dial. The narrower a band of frequencies passed by an amplifier, the greater its selectivity. Thus, selectivity is the ability of an amplifier to select one of many signals which are close in frequency. Poor selectivity is noisy. Good selectivity is clear. The selectivity of an RF amplifier is determined by its tuned circuits. The lower we can make a coil's resistance in proportion to its reactance, the more selective it will be. The measure of a coil's selectivity is Q, which is equal to its reactance divided by its resistance. Since the resistance of a capacitor is lower than that of a coil, the coil is the weakest link in a tuned circuit. The Q of the tuned circuit is the Q of the coil. The reactance of the coil divided by the resistance of the coil. High Q, sharp tuning, good separation of stations. Low Q, broad tuning, poor separation of stations. How tuning capacitors are constructed. In basic electricity, you were shown the construction of two types of capacitors, fixed and variable. Variable capacitors are used in tuned circuits so that you can vary their capacitance and thus change their frequency. Variable capacitors have one set of plates called the rotors, which can be rotated in and out of another set of fixed plates called the stators. The dielectric is air. As the rotor plates are rotated farther and farther out of the stators, the capacity of the unit decreases. Most radio receivers with RF amplifiers employ more than one tuned circuit. Each tuned circuit needs a variable capacitor. If you mounted each variable capacitor separately, you would have to tune each one separately and this would be inconvenient. Instead, you can mount the rotors of several identical variable capacitors on a single shaft. This is called ganging them. When one rotor is turned, the others turn the same amount. One gang capacitor, two gang capacitor. Gang capacitors involve one big difficulty. Although each of the gang units measures the same size and has the same spacing, there are small differences in capacity between the units. This is because it is economically impractical to manufacture any two things which are exactly the same size. To compensate for the differences in capacity, a small variable capacitor is connected in parallel with each variable capacitor unit to be ganged. Each of these small compensating capacitors can be adjusted separately until all of the gangs have the same capacity. These compensating capacitors are called trimmers because their capacitance is used to trim the capacitance of the main tuning units. Many tuned RF coils are really transformers and have two windings, the primary and the secondary. The coils are wound on a Bakelite or cardboard form and generally have an air core, although low frequency coils may occasionally have a powdered iron core. In order to prevent stray electric fields from affecting the action of RF coils, shields are generally placed around the coils. These shields alter the inductance of the coil. Therefore, any, trans any receiver adjustment, such as the alignment process, which will be described shortly, should be performed with the shields in place. I'm going to read that again. In order to prevent stray electric fields from affecting the action of RF coils, shields are generally placed around the coils. These shields alter the inductance of the coil. Therefore, any receiver adjustments, such as the alignment process, which will be described shortly, should be performed with the shields in place. Construction of tuning coils. Antenna coil. RF coil. Shield, primary, secondary, cardboard, connecting leads. Right. Review of tuned circuits. 
In this topic you have studied the action of a resonant circuit and how resonant circuits are used to tune RF amplifiers and radio receivers in general. There are several main points you should understand thoroughly in order to apply what you have learned. Tuning. Selecting a signal at one frequency and rejecting signals at all other frequencies. This is done by a coil and a capacitor. RF coils generally have primary and secondary windings. The secondary is usually tuned. Most of them come with shield cans. Tuning capacitors. These are variable air capacitors. Several air capacitors may be ganged into one unit. Trimmers. Trimmers are small capacitors placed in parallel with each unit of a gang capacitor. Their function is to compensate for small differences in capacity between the units. Resonant circuit. A circuit in which a capacitor and a coil are connected in series or in parallel. Its function is to tune. Parallel resonant circuit. The tuning capacitor is connected in parallel with the coil. It has high impedance at the resonant frequency and low impedance at all other frequencies. It builds up a high voltage at the resonant frequency and a low voltage at all other frequencies. This type of circuit is used most often to tune radio receivers. Why the pentode is used in RF amplifiers. You have just studied the operation of the tuned circuits in an RF amplifier. Now you are ready to begin work on the amplifier tube itself. The first question is, what kind of amplifier tube will do the best job? Or do the job best? There are three types of tubes which might be used, the triode, the tetrode and the pentode. At first glance it might seem that the triode is the best tube to use since it is the simplest of the three. However, the triode has two great disadvantages when used as an RF amplifier. No triode has an amplification factor of over 100. Tetrodes and pentodes have much higher amplification factors and therefore are capable of amplifying many more times. Triodes have a much higher capacitance from grid to plate than tetrodes or pentodes. An RF amplifier generally has tuned circuits in both its input and its output and these tuned circuits resonate to the same frequency. When you learn about oscillators you will find out that a triode whose output and input circuits are tuned to the same frequency tend to generate its own signal or oscillate between because of the high grid to plate capacitance. At this point, all you need to know is that a triode used as an RF amplifier will tend to make the entire receiver howl. Triodes often oscillate. Why the pentode is used in RF amplifiers? By now it ought to be obvious that a triode will not, is not well suited for use as an RF amplifier. A tube with a screen grid should clear up the difficulties which are encountered when a, tetrode, when a triode is used. This leaves a choice between tetrode and pentode. Tetrodes do not oscillate because the screen grid cuts down the capacity between the control grid and the plate. They do have two drawbacks, however, that are not present in the pentode. Tetrodes do not have an amplification factor of over several hundred, while pentodes have an amplification up to several, several thousand. Therefore, pentodes are preferable. Also, the tetrode produces secondary emission. Electrons from the cathode hit the plate at high velocities. Some of them bounce off the plate and are attracted to the screen grid, which is at a positive potential. This cuts down the plate current and causes distortion. Secondary emission is not present in the triode because it has no screen grid. Pentodes do not have this difficulty for a different reason. Tetrodes may distort. Pentodes have a third grid which is placed between the screen grid and the plate. This is the suppressor grid put there for the sole purpose of cutting down secondary emission. This is how it works. Electrons which bounce off the plate might drift back to the screen grid if the suppressor grid were not there to stop them. The suppre suppressor grid is connected to the cathode or to the ground and has an excess of electrons just like a cathode. Therefore, the electrons which bounce off the grid are repelled back to the plate by the suppressor grid and secondary emission is virtually eliminated. How the coils and capacitors are connected to the tube. You can connect coils and capacitors in two possible ways. 
to make them tune to a given frequency in series or in parallel. Almost all RF amplifiers employ parallel tuned circuits. The most common method of arranging tuned circuits in an RF amplifier and the one you will use is shown below. <coughs> Usual coupling method RF amplifier. However, this is not the only type of circuit which can be used to tune an RF amplifier. You may occasionally find other circuit arrangements. Either the input circuit or the output circuit may be altered and still produce a practical tuning arrangement. Here are some other ways. Different ways of connecting the input. Low impedance primary, no primary, no primary, different ways of connecting the output tuned primary and secondary capacitive coupling no inductive coupling capacitive coupling resistor or RF choke okay the development of the RF amplifier circuit you remember from the sections on vacuum tube theory that the function of a grid is to permit amplification of a signal. The signal to be amplified is fed into the grid and the output of the tube is taken from a load impedance in the plate circuit. You know how pentodes operate and you know how tuned circuits operate. Now put them together and this is what you have. The basic RF amplifier. Two grid bias voltage, ganged tuning capacitors, two screen voltage supply, to plate voltage supply, T is a trimmer. There are only a few differences between the above circuit and circuits actually used in radio receivers. First of all, separate power supplies are seldom used for the plate and screen voltages. The plate voltage supply is generally lowered by dropping resistor or voltage divider to supply voltage to the screen. CR2 in the diagram below. Also, the voltage on the screen should not be allowed to vary up and down with changes in the signal or distortion will result. For this reason the screen needs its own bypass capacitor C6. Hmm. Secondly, grid bias voltage is seldom taken from an outside source. Instead it is generated by the tube itself. Using a method which should be familiar to you, cathode bias R1. The cathode bias resistor is bypassed to prevent degeneration. Okay, so the cathode bypass is here and C5 to prevent degeneration. Degeneration is negative feedback, I think. Very often in multi-stage RF amplifiers, a decoupling filter, C7 and R3, is placed in the plate supply to prevent one stage from interacting with the next. It is a good policy to use a decoupling filter even in a single stage RF amplifier. the remote cutoff pentode. If you look up the 6SK7 in the tube manual, you'll find it is called a remote cutoff pentode. In other places it is called a variable moo pentode and a super control tube. The first two titles actually describe an important feature of this tube. The third title describes nothing and is just a name. <coughs> In order to understand the remote cutoff feature, suppose you examine the ordinary pentode. This will serve as a bias for comparison. Blah, blah, blah. So we're looking at remote cutoff pentode. Uh, and here we go, we're up to the review. Review of the single stage RF amplifier. Pentode, a tube used almost universally as an RF amplifier because it has the highest gain, least tendency to oscillate and least distortion. Remote cutoff pentode, a pentode whose EGIP graph curves 
continuously. For this reason, the gain of a remote cutoff pentode varies with the bias on the ground, also called variable mu pentode and super control tube RF coil. The primary is connected between the plate of the RF amplifier and B+. The secondary is connected between the grid and the next stage and the ground. Also shielded most of the time. Gain. The number of times a tube or RF oil can amplifies a signal. The gain of an RF uh, amplifier can be varied with a pot placed between the cathode and ground if a remote cutoff pentode is used. Selectivity is the ability of an RF amplifier to separate signals whose frequencies are close together. The narrower a brand of frequencies passed by an RF amplifier, the more selectivity it is. Selectivity curve. This is an, a, a graph of the frequency response of an RF amplifier. It shows you the gain of the RF amplifier over the frequencies which it is designed to cover. Why more than one R RF stage is used. You remember from the previous topic that an RF amplifier performs two functions. It amplifies an RF signal, it selects a frequency. When a receiver is close to a transmitter, the signal picked up by the receiver is strong. Such receivers probably only need one RF amplifier stage. On the other hand, some receivers are designed to pick up signals from transmitters several thousand miles away, and by the time the signal reaches the receiver, it is very weak. The receiver needs extra amplification to boost it. Such receivers require more than one RF amplifier stage. There is a second and less obvious reason for using more than one RF stage. More than one RF amplifier stage gives greater selectivity. More selectivity permits a receiver to separate stations whose frequencies are very close together. There are radio frequency bands in which many stations are crowded into a few megacycles. Receivers designed to cover these bands need more selectivity than one tuned RF amplifier can give them. More RF stages are needed where signal frequencies are close together. In order to understand how more RF stages give better selectivity, Suppose you examine a typical selectivity curve more carefully. All right, so we're looking at selectivity and bandpass. There is another idea related to selectivity which you ought to understand. This is the idea of bandpass. The word itself gives you some hint of what it means. It refers to the width of the frequency band passed by an amplifier. Most of the time it is used in connection with RF amplifiers. Bandpass. The width of the band of frequencies which is passed by an amplifier between the two points on the selectivity curve where the output is seven tenths of the output at resonant frequencies. This is the exact definition of bandpass, but it's a complicated one. Uh, you may get a better understanding if you examine the actual selectivity curve and calculate the bandpass. Here is the selectivity curve of a single stage RF amplifier taken from the previous sheet. The output of the stage at the resonant frequency is 100 microvolts. 7 tenth of this is 70 microvolts. The amplifier stage puts out 70 microvolts at 471 kilocycles and 529 kilocycles. 529 kilocycle minus 471 equals 58 kilocycle. The bandpass of this particular amplifier is 58 kilocycles. Now read the definition of bandpass again. The greater the selectivity, the narrower the bandpass. Calculate the bandpass for the two stage RF amplifier described on the previous sheet. Huh. No. <laughs> How are RF stages coupled? Although you probably <coughs> know already how one RF amplifier stage is coupled to the next, it might be good to review it at this point. There are several possible ways of coupling two RF stages. The most commonly used method is shown in the illustration below. It's with an RF coil and another tuning capacitor. Usual circuit for coupling RF amplifier stages. Notice that the plate load for the first stage is a coil. This coil is the primary winding of an RF transformer and has a high impedance at radio frequencies. The RF signal current flowing through the coil increases the voltage on the secondary winding. The secondary winding is tuned with a variable capacitor which is ganged to the capacitor that tunes the first RF stage. 
the action of this RF transformer is essentially the same as the action of an audio transformer in a transformer coupled audio amplifier except that the secondary of the RF transformer is tuned. RF coil acts like any other transformer. Two stage RF amplifier. When correctly adjusted it gives more amplification and more selectivity than a single stage RF amplifier. Band pass, the width of the band passed by an amplifier between the two points where the output is 7 tenths of the output at the resonant frequency. The greater the selectivity, the narrower the band pass. The greater the band pass, the poorer the selectivity. Alignment. The process of adjusting tremors in a group of tuned amplifier stages so that all the stages tune to the same frequency. When a multi, multiple stage RF amplifier is correctly aligned, it will give more selectivity than a single stage amplifier. When it is not correctly aligned, it may give far less selectivity or even tune to two frequencies at once. Oscillators. Alright. Well, we're going to have to speed up. Otherwise, Dave Jones will really tease me about being too long. Why you study oscillators? You have studied how amplifiers function in electronic circuits. No less important are oscillator circuits or simply oscillators. Most modern radio receivers which you have used in your home and your automobile contain oscillators. Every transmitter sends intelligence through the air employ employs an oscillator to produce these signals. This is not only true of ground stations like WNBC or WCBS, it applies to every transmitter on a ship or plane. Inter-ship and plane-to-ship communications would be greatly limited if oscillator circuits were not employed. At home, at sea, in the air, on the road. Oscillators are not used exclusively in communications equipment. The test equipment you use, signal generators and frequency meters, contain oscillator circuits. You will find oscillators in radar and sonar equipment, as well as in certain guided missiles and torpedoes. What an oscillator does. I think we know what an oscillator does. The electronic oscillator. Ah, voltage. Is that a tank circuit? The LC oscillating? about the Armstrong oscillator. A lot to tell you about that. Maybe it'll, it'll explain it to us in the thing. There's the frequency. Oh, this is the tank circuit now. Here we go. Review. All vacuum tube oscillators, whether RF or audio, work on the principle of feeding back voltage pulses from the plate circuit to the grid circuit of the tube. The grid is connected to a parallel resonant circuit which does the oscillating. The parallel resonant circuit also times the pulses and fed back and thus control, controls the frequency of oscillation. The tube is generally operated class C so that plate current flows in pulses during less than half of the AC cycle. The Armstrong oscillator uses a tickler coil to feed back pulses from the plate circuit to the tank circuit. The Hartley oscillator uses a tapped coil instead of a separate tickler winding 
to feedback pulses. It has more frequency stability than the Armstrong. Uh, Colpit's oscillator uses a tapped capacitance network to couple the feedback pulses to the grid tank circuit. It has more frequency stability than the Hartley oscillator. Grid leak bias, a method of bias in which excess electrons accumulate on the grid, producing a negative bias. They are allowed to leak off slowly through a large resistor which is placed in parallel with the grid capacitor or from grid to cathode. Making the resistor large enough produces more than cutoff bias and results in class C operation. Okay, the tuned plate, tuned grid, and crystal oscillators. Pentode with linking coupling. Crystals for oscillator control. Quartz crystals. Quartz crystals still used. The crystal as a resonator. A crystal has a natural frequency of vibration. When the AC voltage across its faces has the same frequency as the mechanical frequency of the crystal, the crystal block will stretch and compress more than for other frequencies. Also, the crystal's natural frequency of vibration is extraordinarily constant, more constant even than the frequency of oscillation of an LC circuit. Crystal oscillator. Tuning the crystal oscillator. The crystal oscillator. Okay. Review of TPTG. That's tuned plate, tuned grid. And crystal oscillators. The T tuned plate, tuned grid oscillator uses a tuned circuit in both the plate and grid circuits. Maximum power output is obtained when the plate tank circuit is tuned to the same resonant frequency as the grid tank circuit. Feedback can be provided by means of link coupling or a capacitor when a pentode is used. The plate to grid capacitance provides feedback when a triode is used. A crystal with its conducting plates is equivalent to a parallel resonant circuit and can be used in place of the grid tank circuit of the TPTG oscillator. Crystal oscillators it is very similar to the TPTG oscillator but uses a crystal in place of the grid tank circuit. Power output is low but frequency stability is excellent where only one frequency is required. Power output of the crystal oscillator is maximum when the plate tank is tuned to the natural mechanical frequency of vibration of the crystal. The oscillator is usually operated at less than maximum power output to achieve stability of operation. Introduction to electron coupled oscillator, equivalent of Hartley oscillator, more about the Colpitts oscillator, RF potential in the Hartley oscillator, RF potential in the Armstrong oscillator. Okay. High frequency oscillators. Above 700 megahertz, entirely different tubes are necessary. There you go. High frequency oscillators. You have studied the basic oscillators used at low fr radio frequencies. These operate at high efficiency up to about 20 megacycles. Beyond 20 megacycles, their efficiency drops unless specific, specially designed high frequency tubes are used. Also the Q of the tuned circuits drops at high frequencies. This loss of efficiency becomes greater until at 100 megahertz most tubes will lose 50% uh, of the power put into them. However, there are still tubes operating on the same principle as the ordinary 6C5 triode which can give reasonable efficiency up to around 700 megahertz. Beyond that, give up. <laughs> Entirely different types of tubes and resonant circuits are needed to get more than 5 watts of RF power output. They operate on entirely different principles from those with which you are familiar. At very high frequencies, the inductance of the connecting wires and even of the tube leads becomes greater than the inductance in the tuned circuit. Likewise, the grid to plate and grid to cathode capacity becomes greater than the capacity in the tuned circuit. The solution is to use shorter connecting leads and miniature tubes with low inter 
into electrode capacity, even then these tiny tubes are useless at 1 gigahertz. Uh, besides, small tubes cannot give much power output. Tuned lines. Cavity resonated and ultra high frequencies. The cholesterol tube. The Klystron is a vacuum tube operating on an entirely different principle from conventional tubes. It can be made to amplify or oscillate. Its function as an oscillator is important at this point. Electrons leave the hot cathode and are accelerated by a positive grid. They flow toward a buncher. I don't think we're going to read more about the Klystron tube. Maybe they'll tell us about it in the review, which is now the review. The description of the Klystron tube was not included to make you into a Klystron ex expert. There are other types of Klystron tubes and different circuits, too complex to be discussed at this point. The purpose of uh, this description was to acquaint you with what sort of techniques are used at frequencies above the limit of conventional triodes. The Klystron can operate effectively above 10 gigahertz. If you study radar, you will learn about another ultra-high frequency oscillator, the magnetron. This tube can deliver millions of watts of RF over of power at 3 gigahertz and higher. Series feed. A circuit arrangement in which the plate current of the tube flows through the tank circuit. In cases where the plate and the tube goes directly to the tank, the entire B plus voltage is present at the tank. This presents the danger of shocks. Shunt feed, a circuit arrangement in which the plate current of the tube flows through an RF choke and only RF voltages gets to the tank. This avoids the possibility of DC shock, but the RF choke cannot operate efficiently over a wide band of frequencies. Grounding points. Most oscillator circuits can be made to work with the plate, cathode, or grid at RF ground potential. Uh, eco. The eco is not a special type of oscillator. It is a circuit in which a screen grid tube is used instead of a triode. The screen grid is the oscillator anode. It is at RF ground potential and therefore isolates the oscillator from the output circuit. Changes in loading have less effect on the frequency of oscillation. Lump reactants. All standard coils and capacitors are lump reactances. Uh, distributed reactants. Obtaining capacity or inductance from straight wires. Generally, uh, parallel wires are used. At high frequencies, it becomes necess necessary to use distributed reactances because they have higher Q than ordinary coils and capacitors. Cavity resonator. A hollow metal structure which exhibits the same characteristics at high frequencies as a coil and capacitor at low frequencies. It has much higher Q than an ordinary coil and capacitor. Klystron, a vacuum tube designed to operate at frequencies above 1 GHz. It has several forms, all of which use a positive grid as an accelerator and other grids to bunch the electrons together in clusters. Electronic oscillator, a vacuum tube amplifier with a feedback circuit that either internal or external to the tube. It generates continuous sine wave of AC of a controllable frequency. It has a tuned circuit which does the oscillating and controls the frequency of the wave generated. The vacuum tube merely supplies pulses to keep the tuned circuit oscillating. Armstrong oscillator uses a tickler coil to feed back pulses from the plate circuit into the tank circuit. Hartley oscillator uses a tapped coil instead of a separate tickler winding to feed back pulses. It has more frequency stability than the Armstrong. Uh, Colpitt's oscillator uses a tapped uh, capacitance network to couple the pulses to the tank. It has more frequency stability than the Hartley. The TPTG oscillator uses the grid plate capacitance of a triode to feed back pulses to a tuned circuit connected to the grid. It oscillates only when the two tuned circuits are set to or near the same frequency. Crystal oscillator is like a TPTG oscillator, but a crystal is connected in place of the grid tank circuit. It can only oscillate at or very close to the frequency of the crystal. It has more frequency uh, frequency stability than other uh, than other oscillators.
uh, electron coupling is a method of connecting other oscillator circuits in the electron coupled oscillator. The screen grid is the feedback electrode leaving the plate independent of the oscillator section. Changes in load and plate voltage have little effect on oscillator frequency. It is more stable than any other oscillator except the crystal. Series feed a circuit arrangement in which the plate current of the tube flows through the tank circuit. In cases where the plate of the tube goes directly to the tank, the entire B plus voltage is present at the tank. This presents the danger of shocks. Shunt feed, a circuit arrangement in which the plate current of the tube flows through an RF choke and only RF voltage gets to the tank. This avoids the possibility of DC shock, but the RF choke cannot operate efficiently over a wide band of frequencies. Uh, frequency stability, the ability of an oscillator to keep putting out the same frequency when it is subjected to changes in load and plate voltage, heat, humidity, vibration, and so on. Index to volume three. There we go. Now we're up to basic electronics, volume four. And I think we're gonna have the same preface again. Yes, it's the same preface again. And this is the table of contents. So what a transmitter is, class C amplifiers, a three-stage transmitter, frequency multipliers, transmission lines, antennas, uh, CW transmission, and um, amplitude modulation. All right. Well, we're gonna have to speed it up a bit so we can get through all of this. What you know about transmitters. Probably very few of you had any direct experience with transmitters. To many of you, the word itself may be unfamiliar. However, you have referred many times to one type of transmitter, a radio station. When you listen to a radio, the sound you hear travel to the radio receiver through the air. If someone were to ask you how those sounds happen to be in the air, you would probably say a radio station broadcasts them. <coughs> there are the Okay. Simple transmitter, oscillator, antenna, high frequency signal. Uh, this is going to be about modulation. Power amplification. Talking about continuous wave. Page has fallen out. Let's skip that. Fixed bias may be obtained. Pages have fallen out. <sighs> Class C volt had something to do with the cutoff. It exceeds the cutoff. Here we go. Review of Class C amplifiers. Class C operation. The grid of the vacuum tube is biased well below cutoff so that plate current flows only in pulses. Tuned Class C amplifiers. Used in transmitters because they are very efficient when tuned to the frequency of the input signal. Uh, grid leak bias. Depends on grid current and varies at the strength of input signal changes. Combination bias, a combination of fixed and grid leak bias most commonly used in transmitters. Three basic circuits. Okay. Master oscillator. Intermediate power amplifier. Final power amplifier. Transmitting tube filament circuit. Tube, tube, tube. Complete diagram of a three-stage transmitter. Uh-huh. So this is an oscillator, I guess. IPA, in, 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 intermediate, was it? I forget. Purpose of tuning. Tuning methods. Using a lamp for tuning. Ah. Plate neutralization. Grid neutralization. 
neutralizing procedures indicators used in neutralizing never heard of neutralizing before parasitic oscillations review of the three-stage transmitter the three stages the master oscillator intermediate power amplifier and final power amplifier make up the three the basic three-stage transmitter I'm just going to fix these pages which have fallen out there we go uh, tuning for efficient operation the plate tank circuit of the amplifier must resonate at oscillator frequency. Adjusting the variable capacitor to reach this condition is called tuning. Tuning methods. The plate circuit of each transmitter stage may be tuned by adjusting the variable capacitor for minimum DC plate current. Neutralization. Plate or grid neutralization circuits may be used to counteract the feedback effect of the grid to plate capacity in amplifiers using triodes. Okay, purpose of frequency multiplication final power amplifier frequency doubling frequency tripling tuning indications overall transmitter antenna transmission line coupling circuit coupling circuits direct coupling inductive coupling link coupling Tuned coupling circuit series, tuned coupling parallel, tuned coupling. Transmission lines. A transmission line provides a means of transferring electrical energy from one point to another. You know of at least one application of transmission line carrying 60 cycle power from the generator to the point of application. In transmitters, transmission lines are similarly used to convey RF power from one point to another. For example, a transmission line is always used to carry RF power from the transmitter lines to the antenna when an antenna is some distance from the transmitter. Transmission lines play an important part in the operation of transmitter, not only to convey RF energy but also as circuit components, frequency and wavelength. Equivalent circuit of a transmission line, typical RF transmission line. Insulator spacing and conductors. Okay, characteristics of impedance. Uh, line termination in characteristic impedance for maximum power output, matching line to antenna. Uh, non resonant and resonant lines. Line length, current and voltage distribution along a flat line. Standing waves on a rope. Standing waves on a rope, short, open and shorted transmission lines. <coughs> input impedance of a line. Uh, input impedance along short circuit line. Input impedance along open circuit line. Frequency measurement using standing waves. Four stub uses metallic insulator. Two stub is harmonic filter. Applications of transmission line principles. Types of transmission line. Two wire open line, concentric line, coaxial cable, waveguide. At very high frequencies, the losses in any of the above mentioned lines become excessive and waveguides must be used. Waveguides are made of round or rectangular hollow tubes. The uh, VHS oscillator, equivalent circuit. Observing current peaks on an open line, on a shorted line. Using pilot light to indicate current peaks. Using neon bulb to indicate voltage peaks. Observing standing waves using fluorescent light. Demonstration transmission lines. Uh, to power supply, transmission lines, determining characteristic impedance of a line, determining oscillator frequency, screwdriver shorting line, transmission lines, review. <coughs> the purpose of a transmission line 
in a transmitter is to convey RF energy from the transmitter to the antenna. The characteristic impedance of the transmission line should match the input impedance of the antenna if maximum power transferred to the antenna and therefore maximum radiated power is to be realized. Characteristic impedance. A transmission line has a characteristic impedance, ZO. Uh, if it is terminated in a load equal to its characteristic impedance, maximum power is transferred to the load and no standing waves exist on the line. Matching line to antenna. Uh, if the impedance of the antenna is 73 ohms, for maximum power output, the characteristic impedance should equal 73 ohms. Standing waves. When a transmission line is terminated in a load other than its characteristic impedance, some of the energy is reflected at the end of the line back toward the generator. Uh, the forward and reflected waves combine along the line to form standing waves. The voltage and current distribution along an open and shorted line are as shown. The purpose of a transmitting antenna is to convert the power delivered by the transmission line into a wave called an electromagnetic wave. This electromagnetic wave has the unique property of radiating through space without the aid of wires. All antennas work on the same principle. The antenna current generates an electromagnetic field which leaves the antenna and radiates outward as electromagnetic wave. The antennas you will be concerned with now are those which are designed as transmitting antennas. These will operate at much higher frequencies than the power lines and will be much more efficient. However, it is still the current which flows in the antenna that causes the electromagnetic field to be radiated. The antenna converts electri electrical power into electromagnetic waves. An interesting example of antenna action can be observed by touching your finger to the vertical input terminal of an oscilloscope. You will see a 60 cycle waveform on the scope's green which obviously must come from your body. What is actually happening is that your body is picking up 60 cycle electromagnetic waves which are radiated from the many power wires that carry 60 cycle current. The power lines are acting as a transmitting antenna, although they were not designed for that purpose. Body picking up 60 cycles radiated from power lines. If the wires of an open-ended transmission line are bent back a quarter wavelength from the open end at right angles to the line, a simple antenna is formed called a half-wave dipole, a doublet or a hertz antenna. The voltage and current distribution on the antenna are the same as on the original transmission line. Transmission line, antenna, how an antenna works, magnetic field surrounding an antenna, basic antennas, input impedance of doublet, maximum power radiation, uh, dipole longer than uh, lambda on two appears inductive, Dipole shorter appears capacitive. Tuning the antenna, if it's too short, if it's resonating, if it's too long. Radi radiation patterns. Okay. Wave propagation, components of a radiated wave. Space wave and fading. Line of sight transmission fading, signals received out of phase, frequency spectrum transmitting frequencies, demonstration current distribution along an antenna, check for oscillation using a neon lamp, fluorescent lamp shows standing waves, the wave meter, radiation intensity, Checking the radiation pattern, brightest at center, bulb goes out at end, half-wave dipole, radiation, wave propagation, advantages of continuous wave transmission. You may remember from the introductory topic on transmitters that a message can be transmitted by either code or voice. Code transmission is either CW, continuous wave, or MCW, modulated continuous wave. In both cases, the RF radiated by the antenna is turned on and off by a hand key in dot and dash sequence. Continuous wave transmission is used very widely. When a transmitter is modulated by voice or 
or MCW, it sends out not only the carrier frequency, but also the sum and difference beat frequencies of the carrier and the modulated single signal. These additional frequencies are called sideband frequencies. A receiver, in order to pick up a voice or MCW signal, must be broadly tuned so that it will pick up both the carrier and the sidebands. As a result, the receiver may pick up a nearby signal in addition to the desired one. This interference may make it impossible to understand the desired signal. Continuous wave transmission, on the other hand, does not contain sidebands. Notice that the receiver would not need to cover as wide a range of frequencies for a continuous wave signal as it would for a voice signal. Therefore, there is not likely to be interference when receiving continuous wave signal. This is the main advantage of continuous wave over MCW or voice. There are many different circuits which are used to obtain continuous wave transmission. They look different and operate differently, but each has the same purpose, to turn the RF of the transmitter on and off. You will learn about some of these circuits on, in, on the next few sheets. Uh, in the next topic, you will find out more about MCW and voice transmission. Cathode keying, uh, equivalent to this. <sighs> uh, okay, so talking about keying, uh, key tube circuits, what ampl amplitude modulation is. I'm going to take a quick break. I'll be back here. I'm back. On we go. So uh, this is about keying. Then we're going to learn about amplitude mod modulation. Uh, Sidebands. what amplitude modulation is. The type of voice transmission most commonly used is one in which the amplitude of the carrier is varied in accordance with the amplitude of the voice signal. This method of modulating the carrier is called amplitude modulation. MCW transmission is amplitude modulation in which a steady audio frequency is used instead of voice to vary the amplitude of the RF carrier. In addition to the oscillator and power amplifiers, an AM transmitter contains a modulator which applies the audio frequency signal to the PA where it is combined with the RF carrier wave. A block diagram of a typical voice AM transmitter is shown below. <coughs> In the operation of an AM transmitter, it is essential that the modulator unit be on during transmission because the intelligence that is to be transmitted must come through the modulator. If the modulator is either off or defective, only unmodulated RF will be transmitted and a receiver at some distant point will not receive any message. Sidebands When an RF carrier is amplitude modulated, the effect is to add new frequencies to the transmitted signal in addition to the original carrier frequency. For example, if an MCW transmission is 500 kilocycles, a 500 kilocycle carrier is modulated with a 2000 cycle audio note, the frequencies radiated by the antenna will contain, in addition to the carrier frequency, the sum 502 kilocycles and difference 498 kilocycle frequencies between the carrier and the modulating audio frequency. These new frequencies are called sidebands, the higher frequency being known as the upper sideband and the low frequency the lower sideband. The range of frequencies transmitted from the lower sideband to the upper sideband is known as the bandwidth of the transmission. In the above uh, example the bandwidth is 4 kilocycles from 498 kilocycles to 502 kilocycles. If the modulating audio signal is reduced in frequency from 1000 
As from 2000 to 1000 cycles, the side bands will be closer to the carrier frequency and the bandwidth will be only 2 kilocycles. It is the sideband frequencies and not the carrier frequencies which contain the intelligence of the transmission. If, for example, an MCW receiver were to pick up only the carrier and exclude the sidebands, no intelligence would be heard. In a voice transmission, the modulating signal contains many frequencies, some as high as 5,000 cycles per second. As a result, voice transmission contain many sidebands, one sideband for each frequency, which may be as much as 5 kilocycles above and 5 kilocycles below the carrier frequency. This type of transmission, therefore, may cover a range of frequencies 10 kilocycles wide. <coughs> how modulation is accomplished. In an unmodulated transmitter, the amplitudes of the plate current pulses in the Class C amplifiers are the same, cycle after cycle. These plate current pulses flow to an LC circuit which is tuned to the RF frequency or a multiple of it. <coughs> the pulse of current the pulses of current deliver a certain amount of power to the tuned circuit and this power remains the same for each cycle. Therefore, the amplitude of RF voltage across the tuned circuit remains the same for every cycle. When the transmitter is modulated, the amplitude of the plate current pulses is made to vary according to the amplitude of the modulating signal. Thus, the amplitude of the RF current varies from one cycle to the next and the power delivered to the tuned circuit also varies. This varying power causes the RF voltage across the tuned circuit to vary. These variations will show the modulating signal in amplitude and frequency. This is how modulation is accomplished. So there's the modulated transmitter, modulating signal, plate current pulses, uh, voltage across a tuned circuit. The modulator. In MCW and voice amplitude modulation, a modulator is used to impress the audio on the RF. For voice, the modulator is nothing more than an audi ordinary audio amplifier which provides the voltage or power needed to vary the amplitude of the transmitter's RF. For MCW, the modulator contains an audio oscillator which drives the audio amplifier. The output is a pure sine wave which varies the amplitude of the RF pulses in the same manner as the amplitude of the audio, of the audio varies. Since the modulator is connected to the stage of the transmitter that is to be modulated, its output must be of sufficient power to produce the necessary variations of current. Push-pull amplifier used as a modulator. Uh, plate modulation. Okay grid modulation, other methods of modulation, screen grid modulation, suppressor grid modulation, cathode modulation, time-based modulation, trapezoid figure, trapezoid figure continues, the scope deflection plates, uh, sweep, modulating voltage, uh, time-based figure, trapezoid figure, effect of varying amplitude of modulating voltage, 100% modulation for maximum power in transmission, uh, over-modulation, distorts the signal and interferes with carrier frequencies, percentage modulation, <coughs> amplitude modulation. Okay, this is review of amplitude modulation. Amplitude modulation, the method which uses voice or an audio signal to vary the amplitude of an RF carrier wave. The modulator is the component of the AM transmitter which combines the audio and RF signals. Sidebands, frequencies contained in the transmitted signal in addition to the RF carrier frequency. Sidebands are equal to the sum and difference of carrier and modulating signals. MCW has two sidebands, voice has many. Plate modulation. The method whereby the modulating signal varies the PA tube voltage, thus modulating its output in response to the audio signal. Grid modulation. The modulating signal is applied to the grid of the PA tube. Varying grid voltage in this manner controls PA tube plate current and hence modulates output voltage. Trapezoid figure. 
the oscilloscope pattern obtained by using the transmitter output voltage as scope Y input and the modulating signal as X input. Percentage modulation, the measure of the extent to which the RF carrier is modulated. 100% modulation is desirable for voice transmission so that maximum power is transmitted. Over modulation produces a distort distorted signal and introduces unwanted sidebands. Uh, can, uh, let's pause and review briefly what you have learned about transmitters. Okay, this is a review of transmitters. CW transmission. An RF signal is generated in the transmitter by an RF oscillator and radiated into space. Intelligence is imparted by turning transmitter on and off with a key. CW is used most often for long distance communications. MCW transmission. A constant amplitude audio frequency signal is superimposed on the RF carrier wave. Transmitter is turned on and off by means of a key as in CW transmission. MCW is used for emergency applications. Voice transmission. In amplitude modulation, a voice signal varies the amplitude of the RF carrier. Transmission is continuous and is the type used for standard radio broadcasting. Grid leak bias. A resistor and a capacitor in the grid circuit of an amplifier tube to make the amplifier operate class C. The amount of bias depends on the grid current and varies as the strength of the signal input signal changes. Combination bias. A combination of fixed and grid leak bias most commonly used in transmitters. Three stage transmitter, the master oscillator, intermediate power amplifier and final power amplifier make up the basic three stage transmitter. Tuning. For efficient operation, the plate tank circuit of the amplifier fires must resonate at oscillator frequency. Adjusting the variable capacitor to reach this condition is called tuning. Uh, plate voltage is maximum and current minimum at signal frequency. Neutralization. Plate or grid neutralization circuits may be used to counteract the feedback effect on the grid to plate capacity of triodes used in transmitter amplifiers. Transmission line. Used to convey the RF signal from the transmitter to the antenna. For maximum power output, the characteristic impedance of the line should equal the input impedance of the antenna. Coupling circuits are used to couple the transmission line to the transmitter. Standing waves, voltage and current distribution along a transmission line or antenna can be represented by waveforms called standing waves. Antennas, radiates energy received from transmission line into space. Electric and magnetic fields generated by current and voltage waves on antenna expand and collapse the transmitter signal varies as transmitted signal varies. Sidebands, frequencies contained in the transmitted signal in addition to the RF carrier frequency. MCW has two sidebands, voice has many sidebands. Plate modulation, a method whereby the modulating signal varies the PA tube plate voltage, thus modulating its output in response to the audio signal. Grid modulation, the modulating signal is applied to the grid of the PA tube. Uh, varying grid voltage in this manner controls PA tube plate current and hence modulates output voltage. Index to volume 4. Oh, that's good. So we're up to volume 5. That's 5 out of 6. So we've got 2 to go. Here we go. And there's the same preface again. It's the same preface to every volume. And here we are. The table of contents for volume 5. Introduction to receivers and ante receiver antennas, TRF receivers, RF amplifier stage, TRF receivers, audio amplifier stage, TRF receivers regenerative detector, TRF receivers plate detector, the superheterodyne receiver, troubleshooting the superheterodyne receiver. All right, cool. I'm going to have another coffee before we keep kicking on with this part. All right, I'm back. Got myself my coffee. I think this is like my fourth copy. Coffee. <clears throat> so uh, we're just about to kick off with volume five, which is all about receivers. <clears throat> so, history of communication. Did it <clears throat> ever occur to you to ask, why is there such a thing as a radio receiver? <laughs> To answer this question, you have to know something about the history of man's attempt to improve his methods of communication. Since the earliest days, man has always tried to increase the distance over which he could send messages. 
talking, tom toms, smoke signals, telegraph, telephone. History of communication continued. Since the dawn of history, good communications have played an important part in the art of warfare. The victory message of the <coughs> Battle of Marathon carried by a Greek runner was one of the earliest recorded instances of battle communications. Our own history offers another famous example in Paul, Paul Revere, Revere's ride. From Marathon to Paul Revere's Ride. I haven't heard of that one before. Good communications have won battles. The result of poor communications was effectively demonstrated in the Battle of New Orleans during the War of 1812. Because news of the cessation of hostilities did not reach those in command until it was too late, this battle was fought several days after the war had ended. History of communication continued. Some of the more primitive methods of communication, human messengers and homing pigeons, have limited application. Today we still use semaphore signals and interu interrupted flashes of light to convey messages. Coloured lights, rockets and flares perform functions similar to those of warning hilltop fires of old, while whistles and sirens are still being used. Some modern versions of primitive methods are still in use. Signal flags, blinkers, flares or rockets, sirens. These simple signaling systems are at best slow and unreliable. If the wind is blowing from the wrong direction, sound signals will not be received. In thick fog or heavy rain, visual signals fail to deliver the message. Runners and pigeons are slightly more reliable, but their rate of travel is relatively slow. The problem of rapid and reliable communication was solved by harnessing electricity to the task. Improvements on the inventions of Morse, Bell and Marconi have led to the development of modern telegraph, telephone and wireless communication systems capable of transmitting message almost instantaneously over thousands of miles of space. Electricity made communications reliable and rapid. <coughs> Today, with the advent of wireless communication, or as it is more commonly known, radio communication, the use of electricity for transmitting messages has reached its highest point. No longer is transmission limited to those places which a wire can reach, as is the case with telephone. This remarkable electronic device, the radio, consists of two parts, the transmitter and the receiver. The transmitter sends out the message in the form of radio waves into the atmosphere. The radio receiver picks up the radio waves sent out by the transmitter and converts them back into the message which was originally put into the transmitter. This section will deal with the receiving end of radio communication, the receiver. The jobs that a receiver must perform are very much the same in radio, radar and sonar equipment. Both the type and signal going into the receiver and the type and signal coming out of the receiver are different for each type of equipment, but the steps the incoming signal must go through before it emerges as a useful output are almost identical whether the receiver is used for radio, radar or sonar. The function of any receiver can be broken down into the five separate steps. 1. Picking up the incoming signal. 2. Selecting the diet desired signal. 3. Amplifying the desired RF signal. 4. Detecting or demodulating the amplified signal. And 5. Amplifying the audio or video signals. <sighs> Receiver sensitivity. High yo silver, high yo silver. Receiver not sensitive enough. Very receiver. Okay. Uh, so they're singing fidelity, receive with good fidelity, receive with poor fidelity. In the beginning. Yeah, isn't that funny? The crystal receiver. This was how it began, yeah. Isn't that funny? Huh. The crystal receiver. The first receivers were used in the early 1900s and were called crystal sets. In their simplest form, they consisted of an antenna, a crystal detector, and a cat's whisker, and a pair of earphones. The antenna picked up any signals in the air. 
in those days there were very few and the crystal which operated as a rectifier allowed the antenna currents to flow directly to ground on every positive half cycle of RF but blocked the negative half cycles. These positive half cycles of current flowed through the cat's whisker, a delicate wire kept, kept contact on the crystal. <laughs> yeah. The most common type of receiver used in home radios and other equipment is the super heterodyne receiver. This type of receiver all the RF amplification does not take place in the incoming signal frequency. Most of the RF amplification occurs after the incoming signal has been converted to an intermediate frequency, which is always the same no matter what the frequency of the desired signal is. You will see how this is accomplished later. The only parts in a superhet which differ from those in a TRF are the ver variable frequency local oscillator, the mixer and the IF amplifier. The variable frequency local oscillator is similar to the oscillators which you have already worked. Blah, 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 blah. Recently developed uses of receivers. Uh, picture or video, sound or audio, classroom, picture tube, uh, uh, airborne television equipment can be used to transmit an overall survey of localized operations back to a flagship or to headquarters. Yeah. One of the most interesting and significant applications of radio reception to modern warfare is in the connection with the development of guided missiles. The path followed by these missiles can be controlled by radio signals transmitted by a distant operator. The future of receiver antennas. The purpose of the receiver antenna is to transmit the electromagnetic waves are radiated from the transmitter. Blah, blah, blah. Receiving types of receiver, flat top antenna coil, insulator, transmission line, dipole antenna, types of receiver continued, vertical, flat or pancake loop, box antenna loop, type of loop antenna found in direction finding equipment, uh, noise, okay, uh, high signal to noise, low signal to noise <sighs> factors that cause antenna signal loss uh, surrounded by tall buildings in trees swaying in the breeze ah, considerations blah 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 factors to be considered in selecting and installing antennas noise antenna length signal losses directivity Review for receiving antennas. Antenna function. The receiver antenna picks up signals radiated by a transmitter and transmits these signals via the lead-in or transmission line to the primary of the receiver antenna coil. The electromagnetic waves cutting the antenna induce voltages thus causing currents to flow which are amplified by the receiver. Inverted L antenna. This is uh, one of the simplest and most commonly used types of antennas consisting of a horizontally supported wire with the lead in attached near one end. Dipole antenna. This type of antenna is the same as is used in transmitters and consists of two quarter wavelength sections supported horizontally. It gives excellent high frequency response. Loop antenna. The loop antenna is used with many portable and home broadcast band receivers because it is highly directional. It is also used in direction finding equipment. Selection and installation. Noise, signal loss, frequency response and directivity are the four factors which must be considered when selecting and installing an antenna. The TRF receiver. The TRF receiver is the type of receiver you will study first. You will recall from introduction to receivers that the TRF consists of an RF amplifier, a detector and an audio amplifier. So that you may have in mind the goal towards which you are working, shown below are the circuit diagrams of the two TRF receivers you will learn about. The TRF receiver with the regenerative detector, RF amplifier, regenerative detector, audio amplifier. The TRF receiver with the plate detector, RF amplifier, plate detector, 
audio amplifier. The RF amplifier stage. Every TRF receiver contains one or more stages of RF amplification. Uh -huh. Greater selectivity and sensitivity obtained by using more tuned RF stages. Tetrode, pentode, antenna coil, RF coil, RF transmitters, the gimmick. Perhaps you'll recall some references made in RF amplifiers to the Q of a resonant circuit. This Q, which is equal numerically to the reactance of the coil divided by its resistance, determines both the selectivity and the voltage gain that can be obtained from a resonant circuit. In order to keep the selectivity high, it is therefore necessary to use RF transformers whose resistance is fairly low. Another important consideration is that of shielding. Unless RF transformers are shielded by means of copper aluminium shields grounded to the chassis of the receiver, there probably will be undesirable coupling and the production of unwanted oscillations. It should also be noted that shielding changes the inductance and Q of a coil. Consequently, uh, any receiver adjustments, such as the alignment process, which will be described shortly, should be performed with the shields in place. Band switching, gain capacitors and alignment, receiver out of alignment, trimmer capacitors and coils, uh, receiver in alignment, Grid bias, manual volume control, analysis of the RF amplifier, physical power, electrical power, what the audio power amplifier does, AF amplifier tone control circuits, method of tone control in audio amplifiers, <clears throat> audio frequency amplifier volume control, okay. Notice that the detector is coupled to the AF amplifier by means of resistance capacity. Eh. Analysis of the AF amplifier circuit. Uh, components. Capacitor couples audio frequency amplifier to preceding detector stage. 330 ohm resistor provides cathode bias. Capacitor bypasses signal around cathode. Uh, Okay. Since most radio receivers will encounter, you will encounter, contain both RF and audio free amplifiers, you must possess a clear understanding of the differences between them and the advantages and disadvantages of each. The following comparison should serve to clarify your conceptions of radio frequency and audio frequency amplifiers. Alright, RF amplifiers, designed to amplify frequencies above 20 kilohertz, uh, usually have tuned circuits, thereby adding selectivity, usually coupled to other stages by RF air core transformers. Precede the detector stage, are designed for voltage amplification, if triodes are used they lack stability and must be neutralized, generally employ variable mu pentodes. Audio frequency amplifiers, designed to amplify frequencies between 15 cycles and 20 kilohertz, are untuned and do not add selectivity of set, coupled to other stages by AF iron core transformers or by resistance capacity coupling, follow the detector stage, designed for power amplification, very stable and not likely to oscillate, if triodes are used, no neutralization is required. Generally employ triodes, beam power tetrodes, and power pentodes. What the detector does, the process of detection, the crystal detector, and it'll probably be the diode detector, yep. And schematic of a grid leak detector, an oscillator plus a grid leak detector, a regenerative detector, how the regenerative detector works, Arrangement to vary coupling between tickler and grid control. Regeneration control employing a variable capacitor. Regeneration control employing a variable resistor. How the regenerative detector works continued. Uh, regenerative de detector is a continuous wave, trans re continuous wave receiver. This continuous wave is picked up by the heterodyne detector. Ordinary detector, heterodyne detector. Dip da da, no sound. The uh, heterodyne principle, 
the oscillating detector, analysis of the regenerative detector circuit, components, functions, review of detectors, crystal detector. You have become acquainted with the basic principles of operation of four important types of detectors. We will now review the basic circuits and operating characteristics of each type. Crystal detector. Low sensitivity, poor selectivity, good fidelity, low reliability, capable of handling strong signals, simple and economical to operate. Diode detector. Low sensitivity, poor selectivity, excellent fidelity, high reliability, capable of handling strong signals, capable of supplying, uh, of supplying ABC voltages. Grid leak detector, high sensitivity, poor selectivity, low fidelity, moderate reliability, easily overloaded by strong signals, plate current decreases when a signal is received. Regenerative detector, extremely high sensitivity, excellent selectivity, very poor fidelity, low reliability, easily overloaded by strong signals. How the plate detector works, grid voltage, grid bias, plate current, plate detector, incoming signal, plate signal, audio out. How the plate detector works, continued, receiving, employing a plate detector. Okay, so we've got uh, various stages of amplifier talking about the components and their function and now we're up to the super heterodyne receiver introduction the super heterodyne receiver is the most popular type of receiver in use today practically all commercial home radios are of this type you will find either a super heterodyne circuit or a TRF circuit in practically every piece of electronic equipment that contains a receiver. This includes radar, sonar, communication gear, any device that picks up and receives a signal. Knowing the TRF receiver gives you a good start toward learning the Super Heterodyne because it uses all the basic components of a TRF with three additional units. See the block diagram of a Super Heterodyne showing the three uh, additional units. Mixer, local oscillator and intermediate frequency amplifier which are in addition to to the basic TRF circuit. Okay. I think this is still AM stuff though, amplitude modulation. At high frequencies, the TRF receiver does not work as well as it does at lower radio frequencies. Above 20 megahertz, a conventional RF amplifier does not have the necessary, sens necessary sensitivity and selectivity. The super heterodyne receiver avoids the difficulties encountered with the TRF at high frequencies by converting the selected signal frequency to a lower intermediate frequency which can be amplified more easily. Super het receivers make use of IF, intermediate frequency. This means greater sensitivity, greater selectivity. Uh -huh. The ganged tuning capacitor keeps the local oscillator tracking the tuned RF. RF amplifier stage. Radiation from a super het receiver may re reveal the location of a ship. RF amplifier stage continued. Local oscillator. Uh, typical operating frequencies. Uh, local oscillator continued. Perfect tracking. Uh, gang capacitors with section. Okay, uh, how the mixer stage works. Intermediate frequency transformer, IF amplifier, how the detector works, the detector and first audio circuits, how automatic volume control works, how automatic volume control works. Uh, detector and first audio amplifier, uh, how the beat frequency oscillator works. It will be recalled from the topic entitled TRF receivers regenerative detector that in order to receive continuous wave signals on a regenerative detector it was necessary to make the detector oscillate. The frequency of these oscillations differed slightly from that of the incoming signal in order to produce an audio frequency signal by the process of heterodyning. In super het receivers this is often accomplished by means of a separate BFO or beat frequency oscillator capacitively coupled to the diode detector. The BFO may be a Hartley oscillator tuned to 
a frequency one kilohertz above that of the intermediate frequency. Thus, if the input frequency is 456 kilocycles, the frequency of the BFO is 557 kilocycles and a one kilohertz audio signal will be produced by the diode detector. The uh, frequency of the BFO is variable over a small range, making it possible to vary the pitch of the resulting beat note until the satisfactory tone is produced. Complete schematic of the superheterodyne receiver. The stages shown below include a mixer, local oscillator, one intermediate frequency amplifier, a diode detector, an audio voltage amplifier, an audio power amplifier, and a receiver. Analysis of the local oscillator stage. The local oscillator, uh, mixer stage, intermediate frequency amplifier stage, diode detector and first audio amplifier, uh, what alignment is, uh, how does the superhead circuit have to be tuned to give the greatest gain for each dial setting. One, the IF transformers must be tuned to the fixed IF frequency. The RF tuned circuit must be tuned to the frequency on the dial. The local oscillator must be tuned to give an output at each setting of the main dial that is above or below the dial setting or the RF frequency by a difference equal to the IF frequency. The alignment procedure, what sensitivity measurements are, uh, direction of signal injection, various amplifier stages, demonstration, aligning the IF section. Okay, adjust, 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 aligning the, the uh, okay, okay. Uh, then we're at the end of the superheterodyne receiver. Review of the superhet receiver. Superheterodyne, a type of receiver in which the RF signal is converted to a lower frequency RF and then amplified before detection. It is much higher, it has much higher sensitivity, selectivity, and stability than the TRF mixer. This is the key circuit in a superhet. It takes the RF signal and beats it against the signal generated by a local oscillator. The, result, uh, the resultant constant frequency signal is lower in frequency than the RF and thus is easier to amplify. Local oscillator. This circuit is tuned simultaneously with the RF tuned circuits in such a way that its output frequency is always 456 kilocycles greater or less than the frequency of the signal being received. Its output is combined with RF signal in the mixer which thus always needs a constant frequency signal to the intermediate frequency amplifier. IF amplifier, the section of the superhet which amplifies the mixed frequency signal coming from the mixer. Its input and output are usually coupled by transformers in which the primary and secondary are tuned. This results in high selectivity. Detector and AF amplifier. These circuits perform the same functions as in the TRF receivers. In the superhet, the diode detector is often combined with the first audio frequency amplifier stage. Review of such super. Okay, so this is still going on the review. Uh, automatic volume control. This circuit compensates for variations in signal strength. Uh, a diode uh, rectifies the negative half of the signal and feeds the DC output to the RF and IF amplifier grids. When the signal increases, the diode output increases, thus putting more negative bias on the RF and IF amplifiers and lowering their gain. Tracking. When the difference between the local oscillator frequency and the RF signal frequency is constant over the entire range of the superhet, it is said to have perfect tracking. This is never achieved in practice. Beat frequency oscillators. This is an oscillator used when it is desired to receive continuous wave signals with the superhet. Its output is tuned close to the frequency of the intermediate frequency and is fed into the detector. It beats with the incoming signal producing a beat note in the audio range. With a BFO, a continuous wave signal is heard as a pure tone. Without the BFO, CW signals are heard as a soft hiss or not at all. Image frequencies. If the intermediate frequency is 456 kilocycles, then two signals, uh, one at 456 kilocycle above the other, 
uh, the other 456 kilocycle below the oscillator frequency will both send a signal through the IF amplifier and to the loudspeaker. One of them is the desired signal, the other is an image. The purpose of a tuned RF coil and tuned RF amplifiers is to eliminate the image frequency. Review of the troubleshooting method. Inspect the equipment. Troubleshooting by signal injection, troubleshooting the superheterodyne circuit, power supply, audio amplifier, detector, intermediate frequency amplifier, mixer and oscillator, vacuum tube testing, uh, emission type tester, transconductance type tester, review of receivers, antenna function. The purpose of a receiving antenna is to pick up electromagnetic waves radiated by transmitting antennas. These waves in cutting the antenna induce voltages in it, causing a current to flow. The current flows into the input of the receiver where it generates a signal which is amplified by the receiver circuits. Directional characteristics. The position of a receiving antenna relative to the transmitting antenna will determine the strength of signal that it picks up. If a loop receiving antenna is broadside to a loop transmitting antenna, the signal picked up will be of maximum amplitude. If the loop is turned so that its edge faces the broadside of the transmitting antenna, a very weak signal will be picked up. Therefore, the antenna is said to have directional characteristics. RF amplifier stage. An RF amplifier stage in a receiver improves the sensitivity and selectivity of the receiver. The added sensitivity is due to the amplification of the desired signal and the added selectivity results from the use of tuned circuits which discriminate between the desired and undesired signals. Audio amplifier stage. An audio amplifier stage in a receiver amplifies the detected audio signal. Audio stages which precede the large stage are voltage amplifiers whose sole function is to increase the amplitude of the audio to the level where it is large enough to drive the last stage. The last stage, called the power stage, supplies the large current variations necessary to drive the speaker. Detectors. The function of a detector in a receiver is to remove the audio component from a modulated RF signal so that it can be amplified by AF stages. A simple detector consists of a tuned circuit, a rectifier and a filter. Such a detector is called a diode detector. Grid leak detectors. This type of basic this type is basically a diode detector with amplification added. Uh, the grid and cathode form the diode detector and the grid acting as the plate. The rectified signal developed across the grid leak resistor is amplified in the plate circuit. This detector is more sensitive than the diode type. Regenerative detector. This modified grid leak type is still more sensitive. A feedback loop in the plate is coupled to the grid coil to provide regeneration, thus effectively increasing the gain of the stage. Plate detector. This detector employs a triode or pentode based near cutoff. The rectification takes place in the plate circuit since the negative half of the modulated RF grid signal drives the tube into cutoff. TRF receiver. This receiver employs RF amplifiers and detector and audio frequency amplifiers. The tuned circuits are gang capacitor tuned. A shortcoming of the TRF is that since the tuned uh, circuits are not fixed tuned. Constant sensitivity and selectivity cannot be realized over a tunable band. RF stages detector audio frequency stages. The TRF receiver. All tank circuits gang tuned. Superheterodyne receiver. The aforementioned disadvantage of the TRF is overcome in the superhet uh, receiver in which all desired RF signals are converted to the same fixed lower signal called the intermediate frequency where the signal is amplified by fixed tuned circuits before it is detected. To accomplish this, the superhet incorporates a mixer, local oscillator and intermediate frequency amplifier in addition to the usual TRF stages. 
obtaining the IF signal. Uh, the fixed IF signal is gotten by mean by beating the incoming signal with the signal from a local oscillator which is always a fixed amount away from the incoming signal. This is accomplished by gang tuning the oscillator and the RF amplifier so that the difference between the RF tank resonant frequency and the oscillator tank resonant frequency is constant for all settings of the tuning dial. The oscillator tank resonant frequency is said to track the RF tank resonant frequency. Automatic volume control. The super hat receiver incorporates an AVC circuit whose function is to equalize the receiver output for both strong and weak incoming signals. It does this using a filter circuit which charge, charges up to the DC level of the rectified RF wave. This DC voltage negative with respect to ground is then applied as bias to the grids of the IF mixer, mixer and RF stages, all of which employ variable mood tubes. In this way, the bias voltage and therefore the gain of the stage is directly related to the intensity of the received signal. Aligning. When aligning a super hit, the IF stages are adjusted first, then the trimmers and of the RF tuned circuits and local oscillator are adjusted at the high end of the band. The adjustment of the low frequency end of the band is made with the patter capacitor. What you have learned. You have just completed the course in basic electronics. Look back on the weeks you have spent studying these materials. What, the weeks? <laughs> the hours, buddy, the hours. Um, what should you be able to do with the information you have now? If you can recognize the three basic electronic circuits, the rectifier, amplifier, and oscillator in a schematic diagram, if you understand how each component functions within these circuits and what part of the entire circuit plays in a piece of equipment, then you know your stuff. These are basic to all electronic equipment. The rectifier circuit, the amplifier circuit, and the oscillator circuit. Index to volume 5. And I think we've got a, a, a bonus. Oh, that's a bit... Oh, it's dusty in there. Hmm. Let's get one of my brushes. I think there's another volume, volume six. It's a bonus. I'm gonna just enjoy my coffee for a bit. I'll be back in a second. All right, there's another preface. This is the preface to volume six. In its relation to basic electricity and basic electronics, the subject of transistors and FM fundamentals marks the most important addition to the Common Core program since its inception. Beginning in 1953, when it was first adopted, and persisting until the present time at U.S. Navy specialty schools, the Common Core program in electricity and electronics has been the means for instruction of over 100,000 naval technicians. Results have been so outstanding as to attract the attention of the world. Consequences are not limited to naval technician training. Since released to civilians in 1954, thousands of industrial and commercial, commercial personnel, high school, college and after hours students have enjoyed like benefits and as an implementing medium for the National Defense Education Act of 1958, these training tools will continue to improve the country's technical education and accelerate its growth. Overflowing the boundaries of the United States and Canada, the Common Core program has also taken solid root overseas. Many military as well as industrial and commercial organizations and civ civilian educational school systems have seen its advantages and adopted this program in various translated forms as a ready-made stepping stone for raising the level of technical education in foreign countries. Common Core program has been described as pointing the way to the future and con constitutes a distinct departure from the classical methods of technical education and tech textbook production. Its primary objective is to prepare a person to apply technology in a real job situation and it concentrates on making technical education interesting and comprehensible without the usual prerequisites of high mathematics, physics and the like. 
the free world must foster technical education among its people and this simple volume on transistor solid state physics and FM techniques is an efficient medium for the extension of working knowledge on these subjects in those countries where the Common Core program has been introduced. A number of the processes, devices and circuit arrangements described in this book are proprietary. The fact that they have been included does not imply that information is available without permission for use in design, manufacture or sale. It is presented here solely for educational purposes. No one having part in the preparation or publication of this volume will be responsible for any liability resulting from the unlicensed use of this material. For authorization to reproduce their design, special appreciation is extended to the Radio Corporation of America and to the Heath Company, subsidiary of Daystrom Incorporated. When Common Core materials were released by the US Navy in 1954, it was the intent that fundamental technical knowledge be placed within the grasp of men and women who would employ it for their own benefit and that of their country. In 1959, it is hoped that the addition of this volume on transistors and FM fundamentals will further the Navy, Navy's original objective. New York, New York, September 1959. Table of Contents. Volume 6, Basic Electronics, Solid State Electronics, Semiconductor Diodes, Transistor Construction, How a Transistor Operates, Commercial Transistors, Transistor Circuits, Transistor Super Heterodyne Receiver, Fundamentals of Frequency Modulation, FM Transmitters, Antennas and Wave Propagation, FM Receivers. Transistors and Semiconductor Diodes. So this all happened in the late 50s. Solid state electronics. Brief history of transistors and semiconductor diodes. Now, tomorrow. Now, transistors and semiconductor diodes are replacing vacuum tubes. Tomorrow, they will result in advances in domestic illumination, industrial illumination, electronic power generation. The vast new field of solid state electronics is represented by the transistor and the semiconductor diode, the first commercially available devices. These new devices are undoubtedly the most important developments in present day electronics. The semiconductor diode is a highly perfected development of the crystal detector used in the early radio receivers of 1906. This new device can detect, mix and rectify alternating current signals with excellent efficiency and has a wide variety of important new applications. The transistor was discovered in 1948 as a result of extensive studies of the operation of semiconductor diodes. Its name was de derived from the words transfer resistor, which describes the phenomenon which enables a completely solid device to amplify electrical signals. Within the next few years, these two devices will extensively replace vacuum tubes in many types of existing equipment, and they will be employed in a wide variety of domestic, transportation, industrial, scientific, and military equipments, which do not employ electronics at present. This is not only the significance of transistors and semiconductor diodes, as perfected representatives of the field of solid state electronic devices, they give a preview of new solid state devices which are now in various stages of development. These devices will result in great advances in domestic and industrial illumination, electric power generation, conversion of electric power to mechanical motion, computer memory storage, ultra high speed data transmission, detection and measurement of physical and chemical changes, electronic ignition and a variety of other aspects affecting our domestic and industrial life. Brief history of transistors and semiconductor diodes continued. The work of the early investigators resulted in the atomic theory. Much investigation and experimentation was necessary before there could be any concept of the possibility of semiconductor diodes and transistors. The work of Volta, Ampere, Gauss, Faraday and Hertz had to be accomplished and understood. The discoveries that had been made in electricity raised many problems concerning the nature of matter. 
are astronomical investigations by Galileo, Tycho, Kepler and Newton also led to a great curiosity concerning the nature of matter. Investigations into matter itself by Romford, Davy, Carnot, Young, Fresnel, Maxwell, Hertz, Zeeman and Lawrence led to more questions than answers. The first real breakthrough to the modern concept of matter came in 1897 when Sir J.J. Thompson Hey, it's JJ, it's Sir JJ, yeah. Uh, Sir JJ Thompson discovered the electron while studying electric discharges through rarefied gases. Thompson's discovery was rapidly verified by other investigators. In 1913, Bohr evolved the basic theory of atomic structure, and that theory has developed to our present day concept of the nature of matter. According to this theory, all materials consist of various combinations of some. 100 different types of atoms. The atom is defined as the smallest unit into which an element may be divided before it loses its physical and chemical identity. Regardless of its specific element identification, any atom consists of a positively charged nucleus around one or more negatively charged electrons rotate. The electrons rotate in orbits which make up rings or shells located at various distances from the nucleus. The number of electrons in the various rings or shells are characteristic of the specific element to which the atom belongs. The electrons in the inner rings or shells have nothing to do with the ability of an atom to enter into chemical combinations with other atoms or to exhibit its various electrical characteristics that is determined only by the electrons in the outer ring. The electrical characteristics of an atom are determined by how tightly the nucleus holds onto its outer electrons. If the outer electrons are easily stripped off the atom by a low voltage electric field, the material will conduct a large amount of current, and the material is known as a conductor. If a very large electric field is required to strip the electrons of the atom, the material is known as an insulator. Uh, the material which is used in transistors and semiconductor diodes and in most solid state physics applications is known as semiconductor material. This term is a general one and applies to all materials having an electrical resistance falling in the range between conductors and insulators. The materials which are of greatest use in present day transistor applications are germanium and silicon, the characteristics of which will be considered shortly. Interest in semiconductors began in 1873 when it was discovered that rods and wires of selenium uh, exhibited a decrease in electrical resistance when struck by sunlight. It was demonstrated that this was due to the presence of light and not due to heating, which normally resulted in an increase in electrical resistance. Later investigators found similar effects in other materials, but the change in resistance was so small that no practical applications could be found. The next significant development concerning semiconductors was in 1906. At that time, a variety of crystalline semiconductors were used as detectors of radio signals. Materials used for this purpose included uh, galena, lead sulfide, silicon, iron py pyrites, and carbodanum. Carbodundum. Carbodundum. Ah, the most common detector arrangement consisted of a piece of crystalline uh, galena uh, in contact with a short length of flexible wire known as a cat whisker. This device known as the crystal detector was used in the circuit arrangement shown in the diagram. This setup permitted the reception of radio signals since the crystal acted as a rectifier which permitted easy current flow in only one direction. The first semiconductor detector radio the crystal set the success of the crystal detector was short-lived the thermionic valve more properly known as the vacuum tube popularly known as the vacuum tube in the United States was developed and is served as a much more uh, reliable detector than <coughs> Uh, and it served as a much more reliable detector than the crystal arrangement. In addition, vacuum tubes could amplify the detector output signal to an amplitude and power level sufficiently high to drive the loudspeaker. During World War II, radar was in 
a continuous state of development. One of the most important problems in radar was the detection of its extremely high frequency radio signals. Improvement in locating small targets required increase in radar frequency and each increase in frequency caused new problems in the vacuum tube first detector mixer stage as new types of vacuum tubes were developed for the purpose but eventually a frequency limit was reached beyond which the vacuum tube mixers would not operate. Crystal mixers were tried and the silicon semiconductor type was found to be the most successful. Improved types of this mixer are widely used today in microwave radars. While crystal mixers are, were being developed, a variety of semiconductor materials were investigated. One of, of the silicon and germanium were found to have very interesting properties and these were investigated very extensively and systematically as soon as the war was over. In 1920, the crystal detector is replaced by the vacuum tube. In World War II, the vacuum tube mixer is replaced by the crystal mixer. One of the first developments was a diode detector made of germanium. This detector was used in radio, television and miscellaneous electronics applications, but there was only a very limited need for a detector of this type. During the development of germanium detectors, a very important discovery was made. It was found that when two very close electrical contacts were made with a piece of germanium, the current flow through one of the contacts affected the amount of current through the other contact. This effect was found to be similar in, uh, to the signal amplification occurring in a vacuum tube, except that no heated cathode and no vacuum was required. An enormous amount of experimentation was conducted with this arrangement at the Bell Telephone Laboratories. The result was that in 1948 there was announced the development of the first solid state amplifying device, the transistor. This discovery led to a new interest in semiconductor diodes and their perfection led to the development of a wide variety of important new uses. The discovery of the transistor variable resistor, battery, electrical contacts to germanium, germanium chip battery, current meters, small change in this current resulted in a large change in this current. Okay, 10 years of progress. <sighs> yeah, wow, cool picture. So, learning about transistors and semiconductor diodes is the first step in preparing for future important work in the field of solid state electronics. Extremely conservative predictions indicate that within the next 10 years, this field will encompass a broader and larger volume of applications than is contained today in the entire area of vacuum tube electronics. To give some idea of the progress that can be expected in the field of solid state electronics, make a survey of the impact that transistors alone have had upon our industry and technology. The first successful transistor was produced in 1948 at the Bell Telephone Laboratories. Ten years later, transistors were successfully used to relay to Earth, to Earth information collected by the missile launch satellites and space vehicles. Transistor sales amounted to about $70 million and in the next year the sales rose to just under $100 million. Conservative estimates indicate that by 1968 total sales of transistors will exceed $500 million with the total production quantity of over 500 million transistors. Note that these figures do not include the cost of the equipment into which these transistors will be installed. Semiconductor diodes which are closely related to transistors are expected to have sales level exceeding that of transistors. Introduction to solid state electronics. Transistors will be used in computers, uh, the, the military applications, automatic data transmission, complete automa automation systems. It should be completely obvious to those who are interested in transistors that their efforts in learning about these new devices will be greatly rewarded. Today there are enormous opportunities for interesting and important work in the fields of transistor and semiconductor diode applications. These opportunities will be multiplied vastly in the field of solid state electronics that is just beginning to be developed. 
it may be asked why transistors are so important today since most of the major developments are yet to come. At the present time, the most important aspect of transistors is their replacement of vacuum tubes in a wide variety of applications. About 65% of the present day transistors are used in the field of entertainment and domestic applications. About 25% of the transistors are used in the industrial and commercial fields and about 10% of the transistor production goes to military applications. In a few years, transistors will become well established in fields where vacuum tubes have only a tentative foothold today. These fields include industrial controls, complete automa automation systems, computers, and automatic data transmission systems. It is expected that there soon will be an enormous expansion of the use of transistors in military applications. There may be some question as to why transistors are being accepted so widely as replacements for vacuum tubes. There are six basic advantages that transistors have over vacuum tubes. These advantages are outlined briefly in the paragraphs that follow. First, transistors are extremely small in size, ranging from the dimensions of a sub-miniature vacuum tubes down to less than a quarter of that size. This small size permits the miniaturization of equipment, which is of great convenience in the entertainment and industri industri industrial fields and of vital importance in military applications. Uh, second, transistors are inherently capable of performing their function for an indefinite period of time without deterioration of operating characteristics, as is the case with vacuum tubes. Third, transistors have a much lower power consumption than vacuum tubes. The reason for this is that transistors operate without the need for the heated cathode that is required by vacuum tubes. Heating the cathodes of vacuum tubes accounts for a large portion of the power requirements of vacuum tube equipment. These large power requirements make it difficult to produce portable battery-powered vacuum tube equipment that has a reasonably long operating time. With transistors, the same equipment can be made not only lighter and smaller, but the operating time can be in the order of five times longer. Uh, fourth, transistors require lower B plus power supply voltages from 10 to 75 volts as compared to 75 to 350 volts generally required by vacuum tubes. Use of these lower voltages reduces the filtering, hum, shielding and voltage rating requirements of the power supply. The low in lower insulation requirements permit the use of RLC components significantly smaller in size than those used in conventional vacuum tubes tube equipment, permitting the miniaturization of transistorized equipment. Fifth, when transistors reach the mass production level presently held by vacuum tubes, it is expected that their prices will be lower than the equivalent tube. At the present time, the average transistor retail price is between $2.50 and $3. By 1964, it is expected this average price will be from $0.50 cents to a dollar. When this stage is reached, there will be no longer any considerations of higher transistor costs to retard their use in equipment. 6. A transistor circuit is generally simpler and requires fewer components than an equivalent vacuum tube circuit. When this feature is combined with the small size and low power requirements of transistor circuit components, it permits the construction of subminiature equipment and subminiature modules for larger equipment systems. Since mass production can be used to provide such modules at low cost, they can be made available to simplify the task of keeping equipment in operation. They provide means for the speedy and economical replacement of complete sections of the equipment rather than going through the slow and henceforth costly process of trouble, localization and component replacement. Ah. Simplified diagram of germanium crystal structure. Outer electron nucleus and inner electron. To understand how transistors and semiconductor diodes operate, it is first necessary to become familiar with the characteristics of the basic and modified materials that are in use. The basic materials in commercial use are purified germanium and silicon, which have been processed specially to the crystal state. These materials are excellent insulators because the crystalline structure structure very effectively bonds in place all of the outer electrons which would normally be free to enter into current flow. The diagram shows a simplified picture of a pure crystalline semiconductor material which is such as a germanium or silicon. The, each atom has four outer electrons which are shown as small minus signs. The inner electrons which are bound to the nucleus in the nucleus itself are shown as single solid black dot. 
because of the crystalline structure the nuclei are aligned in a symmetrical arrangement and each outer electron shares an orbit with one outer electron from a neighboring atom it is this orbit sharing arrangement which effectively locks each electron in place and not any usually strong bond between the electron and its nucleus for an applied voltage to cause electron current flow would have to be sufficiently high to break the electron bonds before these electrons would be free to flow towards the positive voltage terminal in breaking these bonds the voltage would also destroy the crystalline structure since no electric current will flow through the pure crystalline material described that material must be modified to obtain a controllable amount of electric current flow one method of obtaining current flow is to add a small number of atoms which have five outer electrons atoms which are suitable for this <coughs> purpose include phosphorus antimony and most frequ frequently arsenic uh, these atoms are distributed through the pure basic material as it is being processed into the crystal state and the resulting structure is shown in the diagram. The proportion of impurity atoms added is the order of one part per hundred million. A larger proportion produces a current flow that is not precisely controllable. The impurity atom enters into the structure in the same manner as the atoms of the basic material. The one important difference is that the outer, the extra outer electron of each impurity atom remains unbonded to the crystal structure. If a DC voltage is connected across the ends of a piece of such material, those unbonded electrons are free to flow through the crystal structure toward the positive terminal. The total number of unbounded electrons in the crystal always remains the same. Each electron that leaves the crystal at the positive terminal is replaced by one that enters at the negative terminal. As a result, there is a continuous flow of current. Since the current flow in this material consists of excess negative particles electrons the material is known as an excess or n-type semiconductor <sighs> n-type semiconductor current flow in n-type semiconductor simplified diagram of n-type semiconductor germanium atom impurity atom unbonded or excess electron impurity atom okay There is another method of modifying the pure basic crystalline material in order to obtain a controllable amount of electric current flow. During the processing of the basic material, impurity atoms, Im impurity atoms such as aluminium, boron or indium are added in small amounts. These impuri impurity atoms have only three outer electrons and they enter into the crystalline structure as shown in the diagram. Comparison of the diagram with that of the pure basic material shows that the modified structure has a missing electron for each impurity atom. The space in the structure caused by the missing electron is known as a hole. Note that the hole is not necessarily located in the immediate vicinity of the impurity atom. The, uh, during processing, the impurity atom attracts a nearby by outer electron to fill the gap in the surrounding uh, crystal structure and the hole moves elsewhere. A succession of outer electrons may leave their nuclei to fill the gap and the hole may move a considerable distance before it reaches a state of equilibrium. If a DC voltage is connected across the ends of the piece of such a material, the hole has the characteristics of a positive charge that flows towards the negative terminal of the voltage source. The total number of holes in the crystal always remains the same. Each hole uh, that receives the negative end of the crystal is neutralized by an electron which leaves the negative terminal and enters the crystal. This gives the crystal an excess negative charge. A neutral charge is regained by the crystal when it discharges an electron to the positive voltage terminal and creates another hole. The new hole flows toward the negative terminal and the result is the continuous flow of holes through the crystal and a continuous flow of electrons through the connecting wires. Since the current flow in this material is caused by defects or holes in the crystal structure and these defects simulate positive charges, the material is known as defect or p-type semiconductor. The p-type se uh, semiconductor, direction of electron flow, 
direction of whole flow, current flow in p-type semiconductor, simplified diagram for p-type semiconductor, germanium atom, impurity atom, uh, and purity atom, missing electron hole. There you go. Uh, making a grown p-n junction. So, uh, cut germanium bar, grown n-type germanium rod, grown p-type germanium rod, uh, pulling and rotating force, uh, sealed container, molten germanium, induction heating coil, crucible, case, wire lead, n-type, p-type, simplified diagram of grown junction diode. A semiconductor diode consists essentially of p-type and n-type semiconductor materials in close contact with each other. There are two basic types of semiconductor diodes in use today, the junction and point contact types. There are several fundamental variations of each basic type which should also be considered at this time. Two different types of junction constructions are in common use. In one type the junction is grown into the diode, in the second type the junction is formed by diffusion. A simplified diagram is shown of the arrangement for making a grown junction. A crucible containing pure germanium is suspended inside a sealed container which can be evacuated or filled with inert gas. An induction heating coil is used to heat the germanium to the melting point. To begin the formation of the diode, an n-type impurity is added and it diffuses through the melt. A small bar cut from the single crystal germanium is dipped down to touch the surface of the melted germanium and then it is slowly withdrawn and rotated. The melting germanium solidifies at the point of contact with the solid bar and the withdrawing process causes the growth of a rod of n-type germanium. This rod is actually a single perfect crystal with a diameter in the order of one inch. Uh, the junction is formed after the rod is grown to the length of about half inch. Sufficient p-type impurity is added to neutralize the n-type impurity and to convert the germanium to p-type. Withdrawing process is continued and the remainder of the rod is of p-type germanium. The entire rod is a single crystal germanium and, uh, and the only difference is the type of impurity in the two halves. The p-n junction region is cut out of the rod and is diced up into as many as a hundred or more small junctions. Each piece has wire leads fused or soldered to it and as and the assembly is mounted in a container which gives mechanical protection and isolated from contaminating atmospheres. Uh, making an alloy junction, uh, indium disc, n-type germanium plate, uh, heating, okay there are several methods of making junction diodes by diffusion. The alloy junction method of construction has been widely accepted because it lends itself to product uniformity and quantity production techniques. In this method, a small disk of p-type material, indium, is placed on a somewhat larger flat plate of n-type germanium. The materials are placed in a graphite holder and heated to a temperature of about 500 degrees. Uh, the indium disk melts at about 155 degrees and upon reaching the higher temperature it dissolves away some of the germanium beneath it. A germanium indium alloy is formed. In the molten region the indium neutralizes the n-type impurities in the germanium and leaves an excess of p-type impurities. After being subjected to heat for several minutes the equilibrium condition is reached and no more dissolving action takes place. The amount of p-type germanium that is formed is determined by the temperature and the size of the original indium disc and the time is unimportant. This fact is important in achieving product uniformity. Once the equilibrium condition has been established, the assembly is allowed to cool very slowly. The dissolved p-type germanium begins to recrystallize out of the alloy onto the n-type germanium base. The recrystallization follows the same atomic arrangement as in the n-type germanium base and a uniform p-n junction is formed. After the assembly has cooled, electrical connections are bonded to the germanium base and to the indium disc. The assembly is mounted in a small container and the alloy junction semiconductor diode is complete. The point contact type of construction assembles that 
of uh, resembles that of the crystal detector used in early radio receivers. It consists of a pointed wire pressed into contact with a small plate of semiconductor material. The assembly is sealed in a small container in much the same manner as the junction types. Platinum alloy, tungsten, phosphor bronze and other types of wire are used to make the contact. Several bends are made in the wire to give it a spring-like shape which presses the point against the semiconductor surface. It is the flexible nature of this wire that is the reason for it being called a cat whisker. The pressure applied must be sufficient to hold the point in place without motion. The semiconductor plate usually consists of either P-type silicon or N-type germanium. It was stated previously that a semiconductor diode consists basically of a junction between P and N-type semiconductors. On first examination, there appear to be no P and junction in the point contact construction. To be completely objective about the matter, the operation of the point contact diode is not very well understood. There are a number of fairly involved theories on the subject which are too complex to be reviewed here. In one way or another, regardless of the various special assumptions that are made, these theories boil down to the fact that there is something in the point contact region that operates in a manner similar to PN junction. One verification of this theory is the fact that the N-type germanium diodes using this construction generally operate better than uh, better after forming. Forming consists of passing a large pulse or current through the diode. After forming, the point of the cat whisker is found to be bonded to the semiconductor plate. Uh, the heavy current apparently melts the semiconductor material in the region of the point. This rapid melting and cooling apparently causes a localized conversion of n-type material to p-type material and a p-n junction is formed. The reason for these conversions are difficult to explain but exacting tests demonstrate that the conversion does take place. Thus, for the purposes of this book, it is sufficient to explain the operation of all semiconductor diodes on the basis of a PN junction. The manner in which uh, such a junction operates will be described in the pages that follow. Simplified construction of a point contact diode. Connecting wire, uh, plate of N-type germanium or P-type silicon, cat whisker, connecting wire, case. Operation of a PN junction. Semiconductor diodes consist basically of junctions between N and P semiconductors. The net effects which take place in at a junction of this type are equivalent to the results produced by a diode vacuum tube. Uh, this equivalence can be demonstrated by comparing the results of connecting a DC voltage across a PN junction and across a diode tube. First consider the results when the positive and negative terminals of the voltage are connected uh, respectively to the plate and cathode of the tube and to the P and N semiconductors. In the tube, electrons flow from the negative voltage terminal to the cathode, through the vacuum, to the plate and onto the positive voltage terminal. In the diagram of the junction, electrons are shown as minus signs and holes are shown as plus signs. Holes in the p-type material flow away from the positive voltage terminal towards the negative terminal. And electrons in the n-type material flow away from the negative voltage terminal towards the positive voltage terminal. At the junction, there arrives a continuous flow of holes from, the one, di from one direction and a continuous flow of electrons from the other direction. When the electrons meet the holes at the junction, they neutralize the charge on each other. This neutralization of charge permits the formation of more holes on the positive side of the uh, p-type material and the entry of more electrons into the negative side of the n-type material. All the requirements of a continuous current flow are met and such a continuous current flow does take place. The direction of current flow in the connecting leads of the semiconductor diode is the same as for those of the vacuum tube. The polarity used for connecting the applied voltage is shown as forward bias and is also known is known as forward bias and is also known as the direction of easy current flow. <coughs> when the positive and negative terminals of the voltage source are reversed with respect to uh, those of the previous arrangement, a completely different set of conditions take place. In the vacuum tube circuit, the plate is negative with respect to the cathode. Since the electrons emitted by the cathode are negatively charged, they are repelled by the negatively charged plate. No current flow takes place in the connecting wires. 
in the PN construction, holes in the P-type material are attracted towards the negative voltage terminal and electrons in the N-type material are attracted towards the positive voltage terminal. This biasing arrangement has no provisions for the flow of current carrying holes or electrons to the junction and no current flow can take place in the connecting wires. Actually a very small amount of current does flow through the connecting wires. Uh, the reason for this is that N-type material does contain a small number of holes and P-type material does contain a small number of electrons these charges are able to flow in the direction required to maintain a steady current flow as described for the forward bias condition. Uh, the reason for the existence of these stray charges is not due to a defect in the manufacturing process but due to the breakdown of a few bonds in the crystal structure due to thermal agitation. As the temperature increases, the number of these stray charges increases and the current increases. Since the polarity used for connecting the applied voltage is the opposite of that used in the forward bias condition, this method of connecting is known as reverse bias and it is known as reverse current connection. Reverse bias arrangement for reverse current flow no current flow in diode tube very small current flow in PN junction ah okay fair enough so it's none in the tube but a little bit in the in the semiconductor characteristics of semiconductor diodes current flow characteristics of vacuum tube diodes It has been shown that the amount of current flow through a semiconductor diode varies in an outstanding manner when there is a reversal in the polarity of the biasing voltage. It is now necessary to find out the details of the relationship between current flow and biasing voltage. A comparison with the corresponding vacuum tube characteristics will help to clarify the unusual current flow characteristics of a semiconductor diode. In your study of diode vacuum tubes, there was a review of arrangement used to learn about the plate voltage, plate current characteristics of a diode vacuum tube. In essence, the plate to cathode voltage is varied while a current meter is used to measure plate current. The corresponding plate currents and plate voltages are plotted on graph paper and the result is a curve such as that shown in the diagram. The heated cathode emits electrons which collect in a space charge around the cathode. When the plate is made negative with respect to the cathode, no current flows from the cathode to the plate because the negative plate repels the electrons. Current flow, current cannot flow from the plate to the cathode since the plate does not emit electrons. When the plate and cathode are at the same potential, the plate neither attracts nor repels electrons. The current remains at zero. Uh, when the plate is made slightly positive with respect to the cathode, a small portion of the electrons are attracted out of the space charge and flow to the plate and through the outside circuit. As the plate is made increasingly positive, the current flow becomes larger. Eventually, the current flow is so large that electrons are attracted to the plate as fast as the cathode can emit them. Further increase in plate voltage causes no further flow of the plate current and a state of saturation is reached. When the same procedure is used to study the voltage and current characteristics of a semiconductor diode, somewhat different results are obtained. Shown here is a typical voltage current curve for a junction diode. Examination shows that it's quite different from the curve of a typical diode vacuum tube, but the same genera general type of rectifying action is obtained. The first view of the, the, the first review the characteristic curve of the junction diode. When voltage is applied in the forward direction, the current varies as shown by the solid line curve. Note that only a few tenths of a volt are required to cause a current flow in the order of 100 milliamps. Further increase in uh, forward voltage causes the current rise that is almost linear in relationship to the applied voltage and the maximum rated current is reached before one volt is applied. Uh, when voltage is applied in the reverse direction, the current varies as shown by the dashed line curve. Uh, large increases in voltage cause only very small rises in current. In fact, the current is so low that a different set of uh, graph scales is required to show the change. The extremely small current flow is due to the fact that there are very few current carriers under reverse bias conditions and once all of these current carriers are flowing, a state of saturation takes place. 
this state of saturation does not continue indefinitely as higher reverse voltages are applied more current begins to flow eventually a condition is reached where the diode resistance drops very rapidly and a very large reverse current uh, increase takes place with no further increase in reverse voltage damage to the diode can be prevented by conducting away the heat generated by decreasing the reverse voltage the reverse voltage at which this effect takes place is called the Zener voltage named after the man who predicted this effect this effect is useful only in certain specific applications typical current flow characteristic of junction diode shown here is a voltage current curve of a typical point contact diode the curve has many similarities to that of the junction diode considered previously but there are several significant differences to be considered First, the rated current flow in the forward direction is only a small fraction of, the, of that obtainable from the junction diode. The reason for this is that the active junction area in the point contact construction is much smaller than that in the junction diode. Second, the reverse current flow is several times larger than that of the junction diode. In addition, the reverse current does, increasingly steady, uh, does increase steadily with reverse voltage and there is no sharp saturation effect as in the case of the junction diode. Third, a different effect is obtained as the reverse voltage is increased. Instead of the Zener effect described for the junction diode, there is a turnover effect. At the turnover voltage, the internal resistance of the junction appears to become negative rather than dropping to zero. Therefore, the current increases very rapidly and continues to rise even through, even though the reverse voltage is lowered. There is no satisfactory explanation for this effect and it is not useful in practical applications since the diode is destroyed when the effect occurs. <clears throat> there you go. Typical current flow characteristics of point contact diode. Typical constructions. Commercial semiconductor diodes. Uh, shown on this page are pictorial diagrams of the various types of semiconductor diodes that are available from commercial sources. It can be seen that there are a wide variety of physical constructions available. Included among these are ceramic jackets with metal ends, glass tubes with metal ends, or gold glass jacket, plastic cases, plastic coated metal cases, and metal jackets with screw mounting. Some of these outward variations are due mainly to the preferences of the individual manufacturer. Other features have a specific function, such as the screw mounting, which may be employed to dissipate the heat generated by power rectifiers. Although not always obvious, without close examination, many of the semiconductor diode cases are marked with an arrow. The arrow indicates the direction of, of easy current flow as indicated by a DC ammeter. The reason for this method of marking is that it permits technicians and repairmen a positively reliable method of checking the connection required. This eliminates the necessity for deducing this information from a schematic diagram, which may be confusing in some special cases. Many schematic diagrams indicate semiconductor diodes marked to correspond with this arrangement. Single rectifier, this is applications of semiconductor diodes. A single rectifier, uh, rectifier type AC voltmeters and the four rectifiers. It's a bridge rectifier. Semiconductor diodes have great flexibility of application. They can be used in all those applications where dry metal rectifiers and vacuum diode vacuum tubes are presently employed and they have some unusual applications of their own. The advantage of using a semiconductor diode as a replacement is that it generally is smaller, more efficient and operates at significantly higher frequencies than a tube or dry metal rectifier and no filament power is required as in the case of the tube. The most elementary semiconductor diode circuit is the one you learn about in your study of AC meters in volume 3 of basic electricity. This circuit makes it possible for a basic DC voltmeter circuit to be used to measure AC voltage. The simplest arrangement contains a resistor, rectifier and DC meter movement. Electron flow indicated by the black arrow passes through the meter movement and causes the pointer to move upscale. This electron flow results in one half cycle of the line voltage. 
the electron flow resulting from the alternate half cycle of the line voltage is shown by the white arrows. Although only pulses of current flow through the movement, the pointer cannot move rapidly enough to follow the rise and fall, and the average value of the current pulses is indicated. The resistor is often marked. Is he talking about pulse width modulation? I'm not sure. I'm going to go have a break. I'll be back in a minute. I'm back. <sighs> I'm just going to continue from here. Uh, the simplest arrangement contains a resistor, rectifier, and DC meter movement. <sighs> what are we talking about? I'm going to go back up to the top here. Semiconductor diodes have great flexibility of application. They can be used in all those applications where dry metal rectifiers and diode vacuum tubes are presently employed, and they have some unusual applications of their own. The advantage of using a semiconductor diode as a replacement is that it is generally that it generally is smaller, more efficient, and operates at significantly higher frequencies than the tube or dry metal rectifier, and no filament power is required as in the case of the tube. The most elementary semiconductor diode circuit is one you learned about in your study of AC meters in volume 3 of basic electricity. This circuit makes it possible for a basic DC voltmeter circuit to be used to measure AC voltage. The simplest arrangement contains a resistor, rectifier and DC meter movement. Electron flow indicated by the black arrows passes through the meter uh, movement and causes the pointer to move upscale. This electron flow results from one half cycle of the line voltage. The electron flow resulting from the alternate half cycle of the line voltage is shown by the white arrows. Although only pulses of current flow through the movement, the pointer cannot move rapidly enough to follow the rise and fall, and the average value of the current pulses is indicated. The resistor is often made adjustable so that the pointer reading can be made to correspond with that of a precision meter. If a semiconductor diode is used as a rectifier, the meter can be calibrated at power line frequencies and will give accurate voltage readings without a correction factor at all frequencies up to thousands of megacycles. The AC voltmeter circuit considered above presents a low resistance to one half cycle of the applied voltage and a high resistance to the alternate half cycle. This is of no consequence in measuring voltages in power circuits. In audio frequency and radio frequency circuits, however, this lack of uniform loading may cause inaccurate readings and disturb the operation of the circuit. By adding a second rectifier to the circuit, the half cycle that is not used is presented a low resistance path around the meter and fairly uniform loading is achieved. A bridge circuit of four rectifiers can be used, as shown in the diagram, so that both half cycles of the AC current flow through the meter in the same direction. This results in a balanced load to both half cycles of current. Other applications of semiconductor diodes include their use in power supply circuits. In such applications, semiconductor diodes have the advantage of being rugged, long-lived, small in size, and capable of large current output. Only recently, semiconductor diodes were made were more expensive than equivalent dry metal rectifiers and there was a limited selection of types available for large power output. At present, semiconductor diodes are often used in preference to the dry metal types because of the savings in size and efficiency and because there is little difference in cost. If semiconductor diodes are to be used in power supply circuits, the half-wave rectifier and bridge rectifier circuits are the most common. Uh, these types are equivalent to the meter circuits described previously. The purpose of the resistors in series with the rectifier is to prevent excessive current flow from damaging the rectifier, as would occur in the event of a short circuit or overload in the equipment to which the rectifier is connected. Either an RC or an LC filter may be placed between the rectifier and the load. Also available for use is the voltage doubler circuit shown in the diagram. This circuit was explained in detail in Volume 1 of Basic Electronics 
and only a brief over review will be included here. The voltage doubler consists of two half wave rectifier circuits. Uh, during one half cycle of the line, the upper diode cons conducts and charges the upper capacitor to peak line voltage. During the alternate half cycle, the lower diode conducts and charges the lower capacitor to peak line voltage. Since the two capacitors are charged in series with the DC output terminals, the DC output voltage is equal to twice the peak of the line voltage. For a 115 volt line, the DC output voltage is approximately 320 volts. B plus power supplies voltage doubler. Wow. Uh, in receiver circuits, the semiconductor diode can be used as an efficient mixer or detector. Examples of both of these circuits will be considered now. Shown in the diagram is a very simple type of semiconductor diode mixer. This mixer operates well through the broadcast television and microwave bands. It is not used frequently in the broadcast or television band since its gain is less than one. The significant and significant gain can be obtained by means of vacuum tube or transistor mixers. At microwave frequencies, however, the semiconductor diode mixer operates efficiently where other circuits fail. When the circuit is in operation, the local oscillator applies a constant voltage to the rectifier. The result is a constant flow of current through the semiconductor mixer, a current flow consisting of unidirectional uh, pulses at the frequency of the local oscillator. Also applied to the mixer is the incoming RF signal from the antenna. Heterodyning action takes place in a manner similar to that of a standard mixer circuit and the output of the mixer consists of four different frequencies. The frequency of the RF signal from the antenna, the local oscillator frequency, the sum of these <coughs> incoming signals and the difference between these incoming signals. As in the case of a standard mixer, the IF transformer is tuned to only the different signal and amplification of the modulated signal takes place at the lower frequency. In detector applications, the semiconductor diode circuit is essentially the same as in the vacuum tube circuit and in the meter circuit considered earlier. When the amplitude modulated IF signal is rectified, the result is a pulsating unidirectional current which carries an intermediate frequency signal component and an audio signal component. The IF signal component is bypassed to ground by a capacitor which is too small to bypass the audio signal component. The result is that the audio signal component is applied to the input of the audio amplifier and detection has taken place. Hmm. Ah, what do we got here? Checking semiconductor diode forward characteristics. Circuit for checking diode forward characteristics. The purpose of this experiment is to show you the outstanding characteristics and basic application of semiconductor diodes. A number of components and items of equipment are required and these are clearly marked in the diagrams referred to on this page. The first part of the experiment is designed to demonstrate the forward and reverse voltage current characteristics of semiconductor diodes of the junction and point contact type. To begin, make the connections shown in the forward characteristics diagram shown here but do not connect the diode to the circuit. Set the potentiometer to make the voltmeter the reading equal to zero. Connect a junction diode into the circuit as shown in the diagram. By turning the potentiometer slowly, increase the forward voltage in steps of 0.1 volt and plot the corresponding current readings on a sheet of graph paper. Do not exceed the maximum current rating indicated on the data sheet accompanying the diode. The completed graph will show that less than 1 volt is required to cause maximum rated current flow in the forward direction. Reset the potentiometer for a zero voltage reading and repeat the experiment with a point contact diode. As the results are plotted on a second sheet of graph paper, it will be seen that the results are similar to those obtained with the junction type, except the slightly higher voltages are required. 
to complete the first part of the experiment, make the connections shown in the reverse characteristics diagram at right. Set the potentiometer to make the voltage reading equal to zero and connect the junction diode into the circuit. By turning the potentiometer slowly, increase the reverse voltage in steps of 10 volts. Plot the corresponding uh, current readings on the sheet of graph paper previously used for the junction diode do not exceed the maximum current rating indicated on the data sheet accompanying the diode. If the Zener voltage described on page 619 is reached, immediately reset the voltage to zero. Uh, the completed graph will show that reverse current increases very slowly with the applied voltage depending upon the maximum current rating of the particular junction diode that has been selected, the Zener characteristics may or may not be visible. Reset the potentiometer for a zero voltage reading and repeat the experiment with a point contact diode. Plot the results on the sheet of graph paper previously used for this diode. Be careful not to approach the turnover voltage too slowly because this will destroy the diode. The complete curve will show that reverse current increases very slowly with the applied voltage although somewhat more rapidly than in the case of the junction diode. The second part of the experiment demonstrates the rectifying capability of the semiconductor diode. It is this property which is fundamental to all applications of this diode. Connect a junction diode with a seri <coughs> in series with a 100 kilo ohm resistor across source of 6 volts AC uh, with an oscilloscope examine the voltage waveform present at points A and B. Before the diode at point A the full sine wave of the AC voltage is visible after the diode at point B a half wave rectified waveform is visible. This demonstrates that the diode conducts current in one direction only and is equivalent to in function to a dry metal or vacuum tube rectifier. Substitute a point contact semiconductor in the circuit and the same results will be obtained. Review of semiconductor diodes. Semiconductor materials. Purified crystalline germanium and silicon are the basic materials commonly used in semiconductor diodes and transistors. These materials are excellent insulators because the crystalline structure bonds all the outer electrons in place. N-type semiconductor. Uh, semiconductor material can be made to conduct by adding impurity atoms which enter the crystalline structure but which have excess outer electrons which are not bonded to the structure. Current flow is conducted by the excess negatively charged electrons which flow through the crystal to the positively charged terminal. P-type semiconductor. Conduction can also be obtained by adding impurity atoms which do not have sufficient outer electrons to fill all the crystal bonds. The unfilled spaces or defects are known as holes and have a characteristic of positive charges. An applied voltage causes the holes to flow through the crystal, crystal to the negatively charged terminal. Junction diode. A junction diode consists of P and N type semiconductor materials in close contact. The junction can be formed during the crystal growing process, grown junction, or formed by dissolving and recrystallization process, alloy junction. Uh, point contact diode. A point contact diode consists of a plate of N or P type semiconductor material in contact with a pointed metal wire. The contact region can be regarded as a PN junction. Forward bias. The PN junction biasing arrangement shown is known as forward bias. Only several volts are required to cause all holes and excess electrons to flow to the junction and result in maximum rated current flow. Reverse bias. When the junction biasing connections are the reverse of forward bias, all holes and excess electrons flow away from the junction and do not enter into a continuous current flow. Only stray holes and electrons can enter into a continuous current flow. High voltages are required at the, and the maximum current is only a small fraction of that obtained with forward bias. Semicon semiconductor diode applications. Semiconductor diodes can be used in all applications suitable for vacuum tubes or dry metal rectifiers. The circuits with which you are familiar include meter rectifiers, power supply circuits, mixers and detectors. Basic construction point contact type. Simplified construction diagram of point contact transistor. Okay, so we're up to transistors now. 
So we've got a protective case, a cat whisker, a base, emitter, base collector, simplified construction diagram of point contact transistor, emitter, collector, base, electrical symbol. There are two basic types of transistor construction in use today. These include the point contact and junction types. Both of these have a number of variations. Only the basic construction of the most common variation are shown here and the details are sufficiently fundamental to apply to the production differences introduced by the various manufacturers. The point contact construction is the earliest and is no longer in widespread use. The arrangement is similar to that of point contact diode with a second cat whisker in contact with the germanium block. It is necessary that the two point contacts be separate, separated in the order of a few thousandths of an inch apart, otherwise the desired operation cannot be obtained. As in the case of the point contact diode, a simple explanation of the principles of operation requires the quite valid assumption that there is a PN junction in the region of each cat whisker point. The germanium block is known as the base since it is the foundation to which all the electrical contacts are made. All dimensions of the base are in the order of a few hundredths of an inch. The base material is almost always of the n-type using p-type base material is theoretical theoretically possible but no great success has been achieved in making such an arrangement huh. okay uh, one one of the contact wires is known as the emitter and the other is known as the collector these names are derived from the functions of the two wires at their points of contact with the base when proper voltages are applied, the emitter causes the generation of current carrying charges at its contact point. The collector accumulates current carrying charges at, at its contact point and provides a terminal for conducting electric current through the outside circuit. As shown in the diagram is the transistor electrical symbol. The junction type transistor also consists of a base emitter and collector. Uh, the basic types in general use are made in a manner similar to the grown junction and alloy junction methods of construction previously described in connection with junction semiconductor diodes. In both cases, the result of the manufacturing process is essentially the same. Two PN junctions are formed and they are located several thousandths of an inch apart. Uh, other features of construction are similar to those of the corresponding junction diode. Uh, the diagrams on this page show the major features of both types. Note that in the grown junction type, the semiconductor materials may be arranged in a PNP or NPN sequence. Transistor manufacturers are continuously conducting research in order to achieve greater product uniformity plus speed and economy of production. Present efforts are in our con concern with methods of producing PN junction of easily controlled size and spacing. The alloy junction method shows great promise and automatic machinery is being developed to control precisely the speed up and speed up all stages of the manufacturing process. Simplified construction diagrams of junction transistors. There's a PNP and an NPN. Grown junction transistors. Alloy junction transistors. Surface barrier transistor. Another method in development is to electrolytically etch away two spots on opposite sides of an n-type germanium plate until the etched surfaces are several ten thousandths of an inch apart. Then the electrolytic action is used to plate an indium spot on each etched surface. The result is a surface barrier transistor in which an indium collector and an indium emitter are separated by several ten thousandths of an inch of n-type germanium. Although a complex surface barrier theory is used to explain the operation of this type, the contact area between the indium and germanium has characteristics almost identical to that of PN junction, and the operation of this transistor validly can be explained on that basis. 
in the previous review of basic types it was shown that there are two fundamental arrangements of semiconductor materials used in transistor construction there can be a sequence in which P material is located between surfaces of M material in an MPN arrangement or there can be an M material located between surfaces of P material in a PMP arrangement in either case the transistor is made up of two closely situated junctions of NMP type semiconductors the triode tube circuit and the MPN transistor circuit to be considered now is how either of these arrangements can be used to amplify an electrical signal the operation of an MPN transistor will be described first since, it oper since its operation most closely resembles that of the triode vacuum tube you learned about in volume 2 of basic electronics in the explanations that follow it is important to note that the triode operation is under the control of the signal voltage applied to its input and there is no grid current flow under ordinary conditions of operation transistor operation however depends upon signal current flow through its input circuit and the transistor is essentially a current control device the circuit arrangements used in used to compare vacuum tube and transistor operation are both shown on this page both arrangements are quite similar. Two voltage sources, V1 and V2, are connected across the elements of the uh, tube and the transistor, and appropriate voltage and current meters are connected into the circuit to measure the results. In the triode circuit, electrons flow in the direction shown. They flow from the negative cathode through the retarding negative electric field of the grid to the positive plate and through the outside current back to the cathode. The flow of electrons through the outside circuit can be increased by making the grid less negative and thus reducing the effectiveness of the grid in retarding the flow of electrons from cathode to plate. Similarly, the flow of electrons through the outside circuit can be decreased by making the grid more negative, thus increasing the effectiveness of the grid in retarding the cathode to plate electron flow. Amplification is obtained since a very small change in grid voltage causes a large change in plate current. Since the plate current can be passed through a large plate resistor, the change in plate current causes a large change in the voltage drop across the plate resistor. Thus a small, uh, a small change in grid voltage produces a much larger change in plate voltage and the result is signal voltage amplification. Amplification can also uh, amplification also can be obtained by pressing, passing the plate current through a step-up transformer. In this case, the large change in plate current can be used to generate a large signal voltage at the output terminals of the transformer secondary winding. In a vacuum tube power amplifier, the grid bias is such that the input signal can drive the grid positive for part of the signal cycle. Since a positive grid attracts electrons, there is a flow of current in the grid circuit and power is consumed from the source supplying the signal. The circuit is known as a power amplifier because a small amount of input power can be used to control a large amount of output power. This type of vacuum tube operation more closely resembles that of a transistor. Okay, there's an amplification in a triode circuit. Highly negative grid equals small electron flow equals high plate voltage. Slightly negative grid, large electron flow, low plate voltage. And over here is the similar uh, circuit with the NPN transistor. Small electron flow, small hole flow, large electron flow, large hole flow. To begin an analysis of NPN transistor operation, examine what happens when the emitter to base variable resistor is set to its off position. Now only the collected to base voltage is applied across the transistor. A look at the polarity of the voltage across the PN, PN junction between the base and collector shows a familiar set of conditions. These conditions are identical to those of a semiconductor diode based in the reverse direction. The positive terminal of the voltage attracts 
the negatively charged electrons to the n-type collector and the negative terminal of the voltage source attracts the positively charged holes in the p-type base. None of these current carriers can combine at the junction as they do in the case of the forward biased semiconductor diode. The result is that, on, that the only current flow is that due to the stray holes in the collector and the stray electrons in the base as in the case of the reverse bias semiconductor diode. Under these conditions, the current indicated by the current meters A2 and A3 will be very low, 0.01 milliampere, for example. To continue the analysis, examine what happens when V2 is disconnected and the variable resistor is set to the position of highest resistance. Under these conditions, the emitter and the base are connected as a semiconductor diode based in the forward direction. The electrons in the emitter and the holes in the base are attracted towards a junction where they combine to maintain an appreciable current flow. For example, a 0.1 milliampere of current may be indicated on both A1 and A2 with the variable resistor set to maximum resistance. When the variable resistor is set towards minimum resistance, the current flow through A1 and A2 may increase to 1 milliamp. The conditions change significantly when both voltage sources are connected simultaneously. If the variable resistor is set so that A1 indicates 1 milliamp, A3 will indicate approximately 0.98 milliamp, and A2 will indicate approximately 0.02 milliamp. Uh, there has been no increase in the voltage applied across the base and collector. With no current flow in the emitter to base circuit, A3 indicated 0.01 milliampere. However, with current flowing at the emitter to base circuit, the current through A3 is almost identical to that flowing through A1. The reason for this new condition can be seen by examining, examining the electrical conditions in the region of the base. Because of the forward bias conditions between the emitter and base, there are a large number of free electrons in that region. Because the bias is so thin, several thousandths of an inch thick, electrons penetrate through the base structure and come under the influence of the positively charged collector before they can combine with the holes in the base. Once the electrons are in the collector, they rapidly flow through the positive terminal of V2 and on through the outside of the circuit. Since a small portion of the electrons from the emitter do combine with the holes in the base, there is a small base to emit a current. If the base were thicker, nearly all of the emitter electrons would combine with the base holes, and the result would be a large base to emit a current and a small base to collect a current. The general rule is that the emitter electrons are divided into the two current flows shown, and the proportions of the division are determined essentially by the base thickness and the base to collector voltage. Upon preliminary examination, there may seem to be no advantage to the transistor operation as described, since 1 milliamp of current change in the input circuit emitted to base is required to produce 0.97 milliamp of current change in the output circuit collected to base. There is, in fact, a term, current gain, or alpha, applied to this condition. Current gain is defined as the output current change divided by the input current change. In this case, the current gain is 0.97, and for junction transistors in general, alpha falls in the range of 0.95 to 0.99. The current gain is always less than 1. Although no useful current amplification is provided by this method of connecting a transistor, significant voltage and power gain is produced. To see why this is it is only necessary to compare the current and resistance conditions in the input and output circuits. It was seen that the current in the input and output circuits were almost identical. However, the resistance in the input and output circuits are enormously different. The bias across the emitter and base is in the forward direction, giving the junction between them a low resistance. Such resistances generally generally range from 40 to 800 ohms. On the other hand, the bias across the base and collector is in the reverse direction, giving the junction between them a high resistance. Such resistance generally range from 100 kilo ohms to 1 mega ohm. In basic electricity, you learn that the voltage developed 
across a resistance is equal to the current multiplied by the resistance and you also learn that the power developed in that arrangement is equal to the square of the current multiplied by the resistance since almost uh, identical currents flow in the input and output circuits and since the output circuit resistance is in the order of a thousand times higher than the input circuit resistance it can be seen that voltage and power gains in the region of a thousand times have been produced a very simple mathematical demonstration clearly indicates how voltage and power gain are produced and it also reveals some very useful relationships and fundamental terms the voltage gain in an amplifying device is the output voltage divided by the input voltage or I out times R out divided by I in times R in since I out and I in current gain has already been defined as alpha which is uh, alpha times R out divided by R in for a typical transistor the voltage gain is 1960 times Thus, for a typical transistor connected in the manner shown previously, a voltage gain of about 2,000 times can be achieved. This gain is not due to any current amplification. Instead, it is entirely due to the high resistances in the output circuit as compared with the low resistance in the input circuit. Amplification is achieved because the semiconductor arrangement has transferred a current with almost no loss from a low resistance circuit to a high resistance circuit. This transfer through resistance is the reason that the unit is n is n known as a transfer resistor or transistor. A similar mathematical demonstration shows how power gain is achieved by the transistor. The power gain in any amplifying device is power gain is output power divided by input power or I squared out times R out divided by I squared in times R in equals alpha squared times R out divided by R in. For a typical power transistor, the power gain is 1920 times. Since the ratio between output and input resistance is so frequently used in voltage and power calculations, this ratio has become known as the resistance gain, RG. For junction transistors, resistance gain fall within a range from 500 to 5,000 times. Additional useful relationships can be obtained through the direct use of the current and resistance gains. Voltage gain is uh, alpha times RG and the power gain is alpha squared times RG. Current flow in complete NPN transistor circuit. Oh, that's a PMP. It's the same thing with the PMP. All the previous information presented for the MPN transistor also applies to the PMP transistor. The magnitudes of the emitter, base and collector currents are the same and the same relationship exists for current voltage, resistance and power gains. The major difference to be noted is that in the case of the NPN transistor, the major part of the current flow through the unit is due to the movement of electrons. However, in the case of the PMP transistor, the major part of the current flow is due to the movement of positively charged holes. Because this feature of the PMP transistor, it, it is necessary to reverse the connections of the voltage sources in order to achieve the desired current flow. The diagram shows a PMP transistor connected in an arrangement equivalent to the uh, the diagram shows a PMP transistor connected in an arrangement equivalent to that considered previously. At the junction between the emitter and base, the bias is in the direction of easy hole current flow and holes flow into the base with very little resistance. At the junction between the base and collector, the junction is biased in the reverse direction and there is a very high resistance against the flow of the free current carriers that are normally present in the base and collector. However, since the thickness of the base is several thousandths of an inch or less, the holes from the emitter can penetrate deeply through the base before they combine with the free electrons in the base. Once these free holes come under the influence of the collector, they are attracted towards the negative terminal of the collector voltage source. Consequently, about 98% of the holes from the emitter flow into the collector and only about 2% of the holes flow into the base. Except for the reversal of the voltage sources and current flows, the same relationships exist for the MPN transistor considered previously. 
Note that all commercially available point contact transistors operate according to the same principles as those described for PMP transistor. An unusual feature of these point contact transistors is that current gains alpha up to three times or higher are commonly achieved. No satisfactory explanation for this has been found and the various theories are too complex to be included here. In any event, although the current gain is of some minor assistance, the resistance gain remains the major factor in determining the voltage and power gains. In a typical point contact transistor, the resistance gain is between 65 and 70, and typical voltage and power gains are approximately 175 and 400 respectively. The circuit arrangements described previously indicated how voltage and power amplification could be achieved by means of a transistor. Current amplification also can be obtained and the general method used to accomplish this will be described here. It is characteristic of transfer operation tr sorry it is characteristic of transistor operation that the emitter base and collector can be compared respectively to the cathode grid and plate of a vacuum tube. The circuit considered previously was one in which the current change through the collector was induced by changing the current flow through the emitter. In a vacuum tube this corresponds to changing plate current by changing cathode current. This arrangement was considered first because it is only it is the only circuit that is generally satisfactory for use with point contact transistors and was the only arrangement used before junction transistors became available. With a junction transistor it becomes possible to change emitter current by changing the current flow in the base circuit. This corresponds to a vacuum tube arrangement in which plate current is varied by adjustments in grid current. In the review of the previous circuit arrangement it was seen that the base current generally amounts to less than 5% of the total current through the emitter and collector circuits. By increasing or decreasing the current through the base circuit alone through A2 as shown in the PMP transistor diagram, it becomes possible to obtain much larger current changes in the collector circuit. The reason for this is that the flow of holes through the base emitter junction depends upon the existence of a forward bias in that region. If there is no current flow in the base circuit through meter A2, there can be no forward bias and the base emitter junction and there will be no current flow in the emitter circuit. When the current flow through A2 increases, this indicates the presence of an increasingly strong forward bias at the base emitter junction and both the base and emitter currents will increase greatly. Except for the change in the direction of the bias, the same conditions apply to the NPN transistor. The type of current gain produced in this manner is known as beta current gain. Beta is equal to the change in collector current divided by the change in base current. Typical values for beta fall in the region between 25 through 300 and high beta values are associated with high alpha values. A small change in emitter base current causes a large current change in emitter collector circuit. The illustrations on this page show the outstanding external characteristics of a wide variety of commercial transistors. The internal construction and basic operating characteristics have been described previously. Each transistor drawing has one dimension indicated in inches to give some indication of the relative sizes. Examination of these drawings show that there are a wide variety of shapes, sizes and arrangements of terminals or leads. Except for the fact that, these, that those intended for power amplification are larger and sometimes have flange bases for conducting heat away, the variations in outside characteristics are largely due to the preferences of the different manufacturers. In all cases, the manufacturer's data sheet should be the only guide concerning the recommended operating conditions and lead or terminal identification. Product transistors from are oh, protect protect and transistors from excessive voltage, rapid voltage application, mechanical shock, moisture, bright lights, incorrect bias connections, and heat. Since demonstration and experiments to be 
presented shortly require the use of commercial transistors there will be included here the most important rules concerning their care and handling failure to follow these rules may make a transistor fail in operation or may change considerably its characteristics one unless a transistor is of the hermetically sealed type it should not be used or stored in a damp place do not drop transistors or subject them to unnecessary mechanical shocks although transistors will withstand considerable vibration and shock when mounted in equipment rough handling can often apply even greater mechanical strain some semiconductor uh, constructions are sensitive to light in fact uh, the fact that some transistors may be encased in a transparent structure does not imply that they will not be damaged if examined under a strong light if such units must be used in brilliant light they should be shielded by a covering of black tape or other suitable material before installing a transistor in any circuit check the manufacturer's data sheet be sure to identify the emitter base and collected terminals Check the BIOS and other operating requirements and make sure that the maximum limits will not be exceeded in the circuit. Always switch off the power before making or breaking transistor circuit connections. This precaution is not only for your personal safety but for that of the transistor. Applying voltage to one or two terminals before the others may damage the transistor. Always check the voltage and polarity of the circuit BIOS supplies before connecting a transistor into the circuit. Previous changes in the circuit may apply excess or incorrectly polarized bias to the transistor. Sudden application of voltage in, previous, uh, in previously unchecked circuits may damage the transistor. When the circuit contains controls for increasing or decreasing bias, set these controls to zero bias before connecting uh, the transistor. After the connection is made, raise the bias as slowly to the required operating point. Remember that a transistor is sensitive to heat. Do not place a transistor in hot places or next to hot components. When soldering the transistor into a circuit, use duck bill or other pliers with a uh, wide grasping area to conduct heat out of the lead before it reaches the transistor body. The purpose of this experiment is to make it possible for you to see for yourself the outstanding characteristics of transistor operation. Instead of restricting the experiment to the information presented in the previous pages, the equipment can be used to become familiar with the characteristic curves of transistors. The equipment required includes a junction transistor and a point contact transistor together with the manufacturer's data sheets. Also required are at least three sheets of graph paper, two 0 to 25 milliampere current meters, a 1 to 100 microampere current meter, and a vacuum tube voltmeter with a polarity reversing switch. Two bias supplies, as described in a later paragraph, are also required. In performing the experiment, observe the precautions previously described for the care and handling of transistors. In addition, when plotting the characteristic curves, do not exceed the current values indicated on the manufacturer's curves. To present the curves in their most useful form, it is advisable to use the manufacturer's curves as a guide and to work to rep reproduce these curves during the course of the experiment. In your study of amplifier tubes in volume two of basic electronics, you saw how plate current versus grid voltage curves could be used to study the characteristics of the tube. In addition, load lines can be drawn upon those curves to learn about characteristics of an amplifier stage based upon the use of that tube. Equivalent curves can be made for transistors and they can be used for similar purposes. Since transistors can be connected in a variety of methods, as will be seen later, characteristic curves are identified by the type of circuit arrangement that is used. Transistor curves are also marked with plus and minus signs to indicate the polarity of the voltage developed and the direction of current flow. In marking the direction of current flow, uh, the accepted standard is that indicated by a DC current meter. It is the same as conventional current flow and opposite to electron flow. Pento tube characteristics, uh, plate current and plate voltage and grid voltage. <sighs> Approximate constant current supply. Circuit for plotting collector voltage versus collector current curves. Common base circuit.
an arrangement similar to that first used to learn about the relationship between emitter and collector current can be used to draw up a series of characteristic curves. One addition to this arrangement is the vacuum tube voltmeter, which can be reversed in polarity to measure collector voltage. Another variation is that constant current supplies are almost an absolute necessity for both bias supplies, particularly for the input circuit bias. The reason for this is that the input and output circuits of a transistor are not isolated from each other, and a current change in any one of the elements will affect the current in the other two. Such uh, current changes are undesirable in making characteristic curve measurements, since one of the currents usually must be maintained constant while the other is varied. Any changes in the current that is expected to remain constant requires a readjustment of that current, which makes the measuring process tedious and inaccurate. If no constant current supply is available, an approximation can be obtained by using a high voltage DC supply with the output connection in series with a large value of fixed resistance. The resistance should be at least 100 times higher than that of the trans transistor circuit being supplied. Thus, the current in the circuit is determined by the series resistor rather than the transistor resistance as shown in detail by the diagram. While a 45 volt battery with a 10 kilo ohm resistor, uh, series resistor is adequate for most input circuit applications, this arrangement is not practical for use in collector circuits. Collector voltage versus collector current curves for typical PMP junction transistor common base circuit. In making a plot of the collector current characteristic curves, the emitter current is maintained constant while the collector current is varied. For, ve for each val value, the collector current and collector voltage is measured and plotted on a graph. Once a condition is once a condition of collector current saturation begins for one particular value of emitter current, the process is repeated with another value of emitter current until the complete set of curves is obtained. Note that the procedure is different from the, that used with vacuum tubes where the current is measured while the voltage is varied. <clears throat> when this procedure is followed with a PMP junction transistor, a set of curves such as those shown in the diagram is obtained. Note the resemblance between these curves and those of a pentode vacuum tube shown earlier. It is easy to see that only a small amount of collector bias is required to get all of the available current carriers to the collector and to bring about a condition of saturation. Examination of the curve show that a change in emitter current produces a slightly smaller change in collector current, indicating a current gain alpha of less than 1. Further examination of the curve shows that the collector current does not have to be reduced to zero for the collector voltage to become zero. In fact, when the collector current is reduced to zero, the collector voltage is slightly positive. This means that holes flow from the emitter through the base and into the collector even though there may be a small opposing bias across the base and collector due to the high concentration of holes in the base and the thinness of the base. This is collector voltage versus collector current curves for typical point contact transistor common base circuit. The diagram of 644 bottom indicates uh, similar curves for a point contact transistor. The major difference is that it can be seen that a change in emitter current produces a collector current change three times as large, indicating an alpha current gain of about three times. Also note the lack of reversal in collector voltage. The next diagram shows the characteristic curves of collector current versus collector voltage for different values of base current. The current used to plot such curves is shown to the side and can be recognized as similar to that used to explain the beta gain characteristic of a transistor. Circuit for plotting collector voltage versus collector current curves, common emitter circuit. To plot curves of this type, maintain a fixed value of base current and vary the collector current over a predetermined range. For each value of collector current, record the collector voltage when the collector current begins to show signs of saturation, select another base current and repeat the process. 
examination of the complete family of curves shows that very small changes in base current produce large changes in collector current. It is not unusual for a 25 microampere change in base current to produce a 1 milliampere change in collector current. So that was 25 microamps and 1 milliamp in collector current, indicating a beta gain of 40 times. Now that you are familiar with the basic operating characteristics of transistors, you are ready to learn how transistors can be used in practical equipment. To accomplish this, you will learn about transistor circuits in a sequence similar to that used in learning about vacuum tubes. The process will begin by examining how single transistor stages can be compared to the equivalent single stage vacuum tube audio amplifier. Once that is accomplished, there will be a review of the methods of coupling transistor stages together to make up several types of complete audio amplifiers. Following this will be a review of transistor RF circuits, and this phase of learning about transistors will end with an analysis of a completely transistorized superheterodyne broadcast receiver. In learning about transistor operating characteristics, there were several instances where a comparison was made between transistor and vacuum tube circuits. In these comparisons, it was indicated that the emitter, base, and collector of a transistor could be thought of as corresponding to the cathode, grid, and plate of a vacuum tube. Further comparisons of this type are helpful in bridging the gap between transistor and vacuum tube circuitry. It should be noted, however, that a point will be reached where this comparison ceases to be useful. Better progress can be made at that time uh, by ba basing the explanation of more advanced transistor circuits upon the knowledge gained about the more basic transistor circuits. Your knowledge of vacuum tube circuits is the foundation for learning about transistors. In learning about transistor operating characteristics, two methods were found for obtaining the effects of amplification from a transistor. The circuits that were learned about can be converted easily into practical audio amplifier stages. Actually, there are three methods of obtaining single sing signal gain from a transistor, and these will be presented in a sequence which is based upon your knowledge of vacuum tube audio amplifier stages. The vacuum tube amplifier circuit with which you are most familiar is the one shown in the diagram. In this arrangement, the input signal is applied across grid and ground, and the output signal appears across the plate and ground. Actually, because of the cathode bypass capacitor, the input is across grid and cathode, and the output appears across plate and cathode. Because of the current because of the circuit arrangement, this amplifier is popularly known as the grounded cathode circuit. More correctly, it should be called the common cathode circuit, since both plate current and grid current, uh, when present, uh, flow through the cathode circuit. And since any one of the tube elements may be grounded with, without changing this characteristic. A very brief review of this circuit will clarify the explanation of its transistor equivalent. When the input signal makes the grid more positive or less negative, the plate current increases. The result is an increase in the voltage drop across the load resistor and the plate voltage decreases. When the input signal makes the grid less positive or more negative, uh, the plate current decreases, the result is a decrease in the voltage drop across the load resistor and the plate voltage increases. Since the change in plate voltage is always in a direction opposite to that of the grid voltage, there is a 180 degree phase reversal between the input and output signal. Basic vacuum tube common cathode amplifier circuit. Uh, the equivalent transistor stage resembles the circuit used to learn about beta current amplification. can be seen that the emitter, base, and collector of the transistor correspond respectively to the cathode, grid, and plate of the vacuum tube circuit. Because of the circuit arrangement, this circuit is popularly known as the grounded emitter circuit, although this circuit is probably known as the grounded emitter, although it is more correct to call it the common emitter circuit. The operation... Uh, is the same whether a PMP or MPN transistor is used, although the polarities of the bias voltages would be reversed as shown in the diagram. First consider the operation within an MPN transistor. 
when a positive going input signal drives the base more positive the forward bias across the base emitter junction is increased more electrons flow from the emitter into the base and as described earlier there is an increase in collector current this increase in current results in an increased voltage drop across the load resistor and the collector voltage decreases becomes less positive uh, then the input signal becomes negative now when the input signal becomes negative uh, some of the positive bias on the base is cancelled and the forward bias across the base emitter junction is decreased. Fewer electrons flow from the emitter into the base and there is a decrease in collector current. This de decrease in current results in a decreased voltage drop across the load resistor and the collector voltage increases or becomes more positive. Since the change in collector voltage is always in the direction opposite to that of the base voltage, there is a 180 degree phase reversal between the input and output signal. The same overall results take place when a PMP transistor is used, although all of the bias changes are reversed. When a positive going signal makes the base less negative, fewer holes flow from the emitter into the base and the collector current decreases and the collector voltage increases, becomes more negative. A negative going signal makes the base more negative, more holes flow from the emitter to the base, the collector current increases and the collector voltage decreases, becomes less negative. The outstanding advantage of this circuit is that it produces higher power amplification than the other types to be considered. Disadvantages are that this circuit has the greatest tendency to oscillate and has impedance matching problems that will be considered later basic transistor common emitter amplifier circuits equivalent triode circuit basic NPN common base com common base amplifier circuit equivalent PMP circuit the second basic amplifier arrangement is known as the grounded grid or the common grid circuit in its vacuum tube form in its transistor equivalent, the arrangement is known as the grounded base or common base circuit. This arrangement resembles the circuit used to learn about alpha current amplification. Because of previous coverage of this, uh, coverage of this material, a description of the MPN transistor form of this circuit is sufficient and the operation of the vacuum tube and PMP transistor variations are quite easily understood. When the input signal becomes positive, Part of the forward bias across the emitter base junction is cancelled. The result is a decrease in emitter current and a decrease in collector current. The voltage drop across the load resistor decreases and the collector voltage becomes more positive. When the input signal becomes negative, uh, there is an increase in the forward bias across the emitter base junction. The result is an increase in both emitter and collector current. The voltage drop across the load re resistor increases and the collector voltage becomes less positive. Since the collector voltage rises and falls with the input signal, there is no phase reversal between the input and output signals. The outstanding advantages of this circuit are that it produces the least noise and has the least tendency to oscillate. The amplification produced is not as high as for the common emitter circuit. The third basic amplifier arrangement is known as the grounded plate or common plate circuit in its vacuum tube form. In transistor equivalent, the arrangement is known as the grounded collector or common collector circuit. This arrangement is essentially identical to the single tube phase inverter learned about in your study of audio amplifiers, except that only the cathode signal circuit is used. Just going to have a quick break. Back. Again, because of your familiarity with this circuit and because of previous comparisons, a description of the MPN transistor form is sufficient explanation for all forms of this circuit. When the input signal becomes positive, the forward bias across the emitter base junction is increased. The result is an increase in emitter current and an increase in collector current. The voltage drop across the load resistor, emitter to ground, increases and the emitter voltage becomes more positive. When the input signal becomes negative, part of the forward bias across the emitter base junction is cancelled. The result is a decrease in emitter current and a decrease in collector current. The voltage drop across the load resistor, emitter to ground, decreases and the emitter voltage becomes less positive or more negative. Since the emitter voltage rises and falls with the input signal, there is no phase reversal between the input and output signals. The outstanding characteristic of this circuit is that 
<coughs> as in the case of the phase inverter, the voltage gain is always less than 1, although power gains of over 10 times may be produced. The circuit has input impedances in the order of 250 kilo ohms, and the output impedance is often below 1,000 kilo ohms, or 1, 1 kilo ohm. Uh, this makes the circuit useful for matching high impedance sources to low impedance outputs. As you learned from your previous study of vacuum tube circuitry, there are many common variations of any simple circuit. Not only are these variations due to different methods of drawing the circuit, they are also due to actual differences in the number of components used, in the types of components used, in the wiring of the various components. The fact that there are variations should not lead to confusion because the basic circuit operation is fundamentally the same and the basic circuit can be recognized in spite of the changes. Learn to recognize the basic cir circuit in spite of the variations. To see how this affects the transistor circuit you have learned so far, examine the diagrams in this and the next page. Detail on uh, detail one on this page shows three types of circuit arrangements common emitter common base and common collector detail two shows on shows one variation for each type and the difference is only in the manner the various circuit components are arranged in the circuit to prove that the difference is only one of drawing layout you can check the connections of each component with those in detail one Oh, I see. The drawings on this page <coughs> show five more variations for the common emitter circuit shown in detail, one on the previous page. Similar variations exist for the common base and common collector circuits. Detail 3 shows a second variation of the common emitter circuit. Although there are drawing layout differences, the main difference is that transformer coupling rather than RC coupling is used at the input and output. Detail 4 includes drawing layout differences but the major change is that one biased battery is used instead of two. In transistor applications one battery is often used instead of two. The two different biases that are required can be obtained from a single battery either by means of a voltage divider arrangement as in detail 4 or by means of individual series resistors from the battery to the collector and base as in detail 5. A variation detail 6 shows how the primary winding of an output transformer can be substituted for the battery to collector resistor as shown in that detail is a bypass resistor in the emitter to ground circuit. This resistor is known as a stabilizing resistor it generates a self bias voltage similar to cathode bias which maintains the desired operating characteristics in spite of current variations in the other circuit elements. Detail 7 shows how self bias can be generated by a resistor between base and collector. The base bias resistor increases and decreases the base current as required to maintain stable operation. Basic vacuum tube coupling methods resistance capacitance coupling and transformer coupling. Although large amounts of power, voltage and current amplification can be produced by a single transistor stage, the requirements of practical equipment generally demand even higher amounts of amplification between input and output. In your study of vacuum tube circuits, you gain experience with the amplification requirements of audio amplifiers, video amplifiers and radio receivers. During that study, you learned about the various methods of achieving the needed amplification by coupling together or cascading a number of amplifier stages. The same general methods are used in multiple stage transistor amplifiers. As in vacuum tube amplifiers, the input stage must be impedance matched to the signal input source, the microphone, antenna or signal generator, and the output stage must be impedance matched to the, low, the load. 
the loudspeaker earphones transmission line or meter. The methods that can be used for coupling the amplifier stages to the input source and output load or for coupling amplifier stages to each other include transformer coupling and resistance capacitance coupling. To refresh your memory, the diagrams shown here illustrate these two methods of coupling vacuum tubes. Another coupling method, direct coupling, makes use of a direct connection between the plate of one stage and the grid of the next stage. Since the plate and grid have vastly different bias requirements, complex supplementary biasing must be used to cancel the excess plate voltage from the grid. Because of these complications, direct coupling is rarely used with vacuum tubes. But in transistor circuit, it becomes simple enough for practical use, as will be seen shortly. RC, uh, power loss in RC coupled amplifier. Output resistance equals up to 550 kilo ohms. Input resistance 1 kilo ohm or less. It is true that multiple stage transistor amplifiers are based upon the same general principles as vacuum tube amplifiers and employ the same general interstage coupling techniques. It is not true that such a transistor amplifier can be understood clearly from the facts you have learned about vacuum tube amplifiers. In multiple stage transistor amplifiers, the problem of assembling the various stages together is complicated by the peculiar characteristics of the different types of individual amplifier stages. Both the grounded base and grounded emitter types have input resistances of 1 kilo ohms or lower, and the grounded base type input resistance may be as low as 25 ohms. On the other hand, the output resistances of these stages may be as high as 50 kilo ohms for the grounded emitter type and half a meg for the grounded base type. If resistance capacitance coupling is used in cascading amplifier stages of these types, there is a very large difference between the output resistance of one stage and the input resistance of the next. Your knowledge of impedance matching shows shows you there is a very large power loss in the coupling network between the stages and such losses result in significantly reduced gain through the overall amplifier. To make up for these losses it is sometimes necessary to add one or more stages to the amplifier. Although the use of resistance capacitance coupling results in a large loss of amplification it is simpler and less expensive than the other methods available. Because of these desirable characteristics, several methods have been devised for retaining this type of coupling while partially overcoming the important problem of mismatch. Matching the first amplifier stage to the signal source can be accomplished by selecting a type of amplifier circuit that has an input resistance essentially equal to the source. When the input signal source has a resistance between 25 and 300 ohms, as is the case with many transmission lines, low impedance microphones or phonograph pickups, a common base type of input stage is used. If the characteristic resistance of the signal source is in the range between 300 and 1000 ohms, as is the case with some transmission lines and special transducers, either a common base or common emitter type of input may be used. In the event that the signal source has a resistance in the order of several thousand ohms, a common collector type of input stage is used. A similar technique is used to match the final amplifier stage to the output load. For load resistances below 5 kilo ohms or below 100 kilo ohms, uh, the common collector and common emitter types of output amplifier stages are used respectively. For load resistances above 100 kilo ohms, the common base type of output amplifier is used. Unfortunately, there is no very efficient direct method of transmitting high levels of signal power to a load less than 500 ohms. A transformer is generally required in such cases. In power amplifiers, a common collector stage with its high input resistance, 100k to 350 kilo ohms, and low output impedance, 700 to 25 kilo ohms, can be used to present a fairly good impedance match between stages of the other types. Although the voltage gain is less than one, there is a good power gain about 10 times and the mismatch losses are eliminated effectively. Impedance matching a transistor in transistor amplifiers. 25 to 30 ohm input, common base circuit. 300 to 1 kilo ohm in it, 
input, common base or common emitter circuit, 100k to 500k ohm input, common collector circuit, uh, 100 kilo ohm or higher load, common base circuit, one, uh, one kilo, 100 kilo ohm or lower load, common emitter circuit, 5 kilo ohm or lower load, common collector circuit. Transformers offer the most efficient method of matching transistor stages to their inputs and outputs. Not only is this method efficient, but it is fairly simple, as can be seen in the diagram. Notice that the diagram shows a capacitor placed between the base and the transformer secondary. The purpose of this capacitor is to prevent the bias on the base from being shorted to ground. The reason for the efficiency of transformers is that they can be manufactured to have almost any desired combination of input and output impedances and almost perfect matches can be achieved. I'm just going to take a quick break. Alright, we're almost there, almost there. Just got some, uh, some bits on frequency modulation coming up I think and then we'll be done. Alright, Transformers offer the most efficient method of matching transistor stages to their inputs and outputs. Not only is this method efficient, but it is fairly simple, and as can be seen by the diagram. Notice that the diagram shows a capacitor placed between the base and the transformer secondary. The purpose of this capacitor is to prevent the bias on the base from being shorted to ground. The reason for the efficiency of transformers is that they can be manufactured to have almost any desired combination of input <coughs> and output impedances and almost perfect matches can be achieved. The advantage of the use of transformers is evidenced by the fact that one or two less transformer coupled amplifier stages are required than in resistance capacitance amplifier of equivalent gain. Using transformers has the disadvantage of added cost, space and weight even though mass production techniques are used in manufacturing such transformers and miniaturized models are widely available, it is a rare transistor amplifier that employs transformer coupling exclusively. Direct coupling techniques, as shown in the diagrams, are used in special amplifiers where the phase shift introduced by other coupling methods cannot be tolerated. Direct coupling is also used in the amplification of signals at frequencies too low to be coupled effectively by the previously described methods. Output devices such as meters, relays, earphones and other units can be direct coupled by connecting them in series with the output element of the final amplifier stage. If the device has a high impedance, it can be used in conjunction with the common base and common emitter types and if it has an impedance below 10 kilo ohms it can be connected in series with the output of a common collector stage. Note that in a direct coupled amplifier PMP and MPN transistors may be used in conjunction with each other resulting in the simplified biasing arrangements without impedance matching problems. This method is known as the complementary symmetry circuit arrangement and further examples will be seen in the review of push-pull amplifier arrangements. Three-stage transformer coupled amplifier. Direct coupled amplifier. Cool. Push-pull audio amplifiers. Basic push-pull amplifiers. Vacuum tube type transistor type. There you go. In your study of vacuum tube amplifiers you learn that the power output requirements are sometimes more than can be produced by a single output stage. Under such conditions the power output can be increased by using two tubes in the output stage and the push-pull arrangement produces the highest power output with the least distortion. Shown in the diagram is a push-pull power amplifier with which you are very familiar. In this circuit, the output signal of the previous stage is applied to the 
primary of a transformer. The secondary of the transformer is center tapped and applies equal and opposite voltages to the grids of the push-pull tubes. Because opposite ends of the transformer secondary are applied to the two grids, the signal voltage on one grid is becoming more positive while the voltage on the other grid is becoming more negative. Thus, the plate current in one tube increases while that in the other tube is decreasing. Because the DC plate currents in the output transformer primarily flow in opposite directions, the transformer core is not easily saturated and high operating efficiency can be obtained from the transformer. In audio amplifiers, the power output can be obtained from a single output stage. Employing ordinary transistors is usually limited to well below 100 milliwatts. An output of such a low level is quite adequate for driving earphones, but is normally considered insufficient for use with a loudspeaker. By using a push-pull power transistor arrangement in the final amplifier stage, outputs from 250 milliwatts up to 10 watts can be obtained readily with Class B operation. This is quite adequate for driving the loudspeaker of a portable radio. The transistorized equivalent of the vacuum tube circuit is also shown in the diagram. It can be seen that the two circuits are almost perfect duplicates and the explanation given previously applies equally well to both circuits. It should be noted that the operating characteristics of the two transistors must be carefully matched to obtain efficient operation and low distortion. A unique and useful method of obtaining push-pull operation is by means of complementary symmetry. Circuits making use of this arrangement do not contain many of the coupling components usually required. These circuits uh, operate on the basis that PMP and MPN transistors can be made with equivalent operating characteristics while demanding oppositely polarized bias sources. The arrangement shown here oper operates in a satisfactory manner without either input or output transformers. Both transistor bases are driven without phase reversal by the output signal of the previous stage. The push-pull input effect is obtained because the emitters of both stages are connected to the load. Because of the balanced voltage divider arrangement shown in the left of the circuit, the two bases are equally and oppositely biased with respect to each other. The center resistors are low in value, so there is little loss in signal amplitude and equal signals appear on both bases. The transistor circuits can be recognized to be of the common collector type. Since one circuit is of PNP type while the other is of NPM type, push-pull operation is obtained even though the bases are driven in phase with each other. When there is no signal applied, the currents through the load resistor are equal and opposite and they cancel each other. The biasing selected usually cuts off the collector current when zero signal is applied, giving class B operation for maximum power output. When the input signal becomes positive, the upper transistor does not conduct. However, the lower transistor conducts and current flows from the emitter through the load resistor and into the battery center tap. When the input signal becomes negative, only the upper transistor conducts and current flows from the battery center tap through the load resistor to the emitter. Thus push-pull operation is achieved. Since a common collector circuit is employed, a low impedance output is achieved without a, an output transformer. The negative feedback obtained through the common load resistor balances out small differences in transistor operating characteristics and precise matching of the two transistors is not required. Superheterodyne receiver block diagram. Uh, RF amplifier, mixer, local oscillator, intermediate frequency amplifier, detector, audio frequency amplifier, output.
Now that you are acquainted with some of the outstanding features of transistor audio amplifiers, you are ready to learn about transistor superheterodyne receiver circuits. Because you are already familiar with the vacuum tube version of these circuits, only a brief review of their purposes will be necessary. Superheterodyne receiver antenna picks up a small portion of the transmitted signal and delivers it to the input transformer of the RF amplifier. RF amplifier steps up the amplitude of the signal to which it is tuned and does not amplify signals at other frequencies. Thus the purpose of the RF amplifier is to add selectivity and sensitivity to the receiver. The RF amplifier is often eliminated in tabletop and portable receivers and the antenna signal is led directly to the converter. In the converter, often known as mixer or first detector, the incoming signal is the continuous wave uh, output of a local oscillator um, uh, mixed together. The plate current of the converter is varied according to these signals which are at different frequencies. A beat or different signal appears at the output and this signal is fed to the IF amplifier which is tuned to this difference frequency. The IF signal has the same modulation as the RF carrier and the only change is a lowering of the frequency of the carrier signal. When the RF amplifier and converter or the converter alone are tuned to the incoming signal, the oscillator is also tuned. The tuning is arranged so that the different signal is always at the same frequency and the IF amplifier can be fixed tuned. The IF amplifier is permanently tuned to the fixed frequency signal coming from the mixer stage. Since no variable tuning is required, the IF amplifier is designed for maximum amplification and high selectivity. From one to three IF amplifiers are normally included in the superheterodyne receiver and the intermediate frequency normally used in broadcast receivers is 456 kilocycles. The detector stage, sometimes known as the second detector, receives the output of the IF amplifier. Acting as a rectifier, the detector removes the IF carrier signal and leaves only the audio signal. This audio signal is stepped up in amplitude by an audio amplifier, the output of which drives the earphones or loudspeaker. Vacuum tube immediate intermediate frequency amplifier, transistor IF amplifier, common base circuit, transistor IF amplifier, common emitter circuit. As is the case with their vacuum tube counterparts, transistor IF and RF amplifiers have basically the same design. Also, as in the case of their vacuum tube counterparts, the major design problem in these stages is achieving adequate gain at high frequencies. In both cases, adequate gain is normally accomplished by the use of tuned circuits. The first diagram shows a vacuum tube IF amplifier with its transistor equivalent. The transistor circuit is based upon the common base arrangement. Only two significant differences can be seen in the transistor amplifier. First are the differences due to the change in the bias, bias requirements. Second is the fact that the emitter circuit is connected to a tap on the secondary winding rather than to the end of the, that winding. The purpose of this is to provide a good impedance match between the two stages. The high output impedance of the collector circuit is effectively matched to the high output impedance of the collector circuit. The high output impedance of the collector circuit is effectively matched to the low input impedance of the emitter which follows while maintaining the normal tuning requirements of an IF transformer. As shown, <coughs> also shown is a variation of the transistor IF amplifier. In this two-stage circuit, a common emitter arrangement is used. The major difference here is that the impedance match is accomplished in the transformer primary. Instead of being connected uh, to the end of the primary winding, the collector is connected to a tap on the primary. In addition to the secondary winding, in addition, the secondary winding is untuned, as is sometimes done in vacuum tube circuits. Except for the fact that their frequency range is higher and wider, Transistor radio frequency amplifiers resemble the transistor and radio frequency amplifiers shown in the diagram. To make a variable tuned RF amplifier and variable capacitors add bleh. 
to make a variable tuned RF amplifier the variable capacitors in the diagram should be mechanically ganged and connected to a tuning knob and dial because of the complexities of ganging the tuning circuits of variable tuned amplifiers there is usually only one tuned circuit in such an arrangement oscillator and mixer stages as the case as in the case of vacuum tube oscillators transistor oscillators operate by means of a positive feedback network this arra arrangement takes a portion of the output signal and feeds it back into the input circuit this phase relationship is such that the input signal is reinforced and oscillations take place at a frequency determined by the tuned circuit the basic, principle the basic principles involved are identical to those described in Volume 3 of Basic Electronics. Just as there is a wide variety of vacuum tube oscillators, there are many kinds of transistor oscillators. There are transistorized versions of the Tickler and Hartley oscillators, which are shown in the diagrams. The operating principles are the same in both cases, and the only significant uh, difference differences are those required for maintaining the proper bias on the various elements in addition there are a number of oscillator circuits peculiar to transistors these can always be recognized in a schematic diagram by the fact that each contains a series or parallel tuned circuit with some form of coupling between the input and the output circuit also shown on this page is the schematic diagram of a typical mixer circuit the emitter is frequently biased by means of a bypass resistor to ground and the local oscillator signal is injected into it by means of transformer coupling. The modulated RF signal from the antenna or RF amplifier is coupled to the base. Operation is explained in the same manner as for the vacuum tube mixer in volume 5 of basic electronics. It was also described in the volume how in that volume how a an oscillator and mixer circuit could be combined to make a converter stage which combines the functions of both the transistor version of this stage is shown in the last diagram transistor converter from RF to IF the purpose of this experiment is to examine uh, this is uh, the transistor receiver operation. The purpose of this experiment is to examine a typical battery powered super heterodyne receiver and to observe its operation. Alright. I think we're going to skip that. So they're talking about testing a radio basically. Okay, and here's our review of transistors. Uh, junction transistor. A junction transistor consists of semiconductor materials in an MPN or PMP sequence. The junctions may be formed during the crystal growing process, grown junction, by dissolving and recrystallization process, alloy junction, or by an etching and plating process. Point contact transistor. A point contact transistor consists of a block of N-type semiconductor in contact with two closely spaced pointed metal wires. Their construction can be considered the equivalent of a PMP junction arrangement. Trans transistor amplification. Amplification is achieved because the transistor transfers current from low resistance circuit to high resistance circuit. This function is the reason that the unit is known as a transfer resistor or transistor. Common emitter amplifier. This type of circuit operates in the same general manner as the common cathode vacuum tube arrangement. This circuit has the highest power amplification and the greatest tendency to oscillate. Input resistance is 1 kilo ohm or lower. Output resistance is as high as 50 kilo ohms. Common base amplifier. This circuit operates in the same general manner as the grounded grid vacuum tube amplifier. It produces lower power amplification than the common emitter arrangement and has the least tendency to oscillate. Input resistance may be as low as 25 ohms. Output resistance is as high as 50, 500 kilo ohms. Common collector amplifier. 
This circuit operates in the same general manner as the cathode follower vacuum tube arrangement. The voltage gain is less than 1. Power gains of over 10 times can be produced. Input resistance is in the order of 25 kilo ohms. Output resistance is as low as 1 kilo ohm. Multiple, multiple stage amplifiers. Coupling transistor amplifier stages together involves important impedance matching problems which are solved by transformer coupling or by careful selection of the types of stages used in sequence. The same coupling methods are used in as in vacuum tube amplifiers. Transistor applications. The basic transistor circuits that can be uh, modified to duplicate the functions of all the vacuum tube circuits learned previously. Your knowledge of vacuum tube circuits is of great assistance in identifying the function of the various transistor stages used in complex equipment. And then we're on to the fundamentals of frequency modulation. I'm just going to take a quick break and we'll come back and we'll finish this guy. Alright, so I think we've got a little bit about FM and then we'll be finished our book. <sighs> FM and transistors. Wow. what frequency modulation is. There are four basic methods by which a message can be superimposed upon the RF carrier signal of a radio transmitter. You will review these methods in the paragraphs which follow. In continuous wave transmission, the carrier signal is interrupted or turned on and off with a hand key. The result is the familiar dot dash or dit da signal. Uh, this method is used primarily for long distance communication. The signals can be picked up by communications receivers or by home type receivers uh, to which a special oscillator stage has been added. In modulated continuous wave, MCW transmission, an audio frequency signal of constant amplitude is superimposed upon the carrier. A key is used to turn the carrier on and off as in CW transmission. MCW is used mainly for emergency transmission and the signals can be picked up by home type receivers. <sighs> in amplitude modulation transmission the amplitude of the carrier is varied up and down to correspond with the audio signal generated by means of a microphone. This is the type of transmission picked up by a standard home type receiver. Frequency modulation is another method of transmission used to send voice and other sound signals. The frequency of RF carrier signal is shifted or deviated to a higher and lower number of cycles per second and the rate of deviation is equal to the frequency of the sound signal. The techniques of CW, MCW, AM transmission and reception were reviewed in volumes 4 and 5. The remainder of this volume is devoted to the methods of FM transmission and reception. <sighs> Most applications of FM are based upon one or both of its two outstanding advantages. FM permits the transmission of an extremely wide range of audio frequencies. In addition, it provides almost complete freedom from the annoying sounds produced by natural and man-made interference that are frequently heard coming from AM receivers. These characteristics provide the basic requirements for important military, commercial and home applications. Transmission under noisy conditions. The exchange of messages under tactical military conditions requires clear messaging reception without danger of the content being obscured by noise. This is important in communication between moving vehicles, particularly tanks, where there are very high interference levels produced by a variety of electrical equipments. High fidelity home reception. In commercial applications, there are a number of instances in which instrument outputs and other electrical signals must be transmitted with perfect reception and freedom from interfering noise. One instance is in high-speed, high-quality facsimile transmission of detailed maps, photographs and printed information. In such applications, FM provides faithful reproduction of the required wideband of video frequencies and prevents noise from blotting out the fine details. Perhaps the best known application of FM is its use in high fidelity radio receivers which provide excellent noise free reception of voice and music. 
the high quality sound reception that is obtained with television receivers is due to the fact that the sound portion of the television programs is transmitted and received by FM techniques. It was mentioned earlier that the two outstanding advantages of FM are first that it permits the transmission and reproduction of an extremely wide range of audio frequencies and second that it permits reception that is free from man-made and natural interference. It is entirely practical. It is entirely a practical matter for an FM receiver to reproduce audio signals at 15 kHz or higher without distortion and without noise during a violent electrical storm. Under present broadcasting conditions, an AM receiver cannot reproduce audio signals higher than 5 kHz, and during a violent electrical storm, the static completely drowns out the signal. The audio uh, frequency uh, limitation of AM reception is not inherent in AM transmission, but due to broadcasting regulations intended to restrict the transmitter bandwidth and thereby prevent interference between stations. FM has its disadvantages. For FM to perform its function, the transmitter carrier frequency must deviate over a wide band of frequencies. Although a good quality FM broadcasting, <coughs> although good quality FM broadcasting does not require that the transmitter deviate the maximum allowable limit of 75 kilohertz cycle well, uh, above uh, and below the assigned center frequency. This limit is closely approached by the stations featuring high fidelity FM broadcasting. Frequency ranges of such width are not available in the commercial radio broadcasting band. A commercial FM transmission has been assigned to the region between 88 and 108 MHz. In this frequency band, FM faces the same limitations that are well known to all television viewers. FM reception is essentially limited to locations that are in line of sight with the transmitting antenna and fringe area reception quality varies widely at different times of the day. Other disadvantage of FM is that each transmitter requires a wide frequency band and in the case of closely overlapping bands only the strongest transmitter will be heard. This requires careful assignment of transmitter operating frequencies over the entire country in order to prevent any possible overlap. In the case of fixed stations, the problem need be solved only once. In the case of mobile transmitters, especially in military operations involving large numbers of mobile transmitters, very careful frequency assignment is necessary, and such assignments must be under constant review to prevent interference. Disadvantages of FM Transmitting stations, problems in frequency assignment, obstructing uh, ob objects interfere, no reception, good reception, unreliable reception, no reception. Reception limited to line of sight. A rapid understanding of the nature of frequency modulation may be achieved through a review of the operation of the simplest form of an FM transmitter. Consider an RF oscillator, such as a Hartley oscillator, coupled to an antenna. The antenna, the, sorry, the buffer amplifiers, frequency doublers, and power amplifiers, usually placed between the oscillator and antenna, are omitted for purposes of simplicity. It should be remembered that your previous study, it should be remembered from your previous study of transmitters, that the signal sent out by this arrangement is an RF sine wave carrier signal of constant amplitude. The frequency of this transmitted signal is determined by the setting of the variable capacitor. The frequency increases as the capacitor is set towards its maximum capacitance and the frequency decreases as the capacitor is set towards its minimum capacitance. Assume, for example, that when the variable capacitor is set to the center of its range, the frequency generated is 1 MHz. Uh, to obtain the effect of frequency modulation, the hand or suitable vibrator mechanism may be used to turn the variable capacitor shaft rapidly back and forth about its center position. If the shaft is mechanically oscillated about its center position at a rate of 40 cycles per second, 
an FM receiver tuned to the center frequency will put out a 40 cycle tone from its loudspeaker. If the shaft is turned at a rate of about 400 or 4000 cycles per second, the receiver loudspeaker will put out tones of 400 or 4000 cycles respectively. The tone from the FM receiver loudspeaker is always a duplicate of the rate of carrier frequency shift. <sighs> right. As shown on the previous page, the tone coming from an FM receiver loudspeaker depends upon the rate of the carrier frequency deviation. This is true regardless of the magnitude of the deviation. The transmitter capacitor shaft may be turned by only a small amount to each side of the center position, varying the frequency 1000 cycles above and below the 1 MHz cycle center frequency. On the other hand, the capacitor shaft may be turned at the same rate but by a larger amount, varying the frequency 10,000 cycles above and below the 1 MHz center frequency. In both cases, the same tone comes out of the FM receiver loudspeaker. However, the loudness of the loudspeaker tone increases with the amplitude of the frequency deviation. The tone produced by the uh, plus or minus 1000 cycle shift will be quite low in volume, while the same tone produced by the 10,000 cycle shift will be much louder. Thus, the frequency and loudness of the sound coming from the FM loudspeaker are determined respectively by the rate and amplitude of the transmitter frequency shift. Small capacitance variation to oscilloscope to oscillator. Okay, I think we got that, didn't we? Loudness depends on amplitude of deviation. The FM transmitter just described can be used to transmit tones of any desired frequency and loudness. Since mechanical methods are used to produce frequency shifting, the arrangement is known as a mechanical modulator. While such a system can be used for test purposes, what is required is an arrangement that can be used to transmit voice and other sound signals. To accomplish this, a microphone used in conjunction with an audio amplifier must be able to cause deviations in the transmitter carrier frequency. The rate of the frequency shift must be equal to the frequency of the sound going into the microphone and the amplitude of the frequency shift must be in proportion to the loudness of the sound. One fundamental and very widely used method of accomplish, accomplishing these desired results is based upon the use of a reactance tube. The basic arrangement of a reactance tube FM transmitter is shown in the block diagram. Note that the frequency multipliers and power amplifier normally allow following the oscillator are omitted for the present in order to achieve simplicity. In the circuit arrangement shown, a microphone drives an audio amplifier which by means of reactance tube shifts the frequency of the oscillator. The operation of this system is very much the same as that of the mechanical modulator. In one case, the oscillator frequency is shifted at a rate and amplitude determined by the mechanical arrangement. In the other case, the oscillator frequency is shifted at a rate and amplitude determined by a reactance tube under the control of an audio signal. <sighs> the diagram on this page shows a basic reactance tube circuit. This circuit injects the effect of a varying capacitance into the oscillator circuit. The rate and amplitude of the capacitance change are determined by the frequency and amplitude of the amplified audio signal from the microphone. The circuit operates by changing the capacity of reactance in the oscillator circuit and thereby achieves the effect of varying the capacitance of the tuning capacitor. From your study of capacitive reactants in basic electricity, you know that the outstanding characteristic of this quantity is that the voltage and current are 90 degrees out of phase with each other. The circuit arrangement of the reactance tube causes a condition wherein 
the AC plate voltage and plate current are 90 degrees out of phase and the magnitude of this effect is determined by the audio signal voltage on the reactants tube grid. The AC plate voltage is supplied by the oscillator tank circuit. The DC plate voltage is obtained from the B plus line through RF choke L1 and the B plus voltage is isolated from the reactant circuit by capacitor C2. In order to make the AC plate voltage 90 degrees out of phase with the AC plate voltage, it is necessary to make the AC grid voltage have the same phase relationship. This is accomplished by connecting a capacitor C1 and resistor R1 in series from the plate to ground and by connecting the grid to the junction between the two. In such an arrangement, when low values of resistance and capacitance are used, the AC voltage across the resistor is 90 degrees out of phase with AC voltage across the network. Since plate current is in phase with grid voltage, the AC plate current leads the AC plate voltage by 90 degrees. The effective result is that capacitance has been connected across the oscillator tank circuit. Connecting capacitance across the oscillator tank circuit lowers the oscillator frequency in proportion to the amount of capacitance that is introduced. The quantity of capacitance that is injected into the oscillator tank circuit is equal to the transconductance, GM, of the reactance tube multiplied by the product of the special network resistance and capacitance, C injected equals GM times R1 times C1. It will be remembered from your introduction to vacuum tubes that transconductance is equal to the change in plate current divided by the change in the grid voltage which produced the plate current change. With the plate voltage remaining constant, changes in grid voltage produce changes in place cur plate current. Thus, the transconductance of the tube varies by significant amounts in accordance with the frequency and amplitude of the audio signal. As the transconductance changes, the injected capacitance varies according to the above equation, and the frequency of the oscillator is deviated as described previously. Reactance tube circuits generally employ pentode tubes such as the 6AC7 or the 6SJ7. The value of C is generally between 200 millifarads and 300 millifarads. And the value of R is usually between 500 ohms and 1 kilo ohm. With such an arrangement, the an audio signal from 1 to 2 volt peak to peak on the grid will cause the capacitance injected into the oscillator tank circuit to shift from approximately 100 millifarads to 300 millifarads. Uh, thus, the frequency of the oscillator will shift in accordance with the frequency and amplitude of the audio signal. The reactance tube arrangement has been considered. Oh, sorry, the, the reactance tube arrangement that has been considered is only one of four basic types that can be used. If R1 and C1 are interchanged and the circuit are ver in the circuit, a variable inductance will be injected into the oscillator tank circuit and this causes the desired frequency changes as effectively as the variable capacitance. If a coil L1 is substituted for C1, the original arrangement, the circuit, in the original arrangement, the circuit will inject a variable inductance into the oscillator tank and, in, and interchanging L1 and R1 will inject variable capacitance. Any of these arrangements can be used in an FM transmitter. Inject capacitance, inject inductance, inject capacitance, inject inductance. The purpose of this demonstration is to indicate the outstanding characteristics of the basic reactance tube circuit. In accomplishing this, the outstanding features of FM also will be indicated. The equipment required is a reactance tube connected to an oscillator, an audio signal generator, a pair of 6 volt batteries with a potentiometer connected across them, plus an FM receiver and a CW receiver which can be tuned to the frequency of the oscillator. The first phase of the demonstration is begun by connecting the batteries and potentiometer to the reactance tube input. By adjusting the potentiometer, the reactance tube input voltage can be varied over the voltage over the range of from plus 6 volts to minus 6 volts. 
with the input voltage set to zero the CW receiver can be tuned to the os oscillator frequency when the signal is heard the receiver dial indicates the oscillator center frequency when the input voltage is varied the receiver is returned retuned until the uh, oscillator signal is heard a record is kept of the CW receiver dial settings corresponding to the individual reactance tube input voltages an examination of this record clearly indicates that the amount and direction of oscillator frequency deviation is closely proportional to the amplitude and polarity of the reactance tube input voltage. In the next phase of the demonstration, the audio signal generator is connected to the reactance tube input with the audio input voltage equal to about 0.5 volts at 1 kilohertz the FM receiver is tuned for the loudest signal. After this initial adjustment, the amplitude and frequency of the audio signal input is varied. It is clearly observed that the signal heard from the receiver corresponds to the frequency of the audio signal of the audio signal generator and that the loudness of the signal corresponds to the amplitude of the audio signal. Now that there has been a review of the basic features of a simple FM transmitter, it is time to consider the operating characteristics of commercial FM transmitters. After this, the circuit arrangement of FM transmitters will be analysed in greater detail. Commercial broadcast stations which transmit program material by means of frequency modulation operate within the frequency band from 88 to 108 MHz. In order to prevent interference from stations in the same section of the country, the government has specified that the carrier frequency separation between stations in the same region can be no less than 200 kilohertz. This means that if a station is assigned to a center frequency of 100 megahertz, other regional stations cannot be assigned center frequencies closer than 99.8 megahertz on the lower side or 100.2 megahertz on the high side. There's a diagram here. Minimum frequency separation between FM stations in the same section of the country. Fair enough. It is important to prevent any possible overlap between the frequency shifts of stations with adjacent, adjacent center frequencies. If this should happen, a receiver tuned to one station might also pick up interfering signals from the adjacent stations on each side. To guard against such a possibility, the maximum frequency shift that is permitted is 75 kilohertz on each side of the center frequency. No signal must be transmitted in the frequency band between 75 kilohertz and 100 kilohertz on each side of the center frequency. Thus each station has a 25 kilohertz cycle guard band on each side of its center frequency to prevent interference between stations even though the center frequency of one or both of them may drift slightly. Under actual conditions the 200 kilohertz cycle separation between center frequencies is reserved for stations completely out of range with each other. Since there may be eight or more stations operating in densely populated areas, such stations have their center frequencies separated by 400 kilohertz. This places an unused frequency band of 100 kilohertz between adjacent guard bands. Including the guard bands there is an unused frequency band of 150 kilohertz between the actively used channels. Thus there is a good assurance against interference even though adjacent stations may stray considerably from their assigned operating ranges. Complete basic FM transmitter. Audio amplifier, low frequency, reactance tube, oscillator, Intermediate power amplifier, power amplifier, antenna. 
once the operation of the reactance tube is understood, there is little difference between a basic FM transmitter and the AM transmitters that were reviewed in Volume 4. The block diagram on this page shows a basic FM transmitter, and if the reactance tube is eliminated, it is the same arrangement used in an AM transmitter with modulation introduced into the oscillator. To review the operation of the system, consider the function of each stage, beginning with the microphone. The microphone converts sound waves into a low voltage electrical signal having the same frequency and amplitude characteristics as the sound wave. This low voltage audio signal is fed into the audio amplifier, which steps up the signal voltage to a level suitable for driving the reactance tube. Without the reactance tube, the oscillator generates an RF signal of constant frequency and amplitude. Due to the operation of the reactance tube, the oscillator frequency is shifted at a rate equal to the frequency of the audio signal, and the magnitude of the frequency shift is in proportion to the amplitude of the audio signal. The purpose of the Intermediate Power Amplifier, IPA, is to isolate the uh, oscillator for improved frequency stability and to amplify the RF signal in order to drive the power amplifier efficiently. The IPA also frequently serves as a frequency multiplier. This permits the transmitter to send out the desired frequency while the oscillator operates at a much lower frequency where it can maintain stable operation more easily. It should be recognized that in addition to multiplying the oscillator signal frequency, the IPA also multiplies the oscillator signal frequency deviation. Thus, if the oscillator resting frequency is 30 megacycles with a frequency deviation of 250 kHz and the IPA is operated as a frequency tripler, the IPA output resulting frequency will be 90 MHz with a frequency deviation of 75 kHz. Consequently, the use of frequency multipliers permits the required frequency deviation to be obtained while the oscillator operates at a lower, more stable frequency and with a smaller, more easily obtainable frequency deviation. The purpose of the power amplifier is to increase the power level of the IPA output signal. This achieves adequate power radiation by an antenna to assure good reception within the area being serviced. The power amplifier usually has its input and output signals at the same frequency in order to obtain maximum operating efficiency. The antenna converts the signal delivered by the radio amplifier to the form of an electromagnetic wave that can be re radiated through space. They seem to have included the same the same diagram. Why would they do that? Oh, they're just uh, they're just highlighting different parts. Fair enough. It's the same diagram. Drift stabilized FM transmitter. Sounds technical. The FM transmitter just reviewed is subject to oscillator frequency drift. The most important reason for this drift are the dimensional changes that take place in the oscillator coil and capacitor due to temperature variations within the transmitter itself. In AM transmitters, the most reliable method of preventing this drift is to use crystal oscillator. However, this method cannot be employed in an FM transmitter since the frequency of a crystal oscillator cannot be shifted. To obtain the required frequency deviation while maintaining the necessary frequency stability, it is necessary to make use of a crystal oscillator in an indirect manner. The method is shown in the block diagram. The FM transmitter previously described is used as the major part of the system. To this arrangement are added a crystal oscillator, a frequency converter or mixer, and a discriminator. The frequency converter receives signals from both the power amplifier and the crystal oscillator. The frequency of the mixer output is equal to the difference between the two input signals. Thus, the, input, the mixer output frequency increases and decreases as the power amplifier frequency deviates higher or lower. 
the discriminator output is a frequency stabilizing voltage which rises and falls in accordance with the drift of the power amplifier signal. The operation of the discriminator will be analyzed in detail in the section on FM receivers. The frequency stabilizing voltage is injected into the reactance tube and causes the reactance tube to bring the oscillator back to the predetermined center frequency. Consequently, the overall arrangement detects any drift in the oscillator frequency and corrects that drift. It has been mentioned that an important advantage of FM is that it can be used to transmit audio signals at frequencies up to 15 kHz or higher. The frequencies above 5 kHz contain mainly the upper harmonics of the fundamental frequencies in voice or music. These harmonics are low in signal amplitude, but if, but if they can be reproduced uh, at the receiver, they add the unusually fine quality that is characteristic of FM reception. Since the upper harmonics are low in amplitude, their signal to noise ratio is much lower than that of the signals below 5 kHz. In addition, much of the noise is at the higher frequencies, which would tend to make the high frequency signals unbearably noisy. Pre-emphasis is a method of improving the signal to noise ratio of the high frequency signals so that they can be received without noise. The uh, method of increasing the signal to noise ratio is simply to increase the high frequency gain of the transmitter audio amplifier as shown <coughs> by the curve. Since the audio signal amplitude decreases rapidly with frequency, the amplifier gain must be increased as the frequency rises. The simplest method of obtaining the desired gain characteristic in the audio amplifier is to use a high pass filter in one of the amplifier stages. The most basic circuit which can accomplish this is an RC network shown in the diagram. Circuit operation is based upon the fact that the voltage divider has different characteristics at, different fre at various frequencies. At low frequencies, C has such a high impedance that the voltage division is determined only by R1 and R2. As the frequency increases, the impedance of C decreases rapidly. Eventually, the impedance of C is much lower than R1, and the voltage division is determined by C and R2. The result of the filter voltage dividing action is that the high frequency signals are attenuated much less than the low frequency signals and the desired frequency response characteristics have been introduced into the amplifier. All the FM transmitter uh, arrangements that have been considered up to this point are known as the direct type. In these transmitters, the RF carrier signal is frequently modulate, frequency modulated in the oscillator the original source of the carrier signal. The oscillator frequency is deviated in accordance with the frequency and amplitude of the audio signal and equivalent but multiplied frequency swinging takes place in the stages which follow. Another basic type of FM transmitter is in widespread use. It is known as the indirect type because of the frequency because the frequency deviation is not introduced at the source of the RF carrier signal, the oscillator. Instead, the oscillator frequency remains constant and the frequency swing is introduced in one of the stages following the oscillator. The basic advantage of this method is that the oscillator can be the crystal control type which will maintain a stable center frequency without the need for separate stabilizing circuits. Frequency swinging is not introduced in the same manner as in direct FM transmitters. A method known as phase modulation is used instead. It should be clearly understood that the final output signal of an indirect FM transmitter is the same as the, that produced by a direct FM transmitter. The differences involved are confined to the methods used to obtain the final output signal and not in the characteristics of the output signal itself. The phase modulated transmitter consists of a crystal oscillator, frequency multipliers, IPA, power amplifiers, PA and antenna. Thus a microphone, audio amplifier and audio correction network and phase modulator. The RF carrier signal from the crystal oscillator is stepped up in frequency by the frequency multipliers and the power amplifiers increase the signal power to a level suitable for adequate reception by all receivers within the area being served. The audio signal from the microphone goes 
into the audio amplifier and the signal is amplified to a level suitable to operate the audio correction network and phase modulator. All but these last two circuits are understood on the basis of information reviewed earlier in this and previous volumes. Phase modulated FM transmitter. Audio amplifier, audio correction network, phase modulator, crystal oscillator, IPA, power amplifier, antenna. Uh, advanced tech books. Advanced tech books on the subject of frequency modulation go to great lengths to prove that phase modulation is the equivalent of frequency modulation. Mathematical analysis indicates that when the frequency of an, off of an oscillator is deviated, phase modulation also takes place. And in addition, when the phase of the oscillator signal is shifted, frequency modulation takes place. It is beyond the scope of this book to repeat such a proof, and only a very simple graphic presentation of the similarity will be included here. The first diagram shows a sine wave drawn in a solid line. The dotted curve shows the sine wave which lags 45 degrees behind the solid curve and the uh, dash dot curve shows a sine wave which leads the solid curve by 45 degrees. These curves show that the peaks of a sine wave can be advanced or retarded in time by means of phase shifting. The second diagram shows the result of using a variable phase shift network to smoothly shift the phase of the sine wave while it is being generated. When the phase is smooth, smoothly shifted so that it lags the original wave, the peaks occur later. This is equivalent to increasing the wavelength or lowering the frequency. If the phase is smoothly shifted so that it leads the original wave, see the third diagram, the peaks occur sooner. This is equivalent to shortening the wavelength or increasing the frequency. Thus, smoothly shifting the phase of a signal is equivalent to smooth, smoothly shifting its frequency. A simple form of phase shifting network was analyzed in detail in volume four of basic electricity. This circuit consists of a capacitive or inductive reactance connected in series with a resistor. When a signal of constant frequency is connected across the series combination, the signal output across the resistor is shifted in phase with respect to the input signal. If the resistance is varied, the, ver the phase shift also varies. Under conditions where the resistance is more than 10 times larger than the reactance, the phase shift is essentially equal to zero degrees. As the resistance approaches one-tenth the value of the reactance, the phase shift approaches 90 degrees. The constant frequency RF signal from a crystal oscillator can be applied to the network and its phase can be shifted by varying the resistance. By replacing the resistor with a vacuum tube, the resistance in the phase shift network can be varied in accordance with the amplitude changes in an audio signal of constant frequency. As the audio signal voltage increases and decreases in amplitude, the tube plate current rises and falls. Uh, rises in the plate current are equivalent to lowering the plate resistance of the tube, and this causes a maximum shift in the phase of the input RF signal. Decreases in the plate current are equivalent to raising the plate resistance of the tube, and this causes a minimum shift in the phase of the RF signal. The input RF signal. Thus an RF signal of constant frequency such as that coming from a crystal modulator can be phase shifted in accordance with the amplitude of an audio signal of constant frequency. There are many variations of this arrangement but they all involve changing either the reactance or resistance in a circuit of this type. In actual practice a single circuit of this type cannot produce a sufficient amount of phase shift and four or more similar arrangements are connected in cascade to produce the required equivalent frequency deviation. It was shown that with the phase modulator, the amount of carry 
carrier signal phase shift is in proportion to the amplitude of the audio signal. This is equivalent to saying that the extent of the equivalent frequency deviation is in proportion to the amplitude of the audio signal. Because of the sensitivity to the circuit of the circuit to phase changes, a change in the frequency of the audio signal causes additional phase shift in the RF carrier signal. In the circuit shown, the rate of phase change and the equivalent frequency deviation rises as the audio frequency rises. Assume, for instance, that a 100 cycle audio signal of 1 volt amplitude causes an equivalent 1 kilohertz cycle frequency uh, deviation in the RF carrier. If the audio frequency rises to 1 kilohertz and the amplitude remains at 1 volt, there will be an equivalent frequency deviation of 10 kilohertz in the RF carrier. Such an effect is completely contrary to the working practices of FM transmission. According to the requirements of FM, the RF carrier frequency deviation must be proportional only to the amplitude of the audio signal and only the rate of carrier frequency swing is in proportion to the frequency of the audio signal. The basic method of eliminating the effect of increasing equivalent frequency deviation with increasing audio frequency is to decrease the amplitude of the audio signal in proportion to the frequency rise. The fundamental circuit for achieving this effect is the RC divider network shown in the diagram. The reactance of a capacitor decreases as the applied frequency increases, but the effect of the resistor remains constant at all frequencies. Consequently, the amplitude of the audio output signal decreases with increasing frequency. The values R and C are selected to make the audio signal amplitude decrease exactly, counteract the undesired frequency deviation increase. Review of FM transmitters Frequency modulation in frequency modulation, the frequency of the RF carrier signal is deviated at a rate and amplitude determined by the frequency and loudness of the audio signal being transmitted. Transmitter frequency characteristics. Commercial FM transmitters operate within the frequency band from 88 to 100 megacycles. To prevent interference, the carrier frequency separation between stations at the same region can be no less than 200,000 cycles. The maximum permitted frequency shift is 75,000 cycles. Reactance tube. The reactance tube achieves frequency modulation by injecting the effects of varying capacitance or inductance into the transmitter oscillator circuit. This is known as direct frequency modulation. The reactance injected into the oscillator varies at a rate and amplitude determined by the frequency and loudness of the amplitude audio signal from the microphone. Basic FM transmitter. Except for the addition of a reactance tube circuit, the basic FM transmitter is essentially the same as an AM transmitter with modulation introduced into the oscillator. Increasing the high frequency uh, gain of the audio amplifier by a high pass filter achieves pre emphasis, which increases the signal to noise ratio of the high frequency audio signals. Uh, indirect frequency modulation. FM transmission can be achieved indirectly. The oscillator frequency remains constant and the required frequency deviation is introduced in one of the stages following the oscillator. The advantage of this method is that a crystal controlled oscillator can be used and a stable center frequency can be achieved without the use of stabilizing circuits. Phase modulation. Indirect frequency modulation can be achieved by the use of a phase modulator which shifts the phase of the RF signal in accordance with the variations of the audio signal. The amplified audio signal from the microphone is used to drive a phase shifting network in one of the stages following the oscillator. The transmitted signal is exactly equivalent to an FM transmitted signal. Audio correction network. When a phase modulator is used, the equivalent carrier frequency deviation is in proportion to the amplitude of the audio signal. Increases in the audio signal frequency cause additional undesired phase shifts of the RF carrier signal. The undesired increase in phase shift is eliminated by using an RC network to decrease the amplitude of the audio signal in proportion to the frequency rise. Transmitting antennas cross half-wave dipole, folded half-wave dipole, 
section of pylon antenna, circular antenna, square loop antenna, horizontal dipole antenna. The subject of antennas and wave propagation was considered in detail in volume 4 of basic electronics. The information reviewed there also applies to FM radio signals with the understanding the radio waves used in commercial FM transmission fall in the frequency range between 88 and 108 megacycles. The types of transmitting antennas in common use are all variations of the horizontal dipole antenna considered in volume 4. The turnstile type consists of multiple bays of crossed half-wave dipoles or folded half-wave dipoles. Another type, known as the circular antenna, consists of multiple bays of dipoles which are folded to the shape of an almost complete circle. The square loop antenna consists of the shape of an almost complete circle. The square loop antenna consists of multiple bays of square elements which effectively operate as dipoles and folded dipoles. Still another type, the pylon antenna operates like a very large number of circular elements stacked one above the other and in contact with each other. Receiving antennas may be directional in those cases where there are only a few transmitting stations of interest and they are all in the same general direction. In such an event, the wide variety of television type dipole antennas are quite suitable for use. When there are a number of situations in a region, sorry, a number of stations in a region, and they are located in different directions from the receiver, an omnidirectional antenna is used. This type of equally sen this type is equally sensitive in all directions and consists of one or more bays of cross dipoles or bent dipoles. The function of the transmitter antenna is to radiate the transmitter signal into space. The radiated signal is electromagnetic energy and it travels through space in a manner that is determined by its frequency. When, the, when a radiated wave leaves the antenna, part of the energy travels through the surface of the earth and is known as the ground wave. The remainder of the energy is radiated into space in a pattern that is determined by the antenna design. Those waves which strike the ground between the transmitter and the horizon are known as the space waves. Uh, those waves which travel at an angle sufficient to, sufficiently high to pass over the horizon are known as sky waves. At certain frequencies, the upper layers of the atmosphere <coughs> reflect and refract a portion of the sky wave back towards Earth so that extremely long range reception is possible. At different frequencies, some of these waves are more effective than others in transmitting signals. At the frequency used for FN transmission and television, the ground waves are rapidly attenuated. In addition, the sky waves are not reflected or refracted black towards the ground so they can be picked up by the receiver antenna. Because of this, reception is limited to the region within which the space waves can travel in a direct line of sight from the transmitting antenna to the receiving antenna. Thus, reception is limited by the curvature of the Earth. This range can be extended slightly when the transmitter is sufficiently powerful to cause some appreciable amount of sky wave to be bent back towards Earth. If both the transmitting and receiving antennas are at altitudes of 100 feet above sea level, FM transmission can take place at ranges in the order of 30 miles. If both antennas are raised to 1000 feet above sea level, FM reception can take place at ranges in the order of 80 miles. In mountain areas, antenna elevations may be sufficiently high to permit reception at ranges over 150 miles. In cases where hills and buildings obstruct the line of sight, the situation may cause severe decrease in the quality and range of reception. We saw this, I'm pretty sure we saw this earlier, this picture. Okay, and here's a simplified block diagram of an AM or FM receiver. Antenna, amplifier, mixer, oscillator, Another amplifier, detector, another amplifier, speaker. 
The most direct uh, method for you to learn about FM receivers is to examine the block diagram of the most basic type and to compare it with that of the AM superheterodyne that was analyzed in detail in Volume 5 of Basic Electronics. A pre preliminary book look at these uh, diagrams shows that both receivers have a number of common stages. Both have antennas to pick up the RF signal from the transmitter and this is uh, delivered to the main body of the receiver by means of a suitable lead in line. Both receivers have an RF amplifier stage to set up the voltage of the signal from the antenna although this stage is sometimes emitted in low cost AM equipment. The receivers both have an oscillator and mixer, converter, sometimes as separate stages, sometimes in a single dual purpose stage. The purpose of these stages is to mix the amplified RF signal with constant frequency, constant amplitude signal available from an oscillator. This results in a lower intermediate frequency signal which carries the same intelligence as that modulated upon the RF signal picked up by the antenna. The purpose of lowering the signal frequency is to permit high gain amplification to be obtained more easily. In both receivers, the purpose of this st the stage following the IF amplifier is to remove the audio modulation from the intermediate frequency signal and to pass the resulting signal onto the audio amplifier. The general name for the stage following the IF amplifier is the detector. Following the detector is an audio amplifier, usually consisting of two or more stages. The purpose of this amplifier is to step up the audio signal to a level sufficient to drive the loudspeaker at satisfactory sound volume. From this review, it would seem that there are few differences between AM and FM receivers. Actually, there are differences in all stages, with the most important difference being in the IF amplifier and detector. The antenna, RF amplifier and oscillator in an FM receiver must operate with incoming signals in the frequency range of 88 to 108 MHz. This requires special consideration in the design and construction of these stages in order to achieve stable and reliable operation. At the other end of the system, the audio amplifier and speaker in an FM receiver must be capable of a much wider frequency range than in an AM receiver. Because of the restrictions on the transmission of AM signals, <coughs> 500 kilohertz is the highest frequency that can be transmitted and received. To reproduce a 5 kilohertz signal places no great requirements upon the audio amplifier and loudspeaker and these components are capable of producing good results even though they are designed for economy rather than quality. In FM transmission on the other hand there is practically no limit no limitation upon the range of audio signals that can be transmitted. Under the usual commercial FM broadcasting conditions frequencies up to 15 kilohertz are transmitted. Special consideration must be given to the design of the audio amplifier and loudspeaker in order to reproduce these signals in a satisfactory manner. The various special considerations that have been mentioned up to this point have solutions and that have been reviewed in the previous volumes. It is in the IF amplifier and detector sections that there are major differences between FM and AM receivers. These differences are so significant that they will be reviewed in detail in the pages that follow. <sighs> yeah, right. In an AM receiver, the IF amplifiers are tuned to a fairly sharp peak. This permits high gain and good selectivity to be obtained with only two and rarely more than three simple, simply designed stages. Since the, the audio signal modulated upon the RF signal does not exceed 5 kHz, mixing the RF and local oscillator signals results in an IF signal, usually 456 kHz, with a bandwidth of 10 kHz. A bandwidth is 10,000 cycles because amplitude modulation, modulating an RF signal with an audio signal of 5,000 cycles results in sidebands both 5,000 cycles above and 5,000 cycles below the RF carrier frequency. 
Thus, an intermediate frequency amplifier can have a bandwidth as narrow as 10,000 cycles without significantly attenuating modulating signals with frequencies up to 5,000 cycles. The situation in FM receivers is quite different. In the discussion of FM transmitting characteristics earlier in this volume, it was indicated that a commercial FM transmitter is permitted a frequency deviation of 75,000 cycles above and below its rest frequency. When the received FM signal is mixed with the fixed frequency oscillator signal, the resulting IF signal deviates 75,000 cycles above and below its center frequency. This means that 150,000 cycles is the maximum bandwidth that can be used in the IF amplifier. Furthermore, to pass the sidebands necessary to give a 150,000 cycle deviation, it is desirable to design an FM receiver IF amplifier with a band pass that is essentially flat for 100,000 cycles above and below the center frequency. The most common methods of obtaining this unusually wide frequency response will be considered next. The usual FM receiver IF amplifier has a center frequency of 10.7 megacycles. It would be ideal for the amplifier to have a frequency response which is perfectly flat between 10.6 to 10.8 megacycles with a perfectly vertical drop off outside this frequency range. The reason for such a highly idealized response is that any deviation from it will produce different amounts of amplification for different signal frequencies. This introduces the effect of amplitude modulation in the signal and causes problems in the detector stage. This ideal frequency response is never achieved in practice, but three methods of obtaining a reasonable approximation are in general use. It's going to take a quick break. And on we go. We're almost finished. <clears throat> the first method known as staggered tuning gives an excellent frequency response <coughs> curve. Three IF amplifier stages are used and they are tuned to 10.6, 10.7, 10.8 megacycles respectively. The overall frequency response of this combination adds to produce the close to ideal response curve shown in the diagram. Note that at the intersection of the individual response curves of two adjacent amplifiers, the gain of the two amplifiers adds to produce a total that is about equal to the maximum gain of a single stage. Although this method produces a very good frequency response curve, the overall gain produced by the three stages is no higher than that of a single stage. One way of counteracting this effect is to take special care to design the individual stages to have very high gain. Another way is to add a second group of three similarly tuned IF amplifiers, giving six stages in all. Neither of these solutions is economical to produce. In addition, special alignment techniques are required in either case. As a result, this method is not used as frequently as the two which will be described next. The second method of approximating the desired broad frequency response is to use three IF amplifiers all tuned to the same center frequency. Ordinarily, this would give a very sharply tuned frequency response curve. However, a broad response is obtained in each stage by using less than critical coupling in the transformers and by using transformer coils with low Q. Because of the broad frequency response of each amplifier, the gain of each stage is low, but the overall gain of the three stages is sufficient to give the required signal amplification. Although this method produces only an approximation of the desired response curve and the overall gain is no more than adequate, the design and alignment involve very few problems. This method is frequently used in low-cost FM receivers. In the past few years, vacuum tubes have been manufactured which are capable of producing unusually high gain at the IF signal frequencies in question. When these tubes are used in conjunction with careful circuit and component design, good gain and frequency response characteristics can be obtained with only two broadly tuned IF stages of the type described. The third method also makes use of three amplifier stages tuned to the same center frequency. The first, th th the first and third stages are designed and tuned as, the second, as in the second method. 
However, the transformer of the second stage is overcoupled, resulting in the familiar double peak frequency response curve. When the individual response curves of the three stages are combined, the double peaks of the second stage have a significant effect in broadening the frequency response and producing a good approximation of the desired response curve. Although the overall gain is only adequate and the alignment is slightly more difficult than in the second method, the good response characteristics make the method a popular one. By using the new high gain vacuum tube tubes, good gain and response characteristics can be achieved. There are other methods of obtaining approximate required response with adequate overall gain. These methods are usually combinations of the three methods that have been mentioned. When quality rather than cost is the prime consideration, one or more IF stages may be added to any of the combinations considered and the result is a better response characteristic with higher gain. The limiter discriminator type of detector. The review of FM receiver IF amplifiers indicated that uh, to you that a ver ver uh, variation was necessary from the arrangement used in AM receivers. Uh, the review of FM receiver detectors will indicate that the switchover from AM to FM is not a matter of requiring variation but a matter of requiring completely new circuits. Two types of detector arrangement are in common use in FM receivers and these will be analyzed in detail. The first type of detector arrangement makes use of two stages with different functions, a limiter and a discriminator. The limiter serves the function of eliminating all amplitude variations in the received signal so that the detector receives a signal that is a close duplicate of that sent out by the transmitter. The discriminator converts the FM signal output of the limiter to an audio signal, the frequency of which is equal to the frequency of the carrier signal swing and the amplitude of which is in proportion to the amplitude of the frequency variation. The limiter eliminates amplitude variations caused by non-ideal RF and IF amplifier response, lighting, electrical equipment, defective neon signs, and temporary f fading. The purpose of the limiter is to eliminate all amplitude variations in FM signal. This is necessary since the discriminator is sensitive to amplitude variations and will reproduce them as signal distortion and noise in its audio output signal. Amplitude variations do exist in the FM signal for two basic reasons. First, the RF and IF stages do not have a frequency response which is perfectly flat across the top and with perfect vertical drop-offs. Any variations from this response causes different amounts of amplification for different signal frequencies and this adversely affects the operation of the discriminator as will be seen later. Another reason for amplitude variations are the interference signals caused by electrical equipment, lighting, lightning flashes, atmospheric disturbance, neon signs, and a wide variety of other causes. In vehicles, there is a signal fading as hills, transmission lines, steel bridges, and other large objects temporarily obstruct the signal path between the transmitter and receiver. If these variations reach the discriminator, they will produce noise or fading in the audio signal output. It is the action of the limiter to eliminate these variations and give FM receivers their well-known freedom from noise. The schematic diagram of a limiter circuit shows a close resemblance to both an IF amplifier and the grid leak detector described in volume 5. The circuit operates so as to limit the peak-to-peak -peak voltage of the output signal to a fixed and predetermined value. This operation takes place for all normal input signal levels, low or high, out of the IF amplifier. The examination of a typical limiter circuit shows that the tube develops its grid bias by means of a grid resistor and a fixed capacitor in the grid circuit. The tube is of the sharp cutoff type and is operated with low plate voltage. The circuit diagram shows a triode tube for purposes of simplicity, although a pentode tube is generally used. 
Note that the grid circuit alignment is basically the circuit of a diode detector. The control grid operates as the diode plate and the grid leak resistor R1 replaces the load diode. The grid capacitor C1 serves both to couple signal and the grid and to take part in developing the grid bias. When a positive signal peak from the IF amplifier reaches the grid, the grid becomes positive and attracts electrons from the cathode. The flow of electrons through the grid leak resistor to ground produces a voltage drop across the resistor and the flow is in such a direction as to make the grid negative with respect to the cathode. During the first few positive signal peaks from the IF amplifier, electron also, electrons also accumulate upon the capacitor plate next to the grid. Sufficient electrons accumulate upon that plate to maintain a stable current flow through the resistor during all parts of the cycle. Thus the magnitude of the grid bias is determined by the magnitude of the positive signal peak from the IF amplifier. The greater the amplitude of the input signal, the greater is the negative grid bias. This is our limiter circuit. <sighs> to see the effect of this grid bias, examine the grid voltage versus plate current curve shown in the illustration. An input signal of low amplitude develops the low negative bias illustrated by line X. This bias voltage is less than the voltage of the positive signal peak. Consequently, the uppermost portion of the positive signal peak will drive the grid positive and the grid will draw current. This current flow overloads the IF amplifier output transformer and the current flow through the transformer internal impedance causes a drop in the output signal voltage. Thus the positive peak of a of the signal is clipped at the higher at the limited grid so that the peak can rise only a slight amount above zero volts. The negative peak of the grid signal drives the limiter plate current almost to the point of cutoff, just up to the point where clipping of the negative peaks begins to take place. When the input signal is at a higher out amplitude. A large negative bias is developed as illustrated in line Y. As large as the bias is, it is less than the voltage of the positive signal peak. Again, the upper section of the signal peak drives the grid positive, causes grid current flow and results in the clipping of the positive peak. Now the negative peak of the grid signal is of sufficient amplitude to drive the plate to cut off and the negative peak is clipped as shown in the diagram. Thus any signal input which has an amplitude greater than the weak signal shown will have both its positive and negative peaks clipped. The limiter will output the limiter output will be the same for all such signals. Weaker signals will not have their negative peaks clipped and there will be a small amount of amplitude variation. While the clipping action does distort the shape of the output signal, the discriminator is not sensitive in such distortion, to such distortion and the desired frequency variations are preserved. Discriminator circuit. Although there are a number of discriminator circuits in use today, they are all mostly variations of the basic circuit to be considered here. In this circuit, the final IF transformer has a center tap secondary winding and each half of this secondary winding has its own tuning capacitor. In order for you to understand the operation of the circuit, it is important to consider exactly how the various windings are tuned. The transformer prim primary is tuned to the resting frequency of the IF signal. Second winding LX is tuned to the frequency 75,000 cycles higher than the resting frequency. And the second secondary winding LY is tuned to a frequency 75,000 cycles lower than the resting frequency. Thus, there are, there, these two windings are tuned to the extreme ends of the maximum frequency deviation of the IF signal. Low voltage signals <coughs> are developed across the ends of each transformer secondary winding when the incoming signal is at the resting frequency. As the incoming signal swings towards the resonant frequency of either tuned secondary winding, an increasingly large signal is developed across that winding. The signal appearing across each transformer is rectified by a separate diode rectifier. Thus DC voltages are generated across resistors RX and RY 
and each voltage is proportional to the amplitude of the signal appearing across the associated transformer secondary winding. Electron flow through each resistor is in the direction shown in the arrows and the voltages developed across the two resistors are in opposition. The resultant of these two voltage voltages is the signal applied to the audio amplifier. The uh, resonance curves shown here indicate how an audio signal results from the FM signal coming out of the IF amplifier. It must be remembered that the frequency of the IF amplifier swings at a rate equal to the transmitted audio signal and the deviation of the frequency is in proportion to the loudness of the audio signal. Assume that the transmitted signal is 1 kHz note at low volume. In this event, the IF signal will deviate approximately 15,000 cycles to each side of its resulting frequency, and the frequency swing will be at the rate of 1,000 times per second. When the IF signal swings to 15,000 cycles higher than its center frequency, I, uh, on we go. I've, uh, I've almost finished this book, so let's just get to the end. This is about the limiter and discriminator circuits. Uh, discriminator continued, radio detector using various components. Uh, what's this one? Voltages across components with IF signal at resting frequency. Voltage across components with IF signal above resting. Radio detector. FM detector comparison. Uh, okay, so it's going to compare uh, the limiter discriminator and the ratio detector. The advantages of the limiter discriminator are that it's, uh, it has simple balancing, and the disadvantages are that weak signals are subject to AM interference. And the advantages of the radio detect ratio detector, weak signals are not subject to AM interference. The disadvantages is that distortion and noise rise with detector unbalance increasing and decreasing IF bandwidth. There you go. Demonstration. Operation of basic detector circuits. Right. Cool. I don't know if my uh, dis if my signal generator supports AM uh, or frequency modulation of, of some sort. I don't know. Suggested detector evaluation record sheet. Okay, so this is just for some experimental stuff that they're recommending. De-emphasis. I've heard of de-emphasis. It's uh. They they they, uh, they emphasize the uh, uh, the high high frequency yeah so uh, they they pre-emphasize the high the high pitch stuff <coughs> complete FM tuner cool so they've actually shown you how to make an FM radio. RF signal generator, AM receiver, FM receiver. Nearly there, this is the end. Alright, there's a review and then we're done. These pages are a bit stuck together. So, um, <coughs> review of FM receivers. Uh, FM receiver block diagram. There is a close similarity between the block diagrams of an FM receiver and an AM superheterodyne receiver. Uh, there are actual difference in differences in all stages, with the most important differences in the intermediate frequency amplifier and detector. IF amplifier bandwidth. To effectively amplify the received carrier and sideband signals without attenuation, it is desirable for the IF amplifier to have a flat band pass for 100,000 cycles above and below the center frequency. Stagger tuned IF. This type of IF amplifier contains three stages which are tuned to 10.6, 10.7, and 10.8 megacycles, respectively. 
important characteristics are in are an excellent frequency response curve and overall gain equal to that of a single stage and the requirement for special alignment techniques. Center tune broadband IF. In this type of IF amplifier all stages employ less than critical coupling in the IF transformer, have low Q transformer coils and are all tuned to the center frequency. Adequate gain can be achieved frequency response is acceptable and the alignment procedure is simple. Double peaked IF stage. The frequency response curve obtainable with the center frequency tuning can be improved by using an overcoupled IF transformer in one stage. The double peaked response curve produce, produced broadens the overall response of the complete IF amplifier. The alignment procedure becomes only slightly more complex. Limiter stage. The limiter clips all the positive and negative peaks of the IF amplifier output signal and thus eliminates all amplitude variations. One or more limiting stages are required if a discriminator type of detector is used. Discriminator. The discriminator converts the limiter output signal to an audio signal. The frequency of the audio signal is equal to the frequency of the carrier signal swing and the amplitude is in proportion to the amplitude of the frequency variation. The discriminator is sensitive to amplitude variations and must be used with a limiter before it. Ratio detector. The ratio detector provides FM detection without the need for a limiter. Operation is similar to that of the discriminator except for the diode connections and the addition of an RC network to provide limiting functions. And that's it. There's no farewell or anything, they just finish. Here we are in the cumulative index. And then we finish the cumulative index. And that's the end of the book. So I'll take you over to the uh, farewell can and we'll, we'll wrap up. And that's it. What a ride, huh? I, uh, I had no idea when I started that I would spend my whole day uh, reading that book. But uh, we did it. We got through pretty much the whole thing. So uh, that was Basic Electronics, uh, published in 1955 um, by Van Valkenburg, Nuga, and Neverlink. Um, as they uh, as they say, it was it was uh, produced for the United States Navy, um, and then released to us civilians um, some time after that. They uh, they used this book to train their uh, Navy technicians back in the day. So, that's uh, pretty cool to have a copy. Of course, uh, it was mostly about uh, diode vacuum tubes and uh, triodes and tetrodes and pentodes. So we learned uh, a fair bit about that, didn't we? Um, a little bit of information there about transistors, which were new technology at the time. Uh, also, FM frequency modulation, that was also new technology back at the time. So that was a, a bonus uh, volume we had there at the back. Um, so yeah, I'm, I, I'm sorry this video took so long. I, I can't imagine anyone or uh, not <laughs> if you if you're watching this, you know, <laughs> well done. Um, uh, feel free to let me know by the way. I'd love to know who, who made it to the end of the video. Um, but uh, look, um, that concludes uh, that particular uh, book review. So uh, thanks very much for watching and please remember to hit like and subscribe. Hi there. You're in the lab with your mate JJ. Today, my favorite part of the show, old book teardown. Today we're going to do an old book teardown. I'll tell you about that in just a minute. Um, the first thing I wanted to mention is uh, my, uh, my Make Magazine arrived. I don't know, does anyone else uh, subscribe to Make Magazine? I do. Um, I, I enjoy reading uh, Make Magazine. It's a, it's a, it's a maker, it's a maker mag. Um, and uh, of course, they're, they're, they're often, uh, they do, you know, like actual real physical projects where they make things and uh, and that that's really cool but it's not really what I do I'm more of an electronics experimenter than a than a, a thing maker um, but yeah I do like uh, reading ma make magazines so I just thought I'd mention my copy just arrived um, look this video you probably already know it's gonna go for a really long time I I, I haven't um, seen yet how long it's going to take but you know it's like 10 or 12 hours or something silly 
So, uh, look, I'm sorry about that. It is just a, it's just an old book tear down. I just look at this one particular book, um, and I take it, I, I take you through the whole thing basically. Um, I really enjoyed making this video. Um, I, I learned a lot of things. Um, uh, it was it, uh, my uh, in, uh, my understanding of uh, old uh, vacuum tube technology increased. I can now tell you about diode vacuum tubes and triode vacuum tubes and uh, tetrode vacuum tubes and pentode pack, pa vacuum tubes and the klystron. Uh, so um, the klystron is used for like microwave or, or really high frequency signals. Uh, the pentode has well the the, the diode has uh, uh, has two two elements. Uh, and then the the uh, it ha well, it has the plate and the gate I think, and then the 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 triode has the plate and the gate and some sort of screen, and then 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 there's more uh, gates or screens and things on the once it come after, uh, so uh, look, um, yeah this video it's really long we're just going to take a look at that at our book, the book that we'll be looking at is. Basic Electronics by uh, Van Valkenburg, Nuger and Neville Inc. It was published in 1955 in New York, New York. Um, it was commissioned by the United States Navy. They actually had this work um, uh, made so that they could use it to train their technicians. So the US Navy used this as part of their uh, uh, technician training program back in, in, the, um, in the 50s. Um, and uh, after some time they decided that it would be valuable to release it to civilians so this is a civilian copy of, of the work um, that, that they specifically uh, released with the view to you know uh, improving the the United States um, uh, uh, capacity uh, of pre-trained people so it was kind of one of those things um, anyway we'll see uh, when we read the um, the pre preface in a minute, uh, just what they have to say about that. So yeah, um, this book published uh, in 1955 um, by a company who um, you, who made the um, who made the book as a training program for the U.S. Navy. Um, I should also say uh, this is basic electronics. The same people made a, a prerequisite, uh, uh, like a, a, a prelude to this, was called basic electricity. So this is basic electronics. Before it was basic electricity. I had a quick look through my collection. I couldn't find basic electricity. So I'm not sure if I have that copy or not. Um, but um, I think it, it's okay. We didn't we didn't take it as a prereq. They do recommend it as a prereq. So um, we, we we just go on with this book without without learning about electricity uh, as they present it. Um, and they tell you about that particular book on the back here, and I'll read that to you in just a minute when we're looking at the thing. So you'll learn about basic electricity, which is the other book that we don't have, and then we're going to go through basic electronics, which is the book that we do have. Um, so look, um, again, I apologize for the length of this video. I completely understand if no one has the time to watch it. Um, if you search for YouTube hacks on my website, um, uh, uh, in the lab with JJ.com, um, if you find, if you find the YouTube hacks, um, that'll show you how to speed up the video. So if you want to watch it at three times speed, if it's 12 hours, you watch it three times speed, you'll get through it in four hours. Um, I don't know if there's anyone that it's that keen <laughs> but uh, look that's what I do when I've got a really long video I need to get through is I just triple time it um, so uh, yeah you can find out how to do that on my website and if you have trouble finding please just ask so um, I'm always happy to answer questions or, or put people in the right direction so um, that's everything let's jump over to the bench and let's go through our book basic electronics